Honourable Senators, the President. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of the order of business. I remind senators that question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I call the clerk. Private Senators' Bills, Order of the Day number 37, Productivity Commission Amendment, Electricity Reporting Bill 2023, resumption of second reading debate. You with me, Senator Dunningham? Do you wish the call? You have the call. I have the call. Excellent. Yeah. Well, it's great to have the call finally, and um, to be able to make a contribution on, I think, what is a very important piece of legislation, uh, given the current context, uh, last night's budget, and something we know all Australian households and businesses are struggling with, and that is, of course, the cost of power. Low, uh, lower power prices were indeed a central part of the last election campaign. It's something that every single elected representative in this parliament knows is something everyone is struggling with. Indeed, it was the last election campaign where we did see 97 times a promise made by the Australian Labor Party that they would bring power prices down by $275. It was a very clear and unequivocal promise. There were no terms and conditions applying. There was just a dollar figure put out there, amongst other uh, rhetoric around the cost of living going up, but 97 times was this promise made that power prices would go down by $275. And I am absolutely confident that, of course, uh, many Australians out there, be they um, small business people or just people who are struggling to pay their own household power bills, took that to the bank. They figured, you know, that's great. I need power price relief. The Australian Labor Party have promised me that power prices are going to go down by $275. Now, granted, they said by 2025, and we'll come back to that, the trajectory of power prices at this point in time, uh, but it's a promise that, funnily enough, has disappeared from the public debate. Not a single member of the government has, since the election, repeated that promise. Not once. It featured pretty heavily in the debate prior to the election just a year ago, but since then it's like it never happened. Not once was that promise made. Look over here. We'll distract you from the pain you're having and we will not revisit on that promise. So that's why this bill is important. It's important because if it's passed, Deputy President, it's going to provide a number of benefits to Australians, to Australian households and Australian businesses, and the chief benefit to uh, Australians is, of course, that increased transparency and accountability in relation to the energy policies of this government and, of course, any future government of the Commonwealth. It's going to place uh, increased scrutiny on the impact of energy policy and what that does 
to energy prices, and it will allow Australians a more comprehensive ability to fully understand the true extent of the cost of living crisis they have been enduring throughout much of their lives to date, and of course, sadly, as a result of the hapless policies of this government. And I think it's important just to allow us to give Australians the ability, the ability to see how this government is performing. This bill, in short, is aimed at legislating for new and easily accessible nationally consolidated and regularly updated reports on retail electricity prices across the country. It would require the Productivity Commission, a trusted entity, to compile on a quarterly basis a report containing statistics on retail electricity prices and generation in each state and territory. It would also then require the Commonwealth Government of the day to table these reports within a period of time after production. And that, of course, then puts it on centre stage for consideration by this parliament, by the public through the media, without any filter or interference. Now, over recent years, of course, there have been a number of steps to uh, improve the range of information and the detailed statistics available around energy reporting. Um, and there has been some success around exactly what those reports have been able to do. Uh, there have been a variety of tools and products uh, that have been developed relating to energy prices in Australia. Um, and of course, that is an improvement on, on what was available previously, which was nothing other than your own individual power bill. But of course, it doesn't go far enough. And that's why I'm tabling this bill. And that's why I'm hoping that the government and uh, crossbench senators will see their way to supporting this bill, which is a very sensible bill and one that only provides further transparency. It doesn't interfere, doesn't change uh, the issues we are facing. It just provides a clear, concise report on where things are at. The most similar type of report that exists today, of course, is the Australian Energy Market Commission's Residential Electricity Price Trends document. Um, the AEMO maintains an online dashboard which brings together various sets of information around electricity prices around the country. Uh, and of course, then energy companies um, do sometimes provide data to that dash dashboard around their retail prices. Um, there's also the Australian Energy Regulator, or AER's Energy Made Easy site, and the Victorian government's Energy Compare site. Um, and there's a range of other uh, non-government entities as well that provide information. But none of these tools bridge that gap. None of these tools that are available now provide exactly what it is we are hoping Australians will be able to benefit from if this legislation passes. For instance, the AEMC's Residential Electricity Price Trends document uses a number of projections for future years rather than reporting purely on actual past and, importantly, current prices. It's also not a mandated publication, so if it is so desired, you can skip over uh, tabling this information. And that was exactly what happened on 1 December 2022 when it was reported that uh, this entity, the AEMC, would not be producing an annual edition for that year and would defer the release of the next report to some time around the middle of this year, 2023. Now that is a problem if we are seeking transparency and clarity around exactly where retail electricity prices are in Australia. Uh, online comparison services have limitations too, including that none of them display comprehensive data for every retailer across every state and territory. So there are some tools available but they don't go far enough. And anyone who points to what's currently in the marketplace as a reason not to support this legislation is fibbing to the Australian public. There is no good reason not to support this legislation. There remains a need for relatively straightforward overall national breakdowns of data to be brought together all in one place and for reporting of that data to be mandated. The need for it has been made more urgent and more pressing by, of course, what we've seen over the last nearly 12 months. As I said already, this government promised to reduce power bills by $275 a pop annually and instead, though, has presided over increases in energy prices and, of course, aided by others in the chamber through misguided policies which will have detrimental impacts to energy prices. And as I said before, again, not once since the election 
has the government mentioned that promise they made that, as I say, Australians took to the bank, saying, this is great, my power bill will go down by $275. The putative Prime Minister promised me so. But instead of that, we see power prices going up. And we don't have to go far to look for some examples of this. Um, you know, there are a range of businesses across Australia that are struggling. Um, I look at uh, my local newspaper, The Mercury, which, of course, uh, in February of this year reported on a business in southern Tasmania, Oceana Aquatic and Fitness, uh, said he was shocked at his monthly power bill. Last year, in January 2022, his bill was $6,479. Fast forward to 12 months. In January of 2023, his power bill doubled. It was $12,326. I mean, that's a shocking increase and in something that I think any legislator, anyone who is actually concerned about power prices, would be worried about. And we've seen other businesses too. Jeff Sadler, the owner and operator of the Quilt and Pillow Factory, says that electricity is a fundamental part of his business. And he hasn't disclosed how much more he's paying, but he says it's significant. And he made the point, we've got three options really, put up our prices, increase our sales or lay off staff. So retailers, the people who provide employment to uh, households, to individuals across this country, are struggling just as households are, and that will have flow-on impacts for the economy. Of course, um, I think it would be a helpful tool for legislators too. We did see in recent times uh, members of the government unable to tell us what was happening with electricity power prices. And so I would expect Senator Farrell, who I'm pleased is here, Senator would be Farrell. very, very keen in supporting this legislation because it will make our jobs much easier when we're asked questions in question Senator time Farrell's about ready. how power prices are going in South Australia, in Tasmania, in New South Wales, in Western Australia South or Australia. Queensland. It will make it a very, very simple task for us to be able to report on these things and make decisions on that basis. So, as I say, uh, I would hate for anyone to be perceived as not caring about these things. So this tool will enable all of us to be directly in touch with these issues that are impacting on Australian households and, uh, and of course, um, businesses as well. Now, last night in the budget, um, I'm sure many Australians will welcome uh, whatever help they can get. Um, and there was some help provided in last night's budget, but there's a problem with what was provided. And Aside from the obvious inflationary impact of Labor's uh, support for households and businesses when it comes to power bills, that measure to help pay power bills out of the taxpayers' coffers is a concession that their policies around energy prices are failing. Power prices aren't going down. If they were, they wouldn't have to provide this support. And so this is why reporting on this information um, is so incredibly important to actually understand where power prices are at. Not after a rebate, but actually what we're paying, because taxpayers paying part of your power bill isn't prices going down. That is not good policy. But we understand the need for support in the uh, aftermath of failed policies by this government. And even after this handout is provided to Australian households and businesses, some of them, on average, power prices are going to go up $500 this year alone. That's on top of things like their disastrous safeguard mechanism legislation, which is going to drive up the cost of so many inputs, which is going to add other cost of living pressures. So to suggest, Deputy President, that things are great, going in the right direction, people can breathe a sigh of relief, is totally mischaracterising the situation we have out there. And this bill, of course, will shine light on exactly what is happening in a consolidated, concise, regular and mandated way, something that will help Australians understand exactly what policies of government are doing for the things that hit them at home, their hip pocket, their power bills at a time when mortgage repayments are going up, fuel, food, other life costs are becoming more expensive. Having that front and centre of debate in this place once every quarter, clear, accurate information provided by an entity uh, so well respected as the Productivity Commission, I think, is something it will be very hard to argue against. Minimal cost, an important contribution to the public debate on this issue. Of course, additionally, it's not just about costs, it's about uh, the sources of energy generation. Equally, we'll be asking the Productivity Commission to 
uh, tell us um, where energy is being generated from. There's a lot of talk about the need to transition. Well, let's see exactly how that's going. Let's see how much fossil fuels is being used in energy generation, how much hydro, how much wind, how much solar. It's important to be able to actually accurately measure the government's progress against their promises and indeed for other parties in this place to hold the government to account over their promises. Again, the Productivity Commission would do this in an objective way. They'd go out and they'd seek the information from each jurisdiction and they would then go <clears throat> and publish it in the same fashion I've already mentioned, quarterly, in this parliament, tabled and, of course, available for debate, something I think we'd all benefit from uh, as much as the rest of the Australian population that we represent here. There is nothing wrong with transparency. It was a hallmark of Labor's election pledges and uh, I'm sure they'll welcome this legislation. And Maybe today the government speaker on this bill will tell us they're going to vote for it. Maybe in line with all of the promises they made around lowering power prices and providing transparency on all areas of government, they will tell us they're going to support this. And I can assure them there's no sting in the tail. There is no ulterior motive, no hidden agenda in this legislation. It is very straightforward. It is a way of holding governments, plural, to account into the future. This government, who made their promise nearly 100 times before the election, eerily haven't said it since, to reduce power prices by $275 a year, but indeed future governments, uh, when we win the next election, will be held to account for uh, the promises we make and how that impacts on, uh, on uh, power prices. And I look forward to being held to account because we are in the business of solving problems. This is a solution to one of those problems. So I do commend this bill to the Senate, Deputy President, and I'm hopeful that my friends over here in government, I certainly hope the Greens would find their way to supporting this bill, given it provides further transparency around sources of generation and energy costs. The only benefit felt here is going to be felt by Australian households. That's transparency, accountability and making sure the government stick to their promises. Senator Ayres. Transparency. <laughs> Honestly, transparency. Uh, last May, I mean, the only thing that's transparent about this is that you can see straight through it. You can see straight through it. Last May, the member for Hume, the joker who now pretends to be the opposition treasury spokesperson, changed the law in order to obscure from Australians in the lead up to the election the massive price hikes for electricity that they knew were coming down the line and that they were required to disclose, he fiddled the books to make sure that Australians in the lead up to the election didn't get to see the consequence of a decade of policy failure from the Liberal National Party, from Mr Morrison and Mr Turnbull and Mr Abbott. I mean, that's the law of diminishing returns right there, really. Uh, a consequence of a decade of complete failure was rising electricity prices. And what was the response of Mr Taylor, who'd presided over much of this energy sector catastrophe? He fiddled the books and hid it from people. And now, I know, I know it's poor old Senator Dunningham's job, and he knows, it's, he knows it's indefensible what they are saying and doing now. I know that most of the show over here understand it's indefensible what they did in government and that what is going on now is just blowing so much smoke in an effort to try and distract ordinary Australians from the utter catastrophe that they left the Australian energy market in, uh, that the government is now dealing with. Now, I was pleased that Senator Dunningham uh, said some things about the budget. Uh, and there are some measures in the budget that go to these, that go to some of these questions. It is a responsible, carefully balanced budget. It is a budget that puts downward pressure 
on inflation in the economy, particularly in terms of household and business energy prices. It is a budget that provides carefully targeted cost of living relief without putting upward pressure on inflation, something that the last government singularly failed to do. And it does when we look at what is the biggest opportunity to reindustrialise the Australian economy after a decade of industry policy abject failure, the opportunity to rebuild investment in manufacturing and jobs. This budget really builds on the government's ambitions of making Australia a renewable energy superpower. Well, what is the what is the response of the other side after the budget? Well, it's two things, really. It's the sort of negative Nigel approach over here. Like, you know, if, it's, if, if there's a sensible measure in the budget, they say the sky's falling in, they catastrophise about these issues, they talk Australia down, they diminish, they diminish the capacity, they diminish the capacity and underestimate the capacity of the Australian people, like, always talking the country down, always talking the capacity of the Australian people and Australian institutions to work together to deal with these questions down, claiming that measures that are patently deflationary are inflationary. I say it over and over again and hope, hope that us putting downward pressure on inflation that to putting downward pressure on inflation, I may have used the wrong term, Senator Brockman, I think you're right, downward pressure on inflation, making sure that, that, is, that the small surplus contributes to lower cost of living, lower cost of living, something that over there, despite nine opportunities to deliver, singularly unable to do singularly unable to do. And then, and then what do they do? They walk in with, here with this joke, talking about transparency. Well, well, honestly, after, after the patent dishonesty of the last decade, particularly the last three years, these guys want to talk about transparency. Now, there is a, there is a small surplus. Uh, in yesterday's budget, a modest surplus, carefully, carefully delivered by this government, working through the excesses of the last government's spending, uh, working through the terminating measures and making sure that the, the ones that are required to continue are properly funded, not falling off the cliff that was left in the sort of shadow budget. Uh, run by uh, Mr Morrison and his colleagues. And why, why is a modest surplus at this stage important? Well, it's important in fiscal terms. It reduces the scale of future deficits. It puts downward pressure on interest payments for Commonwealth debt. It, it creates a sense of discipline in government and across the public service that the former government were never able to engender. There's a point of order oh, from. Point of uh, order. Sorry, you may have drifted off. No, I haven't drifted point off. Of order of <laughs> have drifted That's off. a point of order. We actually have a bill here, and uh, it'd be nice if Senator Ayres had come back to what we're actually here to discuss. Well, the custom is that uh, relevance is it doesn't necessarily uh, is strictly enforced in the sort of second reading debates, and I did note that. Uh, the proponent of the bill did himself did himself wander. So, but Senator Hughes, bear that in mind. That counsel of Senator Hughes. Thank you, uh, thank you for your advice, and no doubt uh, Senator Hughes's advice, um, uh, Acting President, uh, 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 Deputy President. What what it does, in addition to its fiscal importance, is it sends a message about discipline. Now. That, that is that every dollar counts, that it's the public's money, 
not the Liberal National Party's money, that it's not for rorting for partisan political purposes, it's for working through in a careful way in the public interest. And finally, it's about putting downward pressure on interest rates. Largest investment in bulk billing incentives ever, ever. Reducing the cost of medicines by up to half for at least six million people. $3 billion of electricity price relief. I'll come back to that question in a moment. Five million eligible households, up to $500 off their bills. It's going to have a big impact on retail electricity prices. An increase in payments for job seeker and youth allowance by $40 a fortnight. $2.7 billion to increase the maximum rates of Commonwealth rent assistance. Uh, and, of course, a, a big investment in the single parent payment. Uh, rent assistance, 15 per cent. I mean, people talk about the cost of housing and they're right to raise it, they're right to advocate for it, but actually action, the biggest rise biggest rise. So this is, a, this is a budget that delivers for people uh, who need it. It delivers for the Australian community at large. It delivers for low-income households, targeted relief, and some of that relief puts direct downward pressure on inflation because of what the government is doing in energy price relief. Now, there are two components of that. The last one was in November last year. The AER predicted that energy price rises were going to be in the order of 51 per cent, and the government acted. Price caps, coal and gas, working with the states and territories, delivered downward pressure on particularly gas prices for East Coast households and businesses. And the second component that the Treasurer announced last night, up to $500, up to $500 for eligible households. $500. Now, all you hear from this lot during question time is heckling about the commitments that the government made uh, in 2021 about energy price relief. $500 delivered through the budget for eligible households. Now, of course, the policy delivery mechanism for the states and the Commonwealth is complicated uh, because the jurisdictions have different energy markets in them. The outcome for eligible households will be very simple. Your bill will be up to $500 less than it would have been. Now on both of these measures, on both of these measures, what is the position of Mr Dutton and Mr Taylor and the Liberal National Party? Well, they're against them. So they're all for the slogans, but on the policy substance, they're against it. Policies that work, policies that put downward pressure on energy prices, and where are they? Well, they're opposed to them. And then this newfound enthusiasm for transparency. Newfound enthusiasm for transparency. What, what, what is the position here? We, we, have, we have delivered price caps on gas. We have delivered downward pressure on coal. We have delivered $500 for eligible households, downward pressure on electricity use. And what are the Liberal National Party offering? What are they offering? More reports. I mean, perhaps for Senator Dunningham, the hope is 
Perhaps for Senator Dunningham the hope is that Tasmanian households, you know, cold this winter, can collect the Productivity Commission reports and set fire to them. Maybe that is the only way that Mr Dutton and Mr Taylor will contribute to downward pressure on household electricity and gas prices is, is more reports and maybe people can set fire to them to get a, a short-term, temporary warm glow because that is all you get from the other side. What is their record? A decade of policy failure in energy, 22 policies, never landed one, and dishonesty. Dishonesty. When push came to shove, when the result of a decade of policy failure should have been there for all Australians to see, what did they do? They covered it up. A sordid, sleazy, political, partisan cover-up from the cover-up artists themselves. I, I, I mean, a, a shonkier period of government the Australian people have never seen. Mr Morrison made poor old Billy McMahon look good. Made Billy McMahon look good. So patently dishonest and partisan was that government uh, that nobody on this side, nobody on the other side, ever says Mr. Morrison's name again. They don't want to be seen with him. They don't want to be seen with him. And you talk, Senator Hughes, about two hundred and seventy-five dollars. The figure, the figure you should use, the figure you should use is five hundred dollars. Five hundred dollars, because that's what this government has delivered. We, we go out there, we say what we're going to do, and then we deliver more. We deliver more. Now, perhaps, perhaps the other side would like us to lower our ambitions. Perhaps the other side would like more cynicism. But after a decade of policy failure, we have a government here that is determined to deliver for the Australian people. And in the big opportunities, for lower energy prices, investing in the cheapest form of energy, renewables and storage. What do we hear from the backbench over there? It's more nonsense about nuclear to push prices up, to push prices up. More slogans, no substance, more meaningless rhetoric, more press releases. I think Thank the Australian you, government people Senator have made a choice. Ayers. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. Well, I rise too to speak on the Productivity Commission Amendment Electricity Reporting Bill 2023. And it's, it's always a pleasure to follow Senator Ayres. There's always a bit of colour and light and movement in his speeches. Uh, sadly, that was a bit of pretty insipid defence of what is a pretty insipid budget, uh, uh, particularly when it comes to taxing Australians, taxing Australians and then sending a small part of that tax back to them in energy relief when they promised before the election the number that, well, at least Senator Ayres had the, had the guts to, to actually say the words 275, because we haven't heard that from the other side uh, pretty much since the election, actually. Uh, they promised electricity price reductions of $275, and instead we have seen absolutely skyrocketing energy prices right across Australia and particularly on the eastern states, I'll get to my home state of WA in a moment, but particularly on the eastern states, those price rises are extraordinary. So in Victoria, 31 per cent, 31 per cent increase in the new default market offer uh, put out earlier this year. That represents an increase for residential customers of $426 in the next year alone. That's not including the price rises of last year, the first year of this Labor government, which everybody knows, everybody knows, were absolutely extraordinary. In regional Queensland, $432 increase over the next year. In 
New South Wales, 463. In South Australia, 400. In South East Queensland, 321. And I remind those listening, this is not for the past year. This is for the year coming up. So the relief, quote unquote, that this Labor government has put into the budget is, uh, quite frankly, a drop in the bucket when compared to those electricity price hikes that Australians have already seen and are know, they know are coming down the train tracks at them at a very rapid rate. And that is on top of the fastest, highest increase in interest rates in Australia's history. Uh, uh, to the point where you are seeing average, average households, uh, mortgages of $500,000, see an extra $1,000 a month required to pay their mortgages. I mean, this is simply extraordinary. Uh, as I've said in this place a number of times, other cost pressures, particularly in regional Australia, uh, where you see the price of petrol and diesel regularly up around and exceeding $2 a litre right across the bush in Western Australia. So the pressure that families are under is simply extraordinary. Uh, and not just families, and not just families, small businesses as well. So those, those default market offers I was talking about for the 23-24 year are actually even worse for the bush, uh, for, for small business. So for Victorian small businesses, they're looking at coming down the pipeline, a 33 per cent increase in the default market offer. For an average small business, that will mean an increase of over $1,700. Over $1,700 for small businesses that are already struggling with massive increase in any borrowings they face. And most small businesses uh, are, are carrying debt. Uh, so they've got a massive increase in their cost of energy to keep that small business going. They've got increases fuelled by inflation in the cost of labour. They've got increases in all their input costs to their business. All their inputs have gone up. And you're seeing on top of that uh, a government that has done nothing, absolutely nothing in the budget last night to put any downward pressure on inflation. They have left all the heavy lifting to the Reserve Bank, in fact are uh, pushing money into the economy, which Chris Richardson has said uh, late last night um, is, is potentially going to drive future interest rate rises. So not only has the government done absolutely nothing to put downward pressure on inflation, they've actually put upward pressure on inflation according to senior and respected economists in this country. Uh, that will, of course, flow into energy price rises, which is why transparency, transparency, sunlight is the ultimate disinfectant, transparency of the sort put forward in this bill by Senator Dunham is so important. Information needs to be accessible. It needs to be consolidated uh, in one place where people can understand ele ele electricity pricing and the amounts being generated across Australia. It will, this bill would require the Productivity Commission to compile quarterly reports on retail electricity prices, as well as the sources from which the electricity is being generated for each state and territory. The relevant minister would then be required to table these reports in parliament. Now, currently there is no central repository of energy pricing in Australia. And I know this. As a West Australian, we sit outside the national energy market. Uh, and as such, all the reporting we see from the national energy market, uh, which I think is slightly ironically named, uh, but all the reporting we see from the national energy market, and I've got some in front of me here now, and I've actually just read them out. Victoria, regional Queensland, New South Wales, South Australia, South East Queensland. Well, guess what? What part of Australia is not covered in that reporting? My home state, Western Australia. Western Australia has its own energy market, and uh, I thank my lucky stars we do when I see what's been happening in the eastern states, because we have actually been lucky enough through our development of a significant gas industry in the 1970s under Sir Charles Court, been able to provide long-term, low-cost energy 
to the industries, families and small businesses of Western Australia. And that's something to be very proud of. However, we have not been immune from the price rises in the energy sector. We have not been immune from them. We have seen through uh, decisions by this government, such as the increase in the, t uh, the price in, in the tax on gas out of uh, Western Australia. Western Australia is the gas exporting state, and the increase in tax uh, on uh, gas producers in Western Australia will have a flow-on impact to um, increase prices in that state. Uh, we've also seen the policy decisions in the gas sector of late last year put a lot of uncertainty and volatility into that market, which again um, forced up costs. So we have a situation and made future investment much more uncertain, which obviously also forces up the price of gas. Uh, we've had major energy buyers, our overseas markets, talking about the volatility that this government has put into particularly the gas market, but the energy sector overall through its heavy-handed regulatory approach. Uh, so in Western Australia, we have been relatively uh, lucky in terms of the sheer scale of energy price rises because we are coming off a lower base, but it certainly hasn't protected us entirely. And again, you talk to those families and small businesses in Western Australia, and my good friend Senator O'Sullivan would know this as well as I do, that those families and small businesses in Western Australia facing the massive increase in the costs of their borrowing, facing the massive in increase in the cost of everything they have to buy uh, to keep their businesses running, to keep their families going, uh, are also facing massive increases in the cost of keeping the lights turned on. And the trouble for Labor is they're, they're really out of touch on this issue. They do not know the pressure that this is putting on those families. And I'll give you, I'll give you, a, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a case in point, Senator Farrell. I'll give you a case in point from one of, I'll give you a case in point from one of your state Labor colleagues, state Labor colleagues, the Minister for Energy. Bill Johnson in Western Australia, Labor Minister for Energy in Western Australia, when describing the cost of charging up his EV, said, yeah, but remember, electricity is almost free. What? Well, the Labor Party is very much out of touch on this. This is a, this is a Labor Minister for Energy. Yeah, remember, electricity is almost free. Um, now, Minister Johnson is very out of touch, and this Labor government in Canberra is out of touch on the sheer pressure that Australian households and families are under when it comes to the increasing costs on their budget. Um, electricity is one of those key items. Now, the mortgage cost increases are, are much more significant. I understand that. And the pressure of rising interest rates, again, which this government has done nothing about, they've done nothing about putting any downward pressure on inflation. Uh, I mean, Senator Ayres in his speech started talking about deflation, which, I mean, uh, when there's not even any downward pressure on inflation, let alone uh, uh, not that we want to get anywhere near deflation. But uh, this budget did nothing to put any downward pressure on inflation. In fact, according, as I have said, according to Chris Richardson, one of the most respected economists in this country, it actually puts upward pressure on interest rates uh, through the increase in spending that's contained within it. So uh, just to get back to the bill, uh, we do need to see more transparency a consolidated place where all Australians can see and understand what is happening in the energy markets. There is great change happening in the energy markets, there's no doubt about that, and a lot of those changes have factored into these massive costs of energy that we have seen. It is only fair to the people of Australia, to the small businesses of Australia, uh, particularly the small businesses of Australia that do have high energy needs. There are, are small IGAs, uh, uh, small supermarkets, in I, I know in my home state of Western Australia, but right across Australia, 
small supermarkets that do, because of their freezers, because they stay open 24-7, uh, actually have extraordinarily high energy costs in the tens of thousands, sometimes in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And those are the businesses that are under extraordinary pressure. And shedding light on the situation as we move forward uh, with ch further changes to the energy grid that are foreshadowed, that we do need to provide as much transparency and openness uh, to the market as we possibly can. And why anyone would oppose this bill is beyond me, and I commend it to the Chamber. Senator Orman Payne. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on the Productivity Commission Amendment Electricity Reporting Bill 2023. The Greens won't be supporting this bill. Now, the purported purpose of this bill has merit. But publishing, sorry, the purported purpose of this bill has merit, and publishing more information on a more regular basis on electricity prices and generation would be a good thing. But in our view, the Productivity Commission is simply the wrong agency for this task. As the Productivity Commission states on its website, it is, I quote, an advisory body. It does not administer government programs or exercise executive power. It contributes by providing quality, independent advice and information to governments and on the communication of ideas and analysis." End quote. Now, we could have a long discussion about the quality and even the independence of the Productivity Commission's work. It's questionable, but that is another matter and I'm not going to go into that today. The point is, what the Productivity Commission does is long-form analysis in preparing in-depth reports. What they don't do is provide information to consumers. It's not their job. Now, you would think that the LNP, having been in government for nearly a decade, would have worked out that the Productivity Commission is not the right agency for this task and if they really cared about transparency around electricity prices, they would have made this reform themselves. Of course, instead, they did the exact opposite. They deliberately buried the Australian Energy Regulator's report recommending an increase in power prices before the last election. So it really is utterly shameless for them to be serving up this bill, but unfortunately, it's what we've come to expect from a client denying dinosaurs in the LNP. Senator Hughes. <laughs> that, yeah, what, no, that's all right. Senator, what, what, what else Hughes would we expect, Senator though? Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I mean, it's just extraordinary. There is absolutely nothing controversial about this bill. We have claims from those opposite at, all across the chamber that they're all about transparency. But what they also claim regularly is that renewables are cheap. Renewable, well, they're free, apparently, but like electricity in WA, according to uh, Senator Brockman's contribution. Uh, but they, they're, they're cheap and they're, they're going to be so reliable and they're going to really power us forward and, and the whole economy is going to thrive under this great free renewable energy. Of course, the transition to it is also going to be cheap, according to those opposite, which is just a fantasy. But. Uh, this is just extraordinary that those opposite who purport that renewables are going to be such a great contributor don't actually want the Australian people to see at all, at any stage, in any, at any opportunity, how it is actually coal that keeps the lights on. It's actually coal that keeps Australia's economy powering ahead. And in fact, this surplus that we were hearing about from uh, Senator Ayres earlier, the, the very slim surplus, is actually off the back of the resources sector. That sector that you guys actually want to tailor down at every opportunity that the Greens want to remove from the Australian economy as fast as possible, uh, that we see different resource taxes being put in place to ensure that there are less coal and gas projects going forward uh, to appease the Greens and uh, some of the crossbench. Uh, but they don't want anyone to know that their beloved renewables actually contribute very little to the energy grid, that the lights, the air conditioning, the heating, the businesses that you know, require energy to function in our schools, in our hospitals, 
that that power is actually generated by coal, and in fact all of their little pet projects are also funded by coal. It's the resource sector that funds them. It's the resource sector that provided a surplus, yet those opposite are absolutely determined to ensure that that isn't available to future Australian economies. So I don't understand why there's anything controversial here at all about this bill. It's just about allowing Australians to have more clarity, more uniformity, more transparency. Remember, that was the big word. No, they don't want transparency because then people would know how much power comes from coal. How much power comes from coal. So that's what they're worried about, that Australians will actually see through this claim that renewable energy is cheap, the transition is going to be cheap, that it's actually going to provide reliable, affordable baseload power, because anyone who has any sense, any understanding, any intellectual capabilities really can say that that is all not true. So, all Senator Dunningham is trying to ensure, and we know productivity is actually the greatest way to ensure that inflation comes down. Inflation will come down as product productivity increases. And you know, we know that Australians being able to make affordable choices when it comes to their power, that we will see productivity improve because they'll be able to make informed decisions. But over there on the other side, government's not interested in productivity. It's interested in handouts. And uh, I thought it was interesting this morning uh, listening to 2GB, you know, one of the biggest radio stations in Sydney, highest rating talkback show across the country. And what some of, some of the punters, some of the everyday Australians who listened to the budget last night had to say, and of course we won't hear it from any of those opposite, that this was a typical Labor budget. Take money from hard workers and give it to lazy bludgers. Hmm. Okay. So once again, Ben, the workers who carry this country get screwed over. There is nothing in this budget for the workers. And I think that's what we could see. It's all about little handouts. That, that's, that's not your money, it's taxpayers' money. And it's taxpayers' money that actually comes from the resources sector. But you know, I feel like we're on a loop at this point in time. And then we, we know that the parliament was recalled last year because they were, they were going to do such great stuff to ensure energy power bills were coming down. But they didn't come down. They've continued to increase. And they continue to increase at a much higher rate than anyone expected. And the thing is that a $500 handout, temporary bill relief, now it's going to be welcomed by those families that are eligible, because it's not all families that are eligible. It's not everyone that's going to get this. It's only some. And you know, congratulations to Senator Ayres, who actually could say the word 275, the figure. Uh, it's the first time we've heard it since the election from a Labor member. But all Australians were promised $275. But it's not all Australians because those opposite never govern for all Australians. They only govern for people that vote for them. And uh, we know that not all Australians are going to receive a $500 assistance to pay for their bills. It's only some Australians. And in fact, it'll be those Australians who are the working poor, the people that are working that will miss out, the people that are actually struggling to work and pay their own way to put the roof over their head and pay for feed their family. They are the ones that won't be ineligible from this government because those opposite, they don't like the people that work to make this economy better. They don't, they don't like people who work hard to, to pay for their own retirement. They don't like people who contribute and take personal responsibility and individual responsibility for their family. They don't like them over there. They only like those who do what they're told. They only like those who vote for them. They certainly have never governed for all Australians. So maybe a little bit of a digression there, but it, I thought it was important after Senator Dare's contribution to uh, ensure that we discuss the fact that the energy bill relief isn't going to all Australians, it's going to some Australians, and it's going in conjunction with the states. So we don't even know what it's really going to look like. It's a maximum of $500. Won't be, not everyone's going to get $500, depending on what state you live in. Depends what the state government decides to do. And that's where we'll see when the rubber hits the road. And we know that over the past 12 months, since those opposite came to government, that the Australian family is $25,000 worse off. Now, we hear over there childcare. Well, there's a lot of families who don't have kids in childcare. I mean, that might be surprising to you, uh, but there are a lot of families, Australian families, with teenagers, kids who've moved beyond 
the early learning stage, kids that have moved beyond childcare, kids that are actually eating, eating families out of house and home. I've got a couple of boys and trying to keep the food up to them is absolutely impossible. <coughs> so not everyone uses childcare with families. Some have teenagers, some have big kids. But the average family is $25,000 worse off under this government, thanks to increased mortgage payments, increased power bills and the increased cost of groceries. And it's some sort of magic pudding that they seem to think exists, that you can hand out all this money, give it to people, increase payments, increase welfare payments, put all this money out there, but somehow it's not going to have an inflationary impact. Every single economist is saying that you have now put it onto the RBA to continue to lift rates. So guess who's going to be paying for that? People that have homeowners, mortgage holders. Mortgage holders are going to be paying more. Small businesses with loans are going to be paying more. These are the families that are going to be the hardest hit, but those opposite don't care. They just don't care about those Australian families. It's only niche little groups that are going to be targeted by their assistance that are going to get any benefit at all. And it will be temporary. It will be a sugar hit because we know that this will be inflationary. And there are now, this is now your budget. This is you own it. So if inflation isn't down under 4 per cent by next year, as you claim it will be. Under 4 per cent, it's a big drop, big drop real quick as you inject more money into the economy. We know that's not going to happen and you will own it. But to Senator Dunningham's uh, bill, which I, we, I actually don't even know from Senator Zaire's contribution whether or not you're supporting it. I mean, it was just bizarre. It's a yes or no, really. That, that could have helped. Uh, it was really just a speech that went round in circles on a whole range of issues, but not one about the actual bill. So, what this bill? Why? Why would you not give Australians access to transparency? Why would you not give Australians the, the opportunity to see where their power is coming from? And why wouldn't you then make every government going forward, every government going forward? And you know, we know Senator Farrell and the hubris that apparently this Labor government's never going to lose ever. Never, ever, ever. We know that's not the case. That will happen, Senator Farrell. Will happen one day. But by doing these sort of putting these sort of things in, in place, it's going to be every government going forward is going to have to table something from the Productivity Commission showing where Australia's energy mix is coming from. So that we can start to see, and then the Australian public can see, is this talk about cheaper renewables powering our economy forward, that we're apparently going to be some renewable energy superpower in a minute and a half? According to Senator Ayres, it's all overnight, all easy, all coming quick. You know, Australians can see whether you're telling them the truth. Australians will be able to see if you're telling them the truth. And you know, this confidence that you have in <coughs> technology that does not yet exist, but this confidence that you have in it, that it's all coming down the pipeline and woohoo, we're all going to be renewables. It's going to be cheap. Businesses aren't going to suffer. We're going to have Tomago smelter up in the Hunter. That'll be kicking along all good. No problems at all because, I don't know, wind will be blowing somewhere. That, uh, uh, you know, technology of batteries that doesn't, hasn't even been generated. It doesn't exist. Not possible. But somehow or other it's coming down the pipeline and those businesses are going to be able to continue. The Australian people deserve to know whether what you're telling them is the truth. They deserve to know what every government's telling them is the truth and that they can see where their power is coming from. And when they're told that, don't worry, we're going to close the rearing in 2025, we're going to take 25 per cent of the power out of the New South Wales market that comes from a coal-fired power station, don't worry. We don't need to worry about it because coal-fired power station is not contributing that much more to the grid anymore. But it is. It's the only thing that keeps the lights on. We're talking over 70 per cent of power comes from coal. But those opposites seem to think that Australians are just going to go along not worry about massive coal-fired power generators coming out of the market and somehow they're not going to get rolling blackouts. And see, when you get less supply, you get prices going up. That's, that's the whole you know, supply and demand thing that they pretty much covered in Economics 101 on day one. And when you have less supply and the same demand, prices are going to go up and they're going to keep going up. And that little sugar hit of $500 that some families will get, some families will get, not all, some. That'll be long gone. It's already been absorbed. It's not really going to make any difference to anyone's bottom line in their household budget. It's going to be a little sugar hit that's going to contribute to 
put pressure on inflation. It's going to mean that mortgages go up. And guess what that means for people that are investors in the market? Because the Greens might be interested in this. That means rents are going to keep going up. Because when investors buy houses that renters then rent, if their mortgage payments go up, so do rents. It's just how it works. And then if that's not allowed to happen or it just gets too hard for that investor, guess what they do? They sell it. And then it's not in the rental pool anymore either. They put it on the market and they take it out of the rental pool. Guess what that does, guys? That actually also reduces supply. And guess what that means? Again, day one, economics 101, supply and demand, reduce supply, demand stays the same or demand goes up, prices go up. That's what happens. Yet somehow over here when they were dozing during that first day, and I mean economics can be a bit dry sometimes, but it's kind of important and it's sort of what we look after here. Kind of important. When you take supply out, demand's either the same or going up, your prices are going to go up. And that's what's happening with power. And that's what Senator Dunning's bill is all here about so that Australians can see what's happening, how they can best manage their own family budget at a time when they are under increasing pressure and, in fact, will continue to be under increasing pressure because this budget is just going to create more inflationary problems. But what we know now is those opposite own it. You own it. You have to sell the Australian people why you are going to put more pressure on their mortgages, why you're going to put the price of everything up, and inflation is just going to continue to head north. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on this excellent bill, the Productivity Commission Amendment Electricity Reporting Bill 2023. And I just want to start by commending my good friend and colleague, Senator Dunham, uh, for crafting, putting this together and presenting it before us as a Senate to consider. Uh, it's a bill that I commend to this chamber and ask that uh, Senators seriously take this, uh, take this bill seriously. And it's an opportunity for us to get, uh, get some transparency in an, issue, in an area that really is, excuse the pun, but is, but is often in the dark uh, when it comes to keeping uh, electricity flowing and electricity flowing at a rate that Australians can afford. And what we're seeing right now across this country is Australians are feeling the pinch of cost of living and it's been felt acutely every time they get their electricity bill in the mail. And uh, there's different prices across, uh, across the country. In Western Australia we have one of the lowest energy uh, prices uh, in my home state, uh, which is something that I commend uh, uh, governments over a long period of time over there for the work that they've done in, in addressing that. We used to have uh, the lowest energy prices in the world in Western Australia, we, the lowest unit price anywhere in the world uh, in Western Australia many years ago. Unfortunately, we've fallen a long way back uh, in that regard, but nonetheless uh, we do have lower costs of electricity in WA, but it is still hitting uh, Western Australians uh, particularly hard. And uh, as my good friend Senator uh, Brockman was saying, uh, businesses in particular are really feeling the pinch because uh, you know, businesses often are, are the high, obviously are the, the highest uses, users of energy. Uh, in particular, those that are running things like fridges and freezers, like uh, grocery stores. And uh, if you're a big chain, if you're, you're big Woolies or Coles or something like that, you, know, you can probably absorb that a little bit more. But if you're a small retailer, uh, particularly in regional areas where uh, the, the costs of, of keeping your, your fridges and your freezers running all night uh, is, is extraordinary. I was just up in Fitzroy Crossing, a, a flood-ravaged community uh, that, that saw you know, the big floods go through that area in, in January. You know, that small little IGA that, that's, that's operating there, a big part of their cost of delivering uh, their services to that community is, is of course, uh, is of course their refrigeration and their air conditioning, particularly in a hot place like that, like Kununurra, uh, like Fitzroy Crossing, and so uh, electricity prices uh, uh, are up, and that means that those prices have to get passed on to consumers. And so this is why people are feeling the significant cost of living pressure. So this bill is uh, is an important bill, one that I, I really wish we'd, we would uh, actually proceed to a, a decision because it would be great if this was to happen, if the Productivity Commission uh, was compelled to, to be able to provide uh, a, a report that would be tabled by the minister in this place to, 
so that Australians could see exactly uh, what those inputs are into those unit prices that Australians are paying. So I commend Senator Dunham for bringing uh, the attention uh, of this chamber to, to this very thoughtful and, private, uh, and sensible private senator's bill. Um, the rationale behind its introduction is straightforward and it's aimed purely at creating more accessible, better consolidated public information and reporting on electricity prices and generation in Australia. The bill would require the Productivity Commission to compile quarterly reports on retail electricity prices as well as the sources from which electricity has been generated for each state and territory. And being able to understand that energy mix and the cost of that mix in providing that transparency uh, would shed some light on, on, uh, on, a, on a situation that is otherwise very opaque. Uh, because we hear a lot about renewables and how they're the lowest source of energy. And, and that might be true at, at a particular time of the day, uh, that, for example, solar when the sun, you know, particularly at midday, uh, when the sun's you know, right at that apex. And, and even at different times of the year, in, in the middle of summer, even though the sun might be shining bright, because it's really hot, uh, solar panels lose their efficiency. They don't operate as efficiently as they do uh, in, in those shoulder periods of summer, uh, right in the, in the peak. Now, of course, in, in, in winter, when, uh, when it's cloudy and the, the sun is, is down lower on the horizon, also the, the solar panels don't operate as, as efficiently as they do in the peak periods around you know, that sort of November time uh, or later in, in sort of you know, March or, or something like that. That, that. That's when you've got the, the peak efficiency. Now, at those times, yes, solar is a, is a cheaper form of electricity. But at the other times of year, when the sun's not at that optimum point in the sky or when there's clouds, uh, it's, it's clearly not because it's not producing electricity. And so you're having to rely on base other baseload sources of power, which, of course, uh, particularly on the east coast, is, is derived from coal. Uh, in Western Australia, we, one of the reasons we've got such uh, lower prices is because we, we have a, a big part of our energy mix over there is, is gas. And we have, you know, we've been doing that for a long, long time. The, the pipeline that runs all the way from, from Dampier up near Caratha a uh, long, long way from Perth, uh, is piped all the way down to Bunbury, south of Perth. And, and there's uh, generators along that pipeline that are able to produce uh, low, lower costs of, of energy that is obviously fed uh, across the southwest uh, electricity grid. And, uh, and this means that, uh, that those sources of electricity are relied on. Now, having transparency in this space in, so that Australians can see and legislators can see, uh, and businesses can see, the, the energy mix and the cost of, those, of each of those components uh, would actually really help us make more informed decisions about the, the future that we go to in this country. And it would drive investment into areas uh, of improvement. There's no doubt that storage of renewable energy is, is going to be uh, a, a big part of our uh, of our energy mix. Well, you know, if we're wanting to get investment in those areas, then of course having that transparency and accountability will, will help even drive investment. Now, this bill is aimed at, at bridging the divide to accountability and, and transparency that would represent a significant advance on what we currently have. A significant advance. It would also ensure that not just the Albanese government, but, but any future government, any future government, as uh, Senator Hughes was saying, I mean, this lot over here, they're sort of in their heyday at the moment, but they're not going to be in power forever. I mean, they might think they're immortal, but, but it's, it's not the reality. That at some point, we'll, we'll gather up the steam and we'll, we'll, we'll be back in power again. There's no doubt about that. And, uh, and so any future government will be held accountable to, in, the same measure, in the same measure. So uh, th this, is a, uh, this is an important bit of legislation that uh, uh, I really wish the Senate would be able to take a hold of. Um, I've only got a few more minutes left, um, Deputy President, so I'll, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. This is, a, this is an important bill. This is an important bill, and what we need to see is a greater level of transparency. Unfortunately, this government, uh, they talked a lot about transparency ahead of the election. They talked a lot about it. They, they crowed about it and said it was necessary. Uh, and I, don't, I agree. 
I agree. We need governments that are accountable. We need governments that are transparent in how they operate. But we just know that that's not the pattern that they're actually setting. Uh, for example, I'll give you a good point. We're, right now, industry and businesses are being consulted on industrial relations. Consultant, I'll put that in inverted commas while uh, Hansard doesn't necessarily pick that up. They're consulted. And so there's this very, very, very uh, limited detail consult uh, paper that's gone out to, to industry and they've been asked to provide feedback on it, yet there's no detail. And so, so employers uh, and, and businesses have been asked to provide detail, uh, to provide feedback on something that they don't really have any detail on. Now, I know that come later this year, when we're debating uh, the bills that will come as a result of that so-called consultation, we're going to hear that, oh, well, they, they consulted with industry, they consulted with business. Well, we just know that that's not that's not, that's, it's far from the reality of what has actually gone on. And so there's a lot of smoke and mirrors, is the point that I'm making, when it comes to the uh, so-called transparency and accountability of this government. Now, this is a way, because energy is a, a key part of our economy. It's a key part of, of addressing the cost of living pressures that Australians are facing. Providing some transparency and some light on this issue would be absolutely critical. And so I encourage senators to think about this bill and support it. Uh, we need to see cost of living pressures reduced. We need to see energy prices reduced. Granted, there was some, some funding as a bit of a sugar hit in the budget last night that's going to provide some relief, but let's remember that Australia is actually going to be paying an additional $500 a year, even with that support that's been provided to Australians through the budget last mm -hmm. night. They're still going to be paying $500 a year more than they, uh, than they were last year. Now, this is impacting Australians. Australians are finding it difficult to pay their bills. Every time they're opening that envelope and they're seeing the bill and the cost of that, it's a significant issue. So this is a way to reduce that and to provide the support to Australians. Thank you. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. You'll be in continuance. The time for this debate has expired. Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number one, Public Interest Disclosure Amendment Review Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Uh, the Coalition will be supporting this piece of legislation. The bill implements 21 of the 33 recommendations of the 2016 MOST review into the Public Interest Disclosure Act 2013. It also implements recommendations 6.1 and 6.3 of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services 2017 inquiry into whistleblower protections in the corporate, public and not-for-profit sectors, and it, uh, it implements recommendations 10 and 11 of the 2020 inquiry by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security into the impact of the exercise of law enforcement and intelligence powers on the freedom of the press. These recommendations have been agreed to by the Coalition and we welcome these changes. The bill itself, though, deals with the Commonwealth Government's whistleblower protection and disclosure regime. It is an accountability mechanism. It is important that accountability measures achieve what they are intended to achieve and avoid the unintended consequences that can often result in more harm being done than good. That has always been the contention of the coalition when debating transparency legislation, and that is why, in coming to this particular bill, we are very much in support of making improvements to the Public Interest Disclosure Act in line with the recommendations of the Moss Review, which are enacted by this bill. The Public Interest Disclosure Act was a creation of the former Rudd-Gillard government, but it actually happened at the very, very end of its term. And it is a little ironic that the current Attorney-General was also the Attorney-General at that time and brought forward his bill just as the parliament was about to expire. Um, which I have to say, it meant at the time there could be little attention or debate given to it. 
One may say jump forward to 2023 in relation to the approach being taken at this point in time and in this parliament by the Attorney General that a pattern of behaviour in relation to very poor judgment is now occurring uh, when it comes to the transparency and inquiry into pieces of legislation. And these are fundamentally important pieces of legislation that this Attorney General uh, is responsible for. In terms of when this bill was first brought forward, and as I said, Given the timing, little attention to detail could be or debate be given to it. But the coalition at the time did welcome and support the transparency measures. Through the committee process, though, the coalition helped to substantially improve the bill. And what we did was put forward amendments to tighten and focus the Act. Now, key to these amendments was a requirement that the Act be reviewed to understand its impact. And here we are today now debating the bill before the Senate. I am pleased that at that time we pushed, and we did push very hard, for that statutory requirement for a review. And that is actually how the Moss Review itself then came about. And through the course of the Moss Review, it became clear that further refining was needed. Now, the Moss Review itself made clear that despite the good intentions, of the Public Interest Disclosure Act, there is significant room for improvement in how the legislation itself actually operates. At present, the purpose of the Act is not being sufficiently achieved, as the scope is wrong and the procedure is too complex, leaving complainants dissatisfied and agencies struggling to implement the regime. Again, just by way of a comment, this is what happens when you don't enable proper scrutiny and debate in relation to a complex piece of legislation. I just want to now quote from the Moss Review. It said this, The experience of whistleblowers under the Pitt Act is not a happy one. Few individuals who have made public interest disclosures reported that they felt supported. Some felt that their disclosure had not been adequately investigated or that their agency had not adequately addressed the conduct reported. Many disclosures reported experiencing reprisal as a result of bringing forward their concerns. The review also found, and again I quote, the bulk of disclosures related to personal employment related grievances and were better addressed through other processes. Agencies noted also that the PIDAX procedures and mandatory obligations upon individuals are ill-adapted to addressing such disclosures. The review therefore concluded that the current PIDAC provisions impair the effective operation of the framework. And in this respect, the review noted that there are two principal challenges. The PIDs interactions with other procedures for investigating wrongdoing are overly complex. The kinds of disclosable conduct are too broad. Rather than being targeted at the most serious, serious integrity risks, such as fraud, serious misconduct or corrupt conduct, the review also found that most public interest disclosures concern matters that are better understood as personal employment related grievances for which, as we know, the PIT Act framework itself is not well suited. So, in short, the Act is being used for the wrong purposes and it is doing so badly. It needs to be tightened and focused in order to achieve the purpose that the legislation set out to achieve. In terms of the bill that we have here before us today, the bill is an attempt to correct some of the Act's shortcomings. It will now remove personal work-related conduct from the PID scheme unless it relates to systemic wrongdoing or reprisal action. It will provide increased flexibility around the handling of disclosures and provide clearer timeframes. It will extend protections from reprisals to witnesses and those who have made, may have made, proposed to or could make a disclosure. And finally, it will improve information sharing between agencies. 
Again, by way of a comment, it is worth noting that these are the types of limitations the Coalition was concerned to try and address when the Act was first considered in 2013. Jump forward ten years later, and I really do hope a pattern of behaviour is not setting in with the current Attorney-General and a very, very poor judgment in relation to how he treats important pieces of legislation that this parliament deserves to scrutinise properly. Because coming out of the Moss Review, what do we see? The issues that the Coalition raised at the time now have come into play. They bore out in the reality, and we are now finally addressing them as a result of the Moss Review. Could I just now go to some of the Coalition's positions on some of the key issues at that time, back in 2013? Section 31 of the Act was introduced to give greater clarity to what would be considered disclosable conduct. The Coalition was rightly concerned that the definition of disclosable conduct was far too broad and that the Act would capture far more than it ought to capture. Section 31 made it specifically clear that policy disagreements did not amount to wrongdoing and could not be captured. I quote then Shadow Attorney-General George Brandis, who said this. The purpose of this legislation is not to provide a platform for people to agitate political grievances or to provide a forum for people to use to tie up political or administrative decision making merely because they disagree with the decision that has been made. The purpose of whistleblower protection legislation is and only is to protect whistleblowers who disclose wrongdoing. Now, what we've seen in the Moss Review is that the definition remains still too broad. While policy disagreements were rightly excluded by the coalition, employment grievances have clogged up the work of the agencies and were never the purpose of the Act. Agencies must not ignore issues relating to workplace grievances or conflict. These matters, of course, must be addressed, but the frameworks established by the Pitt Act are not designed for dealing with those matters and should instead be refocused on matters relating to wrongdoing, such as I said previously, serious misconduct or fraud. Workplace grievances themselves should be resolved through other processes. Finally, the bill makes changes to the National Anti-Corruption Commission to align the definition of reprisals and detriment with the definitions that will be in the Public Interest Disclosure Act. And just in conclusion, these are material, mechanical improvements to the operation of an important transparency mechanism, and the Coalition supports them. We believe that whistleblowers must be able to make disclosures without fear of recrimination, but equally, schemes should not be open to abuse by those who seek to cause mischief or achieve a political or industrial outcome through an inappropriate disclosure. Getting the balance right on this legislation, as we said back in 2013, we say it again in 2023, is essential. We welcome these adjustments that do correct some of those past flaws. And we note further government amendments that we understand will be moved to address issues identified during the committee inquiry into the bill. Ultimately, the hope that those who make disclosures are genuinely protected and that serious matters of misconduct are investigated by our agencies. And I do commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Shoebridge. Oh, thanks, uh, Deputy President. Uh, I rise on behalf of the Greens to indicate we will be supporting this bill with amendments um, that we'll address in the committee stage. Um, I say at the beginning that this is a bill about protecting whistleblowers. Um, and at its core, protecting whistleblowers is about protecting the truth. Without a commitment to truth, which the Greens accept, can include open and challenging contests about what is true, democracy, democracies simply can't function. And that is why this bill is so important. And it's also why the bill has been put under close scrutiny by the Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs. The Public Interest Disclosure Act 2013, which this bill seeks to amend, is one of a number of critical ways we actually protect whistleblowers in this country. 
And in the 10 years since it's been enacted, there have been very significant developments internationally and domestically that have not been incorporated in Australia's whistleblower laws. Um, in that time, there have been whistleblower protections inserted into the Corporations Act that are in significant ways superior to those that apply to public sector employees under the Pitt Act. We've also seen the 2016 Moss report into the Pitt Act, which sat on the shelf unimplemented by the former government. Um, it is a matter of public record that the former government had the Moss report for six years with key recommendations about um, the, the, the urgent need to repair and improve our whistleblower protections in this country, and they did nothing. And not only did they do nothing, under the former government, a number of, whistleblow number of whistleblowers who sought to get the protection of the Pitt Act and came out and bravely told the truth ended up being prosecuted. And to the current government's shame, those prosecutions are continuing. Um, and I'll, I'll address that at, at some further point. So what, what, ha what we do have at the moment is whistleblowers, public sector whistleblowers, with far fewer protections than they deserve. And as a result, this parliament has an obligation, and I think an obligation not just on behalf of those whistleblowers, but an obligation on behalf of the entire country to address these matters as, as, as urgent matters and I have to say, this bill goes about 20 per cent of the way there, about perhaps 25 per cent of the way there. Um, there are three areas that I'll focus on um, in this second reading contribution directly related to this bill. They are firstly the inappropriately large carve-out proposed under the Public Interest Disclosure Act for personal work-related matters. This bill, in its form as tabled, gets it wrong and I hope we will correct that in the committee stage. The second matter is the absence of one of the critical national reforms we need, which is a whistleblower commission, a national whistleblower commission. And the third is the inexplicable lack of remedies for whistleblowers who approach, who approach the National Anti-Corruption Commission. And, and, and it's important when we're addressing that third point to realise that the government said at the end of last year and in the first part of this year that these, uh, these, these amendments in this bill were absolutely urgent. And the attorney said that they needed months of implementation in the public sector before the NAC opened and was indeed very, very critical of the crossbench and the opposition for taking this bill to an inquiry. Uh, very hot under the collar, very heated said it was urgent, said they needed months to implement it. Very, very angry at the opposition and the crossbench for taking this, this bill to an inquiry. We took it to an inquiry. The inquiry reported well over a month ago. The inquiry reported in March, in time for the March sittings, and the attorney failed to bring it on. Failed to bring it on. So, so uh, we will be seeking an explanation from the minister about what happened to the urgency. We were told it was urgent to get it through in March. The committee complied with that, did everything we could, shortened our hearing schedules, produced the report, and then the government just did nothing with it for the better part of two months. Where is the urgency? And is it going to be ready in time for the NAC to open its doors? And I said at the beginning of this contribution that protecting the truth should be a political project that unites political parties who are serious about democracy. We should all come together here and celebrate when whistleblowers tell the truth about government, mis about government misbehaviour, about corporate misbehaviour. But instead, this parliament has failed to back in key whistleblowers. It's failed to send the biggest single consent to people in the public sector about truth-telling. It has failed to make a statement for the end of the prosecution of whistleblowers David McBride and Richard Boyle. And that's why, on behalf of the Greens, I move the second reading amendment to add at the end of the second reading amendment that the Senate 
recognises the need for further reforms to whistleblower laws and supports ending the current prosecution of whistleblowers David McBride and Richard Boyle and ensuring that what happened to them does not happen in the future. And this is a chance for this parliament, for this chamber, to come together and say, yes, we're not just tinkering with the laws. We are making a clear statement that the ongoing criminal prosecution of David McBride for telling the truth about war crimes in Afghanistan is a stain on this government. It's a stain on this government. It's a stain on the former government, and it sends a signal to everybody in the ADF: you better not tell the truth again, or this government's going to come after you and try and put you in jail. David McBride should be acknowledged as a truth teller. Should be acknowledged as, as, a, as a, a member of the ADF who was willing to put his career on the line to tell the truth about war crimes, which led to the Brereton report, which identified the war crimes in detail. And what's been this government's response and what's the previous government's response? Well, the current Attorney General is quite happy for David McBride to continue to be prosecuted and to be put in jail for telling the truth about war crimes. We must make a statement here today that that's an obscenity and to say to the Attorney, drop the prosecution. And I say the same about Richard Boyle. Richard Boyle saw appalling behaviour in the Australian Tax Office utterly appalling behaviour. He saw the way in which individuals being dragged through the courts, losing their financial security, and it was happening on an industrial scale in the Australian tax office. And he, told, he tried to get it fixed internally, and they refused to address it. And in, finally, in desperation, he came out and told the public the truth. And he's been backed in. He's been backed in by the ATO, an investigation in the ATO, and he's been backed in by a committee of this Senate who said everything he said was right. And the ATO has been forced to change its behaviour, and thousands and thousands of people have been protected from ongoing bastardry by the tax office. And what, does, what did the former government do? It prosecuted him for breaching confidence, and it's trying to put him in jail. And what's the current attorney doing? Signing off on the continuation of that prosecution. Quite comfortable, quite comfortable with Richard Boyle, a whistleblower from the public sector, being put in jail for saving thousands and thousands of Australians from being completely monstered by the tax office. We have a chance now in this, in this debate to support the Green Second Reading Amendment and say those prosecutions should end. And that is about the most fundamental signal we could send to whistleblowers. Yet, by all means, amend the law. But whistleblowers, whether in the tax office, the ADF, the Attorney General's Department, Home Affairs, they're thinking about telling the truth and they're looking at the legal protections and they don't seem very good. But then the big meta message that's sent by the current government is their ongoing prosecution of David McBride and their ongoing prosecution of, um, of Mr Boyle. And unless that message is sent to the whistleblowers that we're going to protect them, they're not going to be prosecuted. We can change the law all we like, but whistleblowers are still getting the message from this government as they did the previous one. Stick your head above the trenches. We're going to kick it, and they're going to put you in jail. And we have a chance to fix that. Um, can I deal now with the inappropriately large carve-out that's proposed um, in this PID Act for personal work-related matters? This was an issue raised by a great majority of engaged stakeholders to the inquiry. That was the CPSU, the Alliance Against Political Prosecutions, the Uniting Church, Morris Blackburn Lawyers, Australian Lawyers Alliance, Human Rights Law Centre, Griffith University and Transparency International. I commend all of them for the way in they, which they engaged in the inquiry and for the strength of their submissions. But the essence of that concern is that the proposed drafting in sections 29A and 29.2 of the bill does not implement Recommendation 5 of the Moss Report. And Moss's recommendation was simple and it was balanced. And it said this, that the definition of disclosable conduct in the PID Act should be amended to exclude conduct solely related to personal employment, relate, to personal employment related grievances, unless the authorising officer considers that it relates to systemic wrongdoing. Other existing legislative frameworks are better adapted to dealing with and resolving personal employment related grievances. And the Greens agree with that. To the extent a matter is solely related to personal employment-related grievances that shouldn't be dealt with under the PID Act. 
but this bill does not implement that recommendation. Because the rationale behind that recommendation was that if a complaint solely relates to that workplace issue, then take it under those other, 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 other mechanisms, not the PIT Act. The PIT Act, which contains quite a rigid response structure and strict confidentiality, can actually be a barrier to resolving some of those issues in the workplace. Moss found that too many PIT Act complaints were simply workplace issues, and therefore the scheme and workplace relations within the public sector would be enhanced by removing those matters that are solely, and I emphasise that word, solely work-related personal concerns. And the reason that Moss recommended limiting the exclusion to matters that are solely work-related concerns, work-related personal concerns, is because he recognised that once someone blows the whistle, the line between the original public disclosure and any ad adverse action taken against the whistleblower after that is very hard to separate. And the evidence before Moss, like the evidence we got before our inquiry, made it clear that many whistleblowers, once they make their concerns public, very often face reply reprisals in the workplace. That can include seemingly unrelated disciplinary action, demotions, even dismissal, that are purportedly for matters unrelated to their whistleblowing, but in truth are intimately connected. So there is merit in, in Moss's balance recommendation, but this bill goes beyond that. The proposed section 29.2 and 29A exclude work-related conduct matters from the operation of the PIT Act. No reference to the limitation of solely, uh, and, and, and it includes such a broad definition in the carve-out that the exclusion far exceeds Moss's far more, uh, much more balanced proposal. While the proposed section 29.2 excludes personal work-related matters from the 29A carve-out, where they're taken as reprisal action against the whistleblower, as multiple submissions to the inquiry pointed out, that's a toothless protection, a meaningless protection. Since the inception of the PIT Act, guess how many su successful prosecutions there have been for reprisal action. Ten years of the PIT Act, multiple complaints under the PIT Act, multiple disclosures, thousands of them. How many successful prosecutions? Not one. Not one successful prosecution for reprisal. It's because the law doesn't work. Unlike the Corporations Act, where there's a reverse onus, the PIT Act makes it, it puts the almost impossible task of the prosecution of proving what's in the mind of the person taking the reprisal action. You have to prove the adverse intent, and it doesn't work. And for some reason, the attorney has failed to fix that. Can I, can I address very briefly the need for a whistleblower commission? We can change the law, tinker with the law, make the marginal changes here. But when a whistleblower stands up against a government agency, a multi-billion dollar government agency, the law at the moment is they're on their own. They need someone on their side. And not one individual, but they need an institution. Like happens in the Netherlands and happens in other jurisdictions around the world. They need a whistleblower commission, properly funded, who will be on their side, help take them through the steps of being a whistleblower and give them some balance in what is otherwise a David and Goliath fight, where we know from case after case after case, Goliath keeps winning. Goliath and shutting down the truth. Um, and I'll finish with this. These amendments are said to be urgent for the NAC Act, for the NAC to be operating. True that is. So why are there no remedies? for the whistleblower protections and the PID Act protections in the NAC Act? Why is there no remedy for allow, to allow for reinstatement? Why is there no remedy to allow for compensation to be paid? Again, I'll be asking the minister in the committee, invest, in the committee uh, um, deliberations why the absence of remedies and does that really protect whistleblowers? Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President, and uh, can I acknowledge at the outset the contribution that Senator Shoebridge made through the committee process as we looked at this amendment bill, uh, and I think uh, very important evidence was gathered during the committee pro uh, stage. And I'd also like to commend the officers of the Attorney-General's Department uh, and say that I'm, uh, I'm very pleased to see that some amendments have been put forward by the government in relation to that vexed issue of the entwining of personal work-related conduct with matters which properly form the basis of a public interest disclosure. Because, as it was commented on 
during the uh, committee's deliberations and the evidence we receive, quite often there's a blurring of the two. And I say that as someone who had responsibility as a whistleblower officer in the corporate sector, an organisation with nearly 4,000 employees, with operations across a number of different continents, and uh, having to deal with the sort of matters which arise. And some of these issues are extraordinarily complicated. They are complicated because, as Senator Shoebridge rightly said, sometimes whistleblowers who are raising concerns about what is happening in an organisation do get targeted. They do get targeted in terms of their workplace performance, in terms of whether or not they're overlooked for promotions, in terms of uh, allocation of responsibilities, uh, being counselled with respect to their attitude. Uh, the example I gave uh, during the course of the inquiry, and these are real-life examples, are of potentially uh, executives or senior managers raising issues with respect to cost blow blowouts on projects, scheduled blowouts on projects, raising concerns with respect to project governance and being told that they had the wrong attitude or they weren't playing the team game, get on the team game, etc. Et and these can be very, very difficult issues. And uh, I'm firmly of the view that in considering those issues, consideration has to be given to the reality of the situation of the whistleblower themselves. The reality of the situation of the whistleblower themselves. So I am pleased the Attorney General's Department has worked on putting forward some amendments, which I do think clarify some of the issues which arose, uh, and commend the, uh, the government for doing so. As Senator Cash said, uh, the opposition is supporting the legislation. We think there are important changes which are coming through this uh, legislation. There are some other further reforms which uh, I think should be considered as the operation of this legislation uh, is reviewed, and I'll talk about that. At the outset, though, I want to recognise, deeply recognise the contribution that whistleblowers make to our civic society, both in the public sector and the private sector. They are absolutely vital, absolutely vital to identifying misconduct that occurs in both the public sphere and the private sphere. And I was personally honoured in the course of the conduct of the committee to hear evidence from Mr James Shelton, who is quite a legendary whistleblower in the Australian context. Now, Mr Shelton was involved in, one in, in exposing, in bringing to the public attention one of the most egregious cases of foreign corruption engaged in by Australian companies in our modern history. And that was the foreign bribery offences committed by Securency and Note Printing Australia in terms of their efforts to generate business, in particular across Southeast Asia. And Mr Shelton, extraordinarily bravely, with another individual called Mr Brian Hood, brought those uh, egregious activities to light. And I want to read and put on the record, I want to put on the record in this place and in honour of Mr Shelton and in honour of Mr Hood and other whistleblowers, the comments which Her Honour Justice Hollingworth made in one of the cases in relation to those cases. And these are the, the words of Her Honour Justice Hollingworth, and we should all reflect on this in terms of whistleblowers and the important contribution they make to civic society. The judge's words. Before I turn to consider your personal circumstances, I wish to say something about the effect this offending has had on others. The prosecution rely upon the significant adverse effects that all of the foreign bribery offences have had on two whistleblowers, James Shelton and Brian Hood. Mr Hood joined MPA as its company secretary the year after you had left. And I should say she's referring to those who had pled guilty to the offences. When he became aware of the company's illegal activities, he raised his concerns with the CEO, the MPA board and a number of RBA officials. His attempts to report what was happening and to change the corporate culture were met with hostility and resistance. Were met with hostility and resistance. He was eventually made redundant. Mr. Shelton joined the currency in 2007 as the director of business development when he realised that he was expected to take part in foreign bribery as part of his role. 
He too became extremely concerned. He raised the matter with the Australian Federal Police in 2008, but they appear to have done little to investigate his reports at the time. Mr Shelton was dismissed in late 2008. As I've, as I've noted on earlier occasions, the corporate cultures of both MPA and Securency involve secrecy and a denial of responsibility for any wrongdoing. Staff were discouraged from examining too closely the arrangements in relation to overseas agents. Given the corporate cultures in which they were operating, Mr Hood and Mr Shelton both showed tremendous courage. Mr Hood and Mr Shelton showed tremendous courage in raising their concerns about foreign bribery activities with appropriate people. In each, case, in each case, their concerns were dismissed or not fired up. Their careers suffered as a consequence of their, given, of their attempts to do the right thing. Unfortunately, given their number, size and complexity, the various foreign bribery court proceedings have lasted for many years longer than anyone might have anticipated, without there having been any public acknowledgement of the very important role pl played by Brian Hood and James Shelton in exposing what happened within Securency and MPA. I can readily accept that what has happened to them since they raised their concerns has caused both of them considerable personal distress, professional hardship and financial loss." End quote. So, As we reflect on this legislation, we should reflect, we should reflect upon the courage demonstrated by whistleblowers both in the public sector and the private sector, and the personal cost, the personal cost that they incur when they blow the whistle on wrongdoing. And all of our considerations of these matters should be informed by consideration of that courage on the part of the whistleblowers. In my engagement with Mr Shelton during the course of the inquiry, I raised the issue of how assistance could be provided to whistleblowers in these extraordinary situations. So we've just heard, we've just heard from the judge, we just heard from the judge in her sentencing remarks with respect to someone who was actually found guilty of engaging in this inappropriate conduct. Her sentencing remarks talked about the toll that this took on Mr Shelton and Mr Hood. And I had an engagement with Mr Shelton with respect to this in terms of in terms of how we can better support whistleblowers in this position. And I want to read from the engage, engagement I had with Mr Shelton in that regard. Uh, send a scar. I'll move quickly to my second topic, which is the utility of a whistleblowing protection authority. Mr Shelton, in trying to put myself in your shoes, which is very difficult to do, it seems to me that someone in your position as a potential whistleblower is standing at the entrance of an extraordinarily complicated legislative maze. Mr Shelton, yes. Send us go. You enter that maze and there are inclusions, exclusions, defined terms, undefined terms and statutory cross-references. It's like you're trying to navigate the maze while solving a cryptic crossword puzzle. At the same time, at the same time, you've got the personal pressure of what it means for you professionally and financially and what it means for your family. And at the same time, you've got the potential threat of reprisal action. Mr Shelton, yes. Senator Scar, while I was thinking about that situation and Senator Shoebridge gave the analogy of someone having a map to guide them through a minefield, which is very evocative, I was also thinking about the potential utility of a whistleblower protection authority who can act as a guide in terms of navigating that minefield. Mr Shelton, indeed, and I agree 100 per cent with you with what you've just said. Just briefly, from my experience, there was no whistleblower protection authority. I had to get legal advice at $600 an hour each time I met the AFP or did a witness statement. Now, this is someone, this is someone who's blown the whistle on one of the most egregious acts of foreign bribery in Australian corporate history involving government, partly government-owned agencies. He's had to go and get his own legal advice at $600 an hour each time he went to court. And this is what he says. I was summoned to appear as a witness had to wait out the front of the court and then was cross-examined by QCs for two days. There was no path or guide. I did it all because I was determined to get this result. An independent whistleblower protection authority which could provide a guide, a way forward and a pathway on what you will experience, what's going to come up and what you feel, and also provide some support services, would have made the world a difference to me. It's too late for me. It's too late for me. 
But for others who come after, yes, 100 per cent, there needs to be an independent whistleblower protection authority that covers both the private and public sectors." End quote. What is the point of putting in all of these protections to help whistleblowers from reprisal actions if they're in a David and Goliath battle with a huge agency that has all the, all the resources it requires in order to defend itself, and you've got someone like Mr Shelton or Mr Hood who has to delve into their own pocket to try and continue the good fight in terms of exposing corruption and wrongdoing in this, in this country. They need support. And I note that the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Corporations and Financial Services has previously recommended during the course of the previous government that a whistleblower protection authority be established. Amongst other things, the committee proposed that the authority would provide a clearinghouse for whistleblowers bringing forward public interest disclosures, provide advice and assistance to whistleblowers, and support and protect whistleblowers. And that is absolutely needed. And from my perspective, from my perspective, I think that everything we can do to provide support to whistleblowers who are, who are identifying, revealing in the public interest corporate wrongdoing is a good for society, is a good for all of society, because we need these episodes of corporate wrongdoing, public sector wrongdoing, to be exposed. And we need them to be exposed as early as possible, because that's in the best, that's in the best interest of the whole of society, of the whole of the Australian society. I'm someone who worked uh, for a number of years, 12 years, in an organisation that had uh, interests in Southeast Asia and also other jurisdictions around the world which had uh, high risk ratings in terms of uh, foreign corrupt practices. And I'm pleased to say the company I worked for never went down that path. It was part of our culture. But I saw firsthand the impact of corruption. The, I saw the impact of corruption on those societies. And when we look at Mr Shelton, we look at Mr Hood, we should reflect on the matter that not only did they do a great service to the Australian community, they also did a great service to the people in those countries through Southeast Asia in particular, who's, who, who, some of whose leadership was prepared to accept bribes to the direct detriment of the people of those countries. So not only did Mr Shelton and Mr Hood provide a great service to the people of Australia, they also provide a great service to the people in those overseas jurisdictions where that foreign corrupt activity was taking place. And that needs to be recognised as well. I note that the previous government, in response to the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Corporations and Financial Services recommendation that a whistleblower protection authority be established, the previous government, the coalition government's response was, and I quote, the government supports a post-implementation review of whistleblowing protection. This will provide the opportunity to assess the merit and cost case of establishing a one-stop shop whistleblower protection authority when the present reforms have had a reasonable time to operate and further information is available." End quote. So certainly the previous government, the coalition government of which I was a part, was open-minded to the establishment of a whistleblower protection authority. I think the previous government was right to be open-minded with respect to the establishment of a whistleblower protection authority. And from my perspective, from my perspective, I think such, the establishment of such an authority would provide an invaluable resource, an invaluable resource to assist whistleblowers who want to do the right thing, as Mr Shelton did, as Mr Hood did, to expose, expose wrongdoing, but to provide them with the support they need, provide them with the support they need to navigate an extraordinarily complicated system and to give them some protection against reprisal actions that whistleblowers often suffer. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I rise in support of this bill and I thank Senator Scar, Senator Shoebridge and the many others um, who have worked on this for, for much longer than myself. Um, it's great to see the government moving the update um, to the Public Interest Disclosure Act. Uh, these changes are long overdue. Until recently, Australia was falling down the list in the annual Corruption Perception Index from Transparency International. Uh, in the most recent report, 
Uh, earlier this year, we went from a record low of 18 up to 13th, and I believe this improvement is in large part due to the passing of the NAC. Uh, a significant change, one that I welcome, but this brings us to a crucial missing part of the, the, the puzzle here, which is the legal protection given to whistleblowers in Australia. And clearly that is not up to scratch. Um, in the public sector, some protection is given to whistleblowers under the PIT Act, uh, which the, the AG himself oversaw in 2013. And this is obviously a particularly significant piece of legislation for many people in the ACT, many hardworking public servants. But since that was legislated in 2013, significant issue issues have become clear. In 2019, Justice John Griffiths described the Act as technical, obtuse and intractable. And he went on to say that it is large, largely impenetrable, not only for a lawyer, but even more so for an ordinary member of the public or a person employed in the Commonwealth bureaucracy. And Justice Griffiths was not the first to raise concerns. In 2016, the Moss Review of the Act made 33 recommendations for changes to the legislation. I welcome the implementation of 21 of those recommendations in this bill. The changes represent real improvements that will assist those who speak out, including those who make disclosures to the NAC. I applaud the Attorney General for his work on the bill, which seeks to improve the protections that he himself um, put into place in 2013. But we still have a long way to go. Whistleblowers in Australia are not being properly protected. Instead, they're being prosecuted. They are being forced to rely on protection from the offices of parliamentarians to speak out. Andrew Wilkie, uh, Zoe Daniel and myself recently used parliamentary privilege to voice concerns raised by whistleblowers. I was able to raise concerns about an oil spill that killed dolphins and has been covered up. Mr Wilkie raised concerns about the fraud by the Hillsong Church. And Ms. Daniel raised concerns about children being kept in solitary confinement. The fact that our officers protect us from the risks experienced by whistleblowers is a sign of the strength of our democracy. The fact that whistleblowers are forced to come to us <laughs> is a sign of how far we have to go to protect whistleblowers. They should not have to seek parliamentary privilege to do what is in the public, public interest. Because when whistleblowers don't speak up, we all suffer. Where there's corruption, maladministration or incompetence, it needs to be called out and dealt with. As legislators, we should all be pushing for the quality of governance we offer our constituents to be improved. These reforms, which are a good first step, are part of a two-step package. The Attorney General has committed to a second stage of reforms that will substantially improve the protections offered to whistleblowers. Key to these further reforms will be a whistleblower protection authority or commissioner. There will soon be consultation and discussion around the possible establishment of such a body. And I welcome this consultation. Uh, consultation is a good thing, but I urge the government to act swiftly. We've seen the cost of inaction uh, with the sentencing of Witness K and the Attorney General's intervention in the case of Bernard Collieri. As uh, we dis debate this today, the trials of Richard Boyle and David McBride continue. These are two people, two Australians, who made the difficult decision to blow the whistle on very significant issues, and now they're being prosecuted for their decision. We cannot have more cases like Witness K, Bernard Collieri, Richard Boyle and David McBride. We need whistleblower protections that work, and we need them now. So I urge the government to expedite this and ensure that we have world-class whistleblower protections here in Australia, because we all benefit from that. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, I rise today to make a contribution 
in relation to uh, this legislation on, on whistleblowers, and it's uh, it's something that I think is absolutely critical that we get right in this place. Uh, it's been a long road uh, to get to this point for this parliament. Um, I just want to give a little bit of background. Uh, obviously, there's been legislation in place uh, to provide some kind of uh, processes for whistleblowers and some kind of protection. Um, for example, the uh, Taxation Administration Act uh, 1953 uh, raised this issue of protecting whistleblowers. We also saw the Corporations uh, Act of 2001 make amendments to try and protect whistleblowers in the, uh, in the private sector. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second, but um, I participated uh, in uh, the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Corporations and Financial Services uh, inquiry uh, in 2016-2017 into whistleblower protections in the corporate, public and not-for-profit sectors. Uh, we've obviously seen uh, the Moss Review. Uh, we've seen a lot of focus on some very high-profile cases uh, where whistleblowers uh, have actually been pursued and persecuted by this government. Uh, and so while it's great on one hand to be in here uh, doing what we can to provide the necessary legislative protections for whistleblowers, uh, it is ironic that on the other hand uh, we are still pursuing uh, high-profile whistleblowers like Richard Boyle. Uh, who blew the whistle on practices in the Australian tax office, and of course uh, David McBride, uh, who leaked information, uh, which I'll get to in a second, which has actually led to disclosures of war crimes and even to a prosecution of uh, an Australian Defence Force personnel. Uh, yet, yet uh, he still awaits a trial as the government pursues him for blowing the whistle. Uh, and this parliament, over many, in fact, over many parliaments, worked very hard to secure, uh, or not to secure, to see an end to the persecution uh, of Witness K. Uh, we actually tried to get up a Senate inquiry in the last parliament into uh, matters concerning the disclosures of Witness K, uh, but we were unable to. The crossbench and the Greens were unable to secure, uh, support. The, uh, or get the support of the Labor government in opposition at the time, which was very disappointing. Uh, and I do uh, commend the Attorney General, uh, Mr Dreyfus, for uh, finally bringing to an end that prosecution of a whistleblower uh, whose name we still don't know, uh, but went through sheer hell in his personal life uh, after he tried to go through processes within the public service, not to leak information, but to go through processes to blow the whistle on something he felt deeply about uh, and instead uh, was dragged through the court system uh, for many years, uh, presumably because the government wanted to make an example of Witness K, exactly what they're doing uh, with Richard Boyle and exactly what they're doing with David McBride. So can we at least acknowledge, uh, Senators, that it's great to be acting on uh, whistleblower protections, but at the same time uh, we've got to end these high-profile prosecutions of people who were essentially blowing the whistle uh, and trying to bring uh, some justice to issues they felt very deeply about. Um, so the whistleblower protections uh, inquiry, I think uh, has been very important to try and uh, hone our attention on what needs to be done. Uh, that reported uh, at the end of 2017, uh, and it was very comprehensive. It took a number of, uh, a number of submissions, over 100 submissions, and took evidence in a series of public hearings uh, right around the country. Um, it looked at um, the current public interest disclosure laws. It looked at previous inquiries and reviews. It looked at international developments, uh, and it provided an analysis of international and Australian whistleblower protections. It then looked at consistency across sectors, uh, what legislation we currently had in place, the inconsistencies in current legislation and in whistleblowing processes and practice. 
uh, and how we might achieve consistency across sectors. It looked at constitutional limitations. Uh, then it looked at a comparison of whistleblower protections, uh, as well as a definition of uh, what would be uh, classified as disclosable conduct, uh, and looked at the differences between current arrangements in that uh, regard in relation to the public sector and the private sector. Uh, it then went through definition of whistleblowers, what do we mean by whistleblowers, and thresholds for protection, um, including suspected whistleblowers, uh, protections for those handling disclosures within public and private sector, uh, and protections for suppliers and customers. Um, it looked at the anonymity of whistleblowers, provisions and protections for anonymous reporting, the continuity of protection and protections for confidentiality. It then looked at internal regulatory and external uh, reporting channels, uh, the reporting channels in current legislation, internal disclosures, regulatory disclosures and external disclosures. Uh, it, looked at, uh, it took evidence from uh, members of parliament, uh, advice from the clerks of both the Senate uh, and the House of Representatives. Uh, it looked at protections, remedies and sanctions uh, for reprisals. Uh, and we received considerable evidence in regard to that. We also looked at systems, for example, in the US around providing rewards for whistleblowers, bounty systems in other jurisdictions, arguments for reward system in Australia, and arguments against reward systems. Um, and of course, we looked at the establishment of a whistleblower protection authority. Um, and that was an interesting one. Um, and a, a number of uh, you know, de very detailed um, appendixes around um, case studies. And I believe it, it, it's helped us get to this point uh, where we are today. Now, the context of this bill. Um, the Greens, um, as has been uh, uh, already uh, outlined by uh, my colleague, uh, Senator Shoebridge, uh, believe it's a positive step to see the government taking action on updating Australia's whistleblower laws, and there is a broad consensus uh, in, in this place on the need for significant reform, and this bill is a beginning. Um, the Moss Review from 2016, uh, you know, nearly uh, seven years ago, uh, is already significantly out of date. So implementing its recommendations isn't a comprehensive answer to what's needed uh, here, but it's a start. Uh, and we commend the government for bringing it forward. But even with these changes, the laws leave whistleblowers woefully unprotected and risks, including court costs, are real, as well as career and personal costs. And while a comprehensive review of the PID Act is promised, this is what we've been given and what will be applicable for the NACC's first complaints. That's deeply concerning and may significantly hamper the operation of an integrity body. Going forward, a whistleblower commissioner and commission will be needed, and needed to ensure something is standing in the corner of brave whistleblowers in this country. Um, we referred this bill uh, off to inquiry because of the significant concerns from the sector that it would firstly not deliver the needed changes to protect whistleblowers, and secondly, would have unintended consequences because of drafting that would inappropriately exclude many issues that should be covered. We have significant concerns about the extent of the personal work-related conduct carve-out, as do most stakeholders in this debate. The carve-out is supposed to limit matters that are about bullying or workplace issues been taken to the NACC, but this fails to recognise that most whistleblowing matters include a mix of disclosable content and then the consequences of this in a workplace. We recognise that the government's own amendments to this bill that pass in the other place go some way towards addressing these concerns, but not far enough. Um, beyond this bill and, and going forward, uh, there is a significant underlying issue, uh, or there is a significant underlying issue, and that is the impact of the overly zealous use of secrecy provisions in laws 
and how that impacts on whistleblowers. And this is something that really needs to be addressed uh, in the future. As well as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, ending the ongoing prosecutions of Richard Boyle and David McBride that are going to uh, undermine public confidence in what we do here. Because we should actually uh, do as we say and protect whistleblowers, not prosecute them publicly, not drag them through the courts, not make their life hell to send a message to other whistleblowers. Um, and clearly we need uh, serious reform uh, in this place, and if we're going to do that, we need to drop these cases. Um, I just wanted to give uh, a special uh, shout out to uh, David McBride, who um, I have, uh, as I know my colleague Senator Shoebridge, has been fortunate enough to uh, speak with uh, Mr McBride at a number of public appearances, uh, particularly around the ongoing political uh, persecution of uh, Australian citizen Julian Assange, a Walkley Ward award-winning journalist who is uh, being prosecuted by the US government. They're seeking his extradition for publishing uh, classified documents, uh, documents that uh, disclosed war crimes, corruption, fraud and significant bad behaviour. And um, I'd like to make a shout-out to uh, David McBride. Um, and uh, he's shown a lot of courage. Um, it wouldn't have been an easy thing to do, as I know from my personal relationship with Andrew Wilkie, the member for Clark in the other place, who blew the whistle on the BS that was used to take us into an illegal and immoral war in Iraq around weapons of mass destruction. And I remember uh, at the time uh, Andrew Wilkie was being essentially threatened with life in jail uh, for espionage or for treason, uh, for doing something that he felt was morally right. And he's actually turned out to be right. There were no weapons of mass destruction. We were taken to a war that's killed millions and caused massive disruption across the Middle East on the basis of a massive deception. Uh, and his courage should be applauded, as should David McBride. Now, I understand David McBride's trial uh, is not going to be till November this year, and even that's not necessarily set in concrete. Now, that is uh, over four years since charges were brought against David McBride. Um, the trial, when it, when it happens, if it happens, um, Will be, is expected to last up to three weeks. But this has been hanging over his head uh, since he was arrested at Sydney Airport after returning home from Spain in September 2018. Um, now he's accused of leaking classified defence information to three senior journalists at the ABC, who, by the way, had their offices raided and searched, uh, and also to Fairfax media newspapers. And the material that he leaked formed the basis of the Afghan files, uh, which led to a 2017 ABC expose revealing allegations of misconduct by Australian Special Forces in Afghanistan, including possible unlawful killings. And as I mentioned earlier, there has been now been a conviction in relation to this. Um, the disclosures also led to the much publicised, as I mentioned, Federal Police raid on the ABC's officers. Uh, in 2019. Now, David McBride has pleaded not guilty to five charges, including the unauthorised disclosure of information, theft of Commonwealth property and breaching the Defence Act. Um, and uh, it, as I mentioned earlier, it's just hypocrisy for us as members of parliament to be coming in here and passing laws talking about the need to protect whistleblowers while we are so actively persecuting a high-profile whistleblower who believed deeply he was doing the right thing. And how can it not be in the public interest to be releasing information about possible or probable war crimes by Australian defence personnel? Um, we can't point the finger at other countries when we treat whistleblowers in this country uh, like that. Um, and as uh, Kieran Pender, uh, a lawyer at the Human Rights Law Centre said, this case should never have commenced 
but it is not too late for the Attorney General Mark Dreyfus KC to end it. Rather than prosecuting whistleblowers, the Australian government should get on with fixing laws like we're doing today and ensuring accountability for Australia's wrongdoing in Afghanistan. Expired. Minister. Senator Pocock speaking. Oh, I'm sorry. I, saw it. I thought it had been crossed out. My apologies, Senator Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The other Senator Pocock has spoken on the matter, but yes, I have something <laughs> to you. add. Um, I rise to speak on the Public Interest Disclosure Amendment Review Bill. It's a really important debate that we're having here today, and this is a really important bill with more work needed. I want to thank my fellow senators, Shoebridge, Scar, David Pocock and, and uh, Senator Wish Wilson for their comments, and I associate myself with many of the points that they have made. As legislators, we have much work to do to make sure that we improve the quality of information available to us as um, decision makers. And we need and we rely on the efforts of people who bring information to us to expose corruption, to expose malpractice and to bring to the attention of us as senators things that need to change to improve governance. And whistleblowers have such an important role to play in this. And most importantly, as many of the uh, other senators have said, we must protect and applaud whistleblowers and end the prosecution of people like Bernard Collieri, who has stood up for so long, so bravely, who I've had the pri privilege of uh, meeting with and talking at events with. We must also uh, remember and applaud the behaviour of Witness K, of David McBride and of Richard Boyle, all heroes uh, to the project of transparent governance, of response to serious um, errors in, in governance and management and activity in many parts of our government. Um, activities they've brought to the attention of the international community that have really reflected on the character of Australian government and action in their attempts to improve the honesty and good practice of what we do and how we do it. So these are extraordinary people and they believed in truth and we, we need to learn from their heroism. Um, they've paid a big price. Uh, Senator Scar went through what that does, what being a whistleblower does, um, a sacrifice and a sacrifice not just personally, but often, in many cases, by their families. These experiences take lives, take um, our years out of the lives of families, um, and they're years of sacrifice um, as families support whistleblowers, because whistleblowers have to find places uh, that keep them afloat while they do very difficult uh, actions of truth-telling. Democracy relies on the disinfecting powers of whistleblowers, and they are such an important part of that disinfecting power um, uh, that we need in our government. And I know this myself personally as a current participant uh, in the uh, a committee in, of inquiry into consulting practices in our country, a, a set of practices that are now drawing on billions of dollars of public money, where we are very dependent as a Senate and as a committee on the bravery of people, whistleblowers, coming forward into public uh, d discussion and bringing forward evidence and examples where practice within these very large uh, uh, public bodies and private organisations is very far from perfect, indeed ranges into corruption. So this bill is a very positive step uh, and, and we welcome it and there's more to do. It's a positive thing to see a government taking action on updating these laws. They are well overdue for it, and as we see, there is a broad consensus for reforms that are really quite significant um, uh, and which this bill makes a really important start on. We've heard how the Moss Review from 2016 is really already well out of date. Um, so, you know, it, turning to its recommendations, taking them seriously, turning them to legislation is very important but it's not enough. We need to do more, and we, uh, while we commend the government for bringing this forward, we really want to see action uh, much more significantly and in a further range of, of, of overdue recommendations. So these changes, um, even these changes, um, will leave whistleblowers, those brave heroes, um, unprotected, woefully unprotected, and it risks 
um, uh, exposing them, as we've heard, to very significant financial cost, as well as the personal and fam fam family costs. As anyone knows who's supported a whistleblower, um, it's a really significant personal project that you give uh, many years of your life to in, in too many cases. So a, a comprehensive review of the Public Interest Disclosure Act is, Act is, is promised. This is, is what we've been given. It's not comprehensive enough. Um, and what will be applicable, this Act will be applicable for the NAC's first complaints. And that's really concerning because we need much stronger machinery that can really um, underpin and support the work of that activity and give that new integrity body the teeth and the processes that it needs. Uh, we need a strong uh, national anti-corruption -corrup body that can act properly and with uh, fulsome force uh, on the matters that come before it. And we've heard about the experience of whistleblowers and how important it is that we put someone in their corner, not just their families, not just their partners and kids and community, but a, a whistleblower commissioner and a commission that will ensure that people who bring forward issues that are of very significant public importance so important to this parliament, someone is standing with them uh, as they uh, commit their brave acts. So we need, we need whistleblowers, we rely on them, um, and we need to uh, make sure that we give them the support they need. So the Greens referred this bill off to inquiry because of concerns we had and concerns that are very widely shared across the community by uh, organisations that know this experience and what we need, how we need to change it. Um, we know those concerns go to the question of how this current bill, as it's currently drafted, will have consequences that are unintended because of drafting that um, excludes, for example, many issues that should be covered uh, within the bill. And we also need that the, want to recognise that the bill, as it, as it is before us, does not deliver the protection that whistleblowers really need. Uh, as Senator Shoebridge has outlined, we've got very real concerns, and as Senator Wish Wilson also pointed out, the question of um, the extent of the personal work-related conduct carve-out is a real issue for us. There um, are a lot of lo uh, stakeholders who have drawn attention to the fact that this is supposed to limit matters that are about bullying or workplace issues being taken to the NAC, but it fails to recognise the very real experience for so many whistleblowers um, that they do suffer personal consequences uh, within their workplace. They're treated differently. Um, as Senator Scar said, they can be made redundant. They miss out on promotion. They're excluded from all kind of decision-making. As someone who's lived in and worked in for many years in very large organisations, many subtle practices can isolate and pressure a whistleblower. And that is often a, um, a set of behaviours and experiences that are intermingled with the activities of being a whistleblower. So we think the carve-out should be can apply solely to, to matters that are solely personal issues, um, and we need much more clarity around that question. Um, we recognise that the government's own amendments to this bill uh, that passed in the other place go some way towards recognising those concerns. That's a good thing, but we need to go further. Uh, the developments um, uh, in recent years tell us, and, and a lot of experiences tell us, that we need to protect whistleblowers better and we need to do better around defining uh, personal workplace issues. There's a lot more that's needed. There are significant um, uh, underlying, there is a significant additional underlying issue, and that's the impact of the very, very uh, overzealous use of secrecy provisions in laws that impact on whistleblowers, something that really needs to be addressed in the future. And we've heard about the ongoing prosecutions of Richard Doyle and David McBride, McBride that Senator Shoebridge went into. Um, they're a real dampener on people coming forward on public sector whistleblowing uh, projects, and, they, and serious reform in this issue is really pressing. Um, these truth-tellers are being prosecuted. And more than any law that we pass in this place or anything words that we say, it is our actions 
that will speak to prospective whistleblowers. They look at the fact the great penalties that have been imposed, for example, on Richard Boyle and David McBride in practice, and they hesitate. It has a chilling effect on the behaviour of whistleblowers, and we need to do much better at protecting and ending those prosecutions, which are absolutely inappropriate. Everything those people have been, those brave men have, have uh, said, has been shown to be right, and their prosecutions are continuing under Labor, and it is a travesty, and it needs to end. Um, the big spends, we know, as, as senators and as people who have just passed a very large budget, we know there are some very big spends in new areas coming down the pipe uh, in, in our country. For example, $368 billion on submarines. We have got a really big challenge in tax collection and keeping that honest and scrupulous and collecting the tax that we know taxpayers want us to manage and collect and treat in a principled and clear way, pursuing those who are avoiding tax or acting unscrupulously or unethically. We know that that kind of big spend has to be made um, in a way that pulls out and, and pursues and avoids the perception or actuality of conflicts of interest. We need strong legislation that protects those big spends of billions of dollars so they actually go to where they need to go, they get us value for money and they aren't associated with conflicts of interest or unethical practice. This is a really important place where whistleblowers can blow the whistle and make a difference. So whistleblowers have an important impact on the way we govern. They can call out corruption, they can call out conflicts of interest, and honest government relies on them. It relies on their heroism and it relies on the sacrifices they make personally. And we need to protect them. We need to protect them from bullying and ill treatment, um, and we need to protect them from all kinds of subtle practices in their workplaces which can make their lives and the costs they personally face very large uh, and, and deeply affected. So we all agree here that whistleblowers are often heroic, uh, and I thank Senator Scar for bringing to our attention the sacrifices and the role that James Shelton and Brian Hood have played in calling out um, a, another example, an important example of corrupt practice in our governance. Um, and he quoted the words of the judge reflecting on the adverse effects on the families of those men uh, and the tremendous courage that they showed. And that all t shows to all of us the importance of having strong protections in our whistleblower legislation and to ending the inappropriate, the punitive prosecution of people like Richard Boyle and David McBride. We need to support and honour their efforts, and we need to pass legislation that does the right thing by whistleblowers and enables future whistleblowers to come forward and make the difference that they do, the positive difference they make to the quality of the decisions that we make as a parliament and the quality of governance in our country. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I thank all senators for their contribution to the debate on this bill. This bill amends the PIT Act to implement recommendations from the 2016 Review of the Public Interest Disclosure Act 2013 and other parliamentary inquiries. These amendments will improve protections for disclosers and, and witnesses, focus the Act on integrity wrongdoing and make the Act easier to administer. The government has addressed recommendations one and two of the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee's report in the explanatory memorandum and welcomes its third recommendation that the bill be passed. The government has also moved amendments to make clear that the exclusion of personal work-related conduct would not prevent the allocation or investigation of a disclosure, which contains both disclosable conduct and personal work-related conduct, and also moved amendments to require an authorised officer to inform a discloser about other avenues to progress their disclosure where there is no reasonable basis on which it could be considered an internal disclosure. The government is aware of calls for a whistleblower protection authority or commission, and I know those calls have been repeated in the second reading debate, and also for ex external disclosure processes to be examined. The government has already publicly committed to examining these issues as part of a public consultation process on broader reforms to the Public Interest Disclosure Act following passage of this bill. The Albanese government is committed to restoring trust and integrity to government, and an effective public sector whistleblowing framework is essential to achieving this. 
The bill is an important first stage of a process to comprehensively reform the Public Interest Disclosure Act to restore it to a best practice whistleblowing framework. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Watt. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Shrewbridge on sheet 1867 be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. Is that two, Senator, two voices, Senator Shoebridge and Senator Pocock? Thank you. Yep. No? The motion is. I'll put the question. I'll put the question again. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Shoebridge on sheet 1867 be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against. Ag those against? Aye. No. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Yep.
lock the doors. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Shoebridge at sheet 1867 be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McKim, teller for the ayes, and Senator Cardell, teller for the noes. The result of the division is 12 ayes and 27 noes. The question is resolved in the negative. The question now is that the bill be read a second time. All those in favour say aye. All those against no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Public Interest Disclosure Act 2013 and for related purposes. Matt, could you? <laughs> Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it's so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Minister. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to move amendments one to three on sheet ZB203. Um, in doing so, I also table a replacement explanatory memorandum relating to this bill, and I table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill. Thank you. Um, just briefly, um, Mr Acting Deputy President, um, the amendments on sheet ZB203 would clarify the operation of the personal work-related conduct provisions and insert a notification obligation on authorised officers where they decide not to allocate a disclosure because there is no reasonable basis on which it could be considered an internal disclosure. Uh, I'll now briefly outline amendments on sheet ZB203. Uh, amendments 1 and 2, which relate to personal work-related conduct. The government is proposing two amendments to the uh, Public Interest Disclosure Amendment Review Bill 2022 to clarify the operation of the personal work-related conduct provisions. Disclosures of integrity-related wrongdoing are often accompanied by allegations of other personal work-related conduct. 
The first two amendments would insert avoidance of doubt provisions to clarify how the framework will operate where a person makes a mixed disclosure that contains elements of both personal work-related conduct, such as an allegation of bullying, harassment or undue performance management, and integrity-related wrongdoing, such as fraud, corruption or maladministration. The First Amendment will make clear for whistleblowers and agencies that mixed disclosures are not prevented from being a public interest disclosure, only because the disclosure includes some information that tends to show personal work-related conduct. The Second Amendment will provide greater clarity for authorised officers in agencies about how to handle mixed disclosures. The amendments will make clear for both whistleblowers and agencies that disclosures of integrity-related wrongdoing will not be excluded from the Public Interest Disclosure Act framework only because they also contain a disclosure about personal work-related conduct. The existing measures in the bill already have this effect. However, these amendments will put beyond doubt that the personal work-related conduct provisions contained in the bill would operate to exclude only personal work-related conduct from the PID Act. Importantly, the protections under the PID Act would continue to apply to public interest disclosures, uh, which include one or more instances of disclosable conduct, even if the disclosure also includes personal work-related conduct. Amendment 3 concerns notification obligations where an authorised officer decides not to allocate a disclosure because there is no reasonable basis on which it could be considered in an internal disclosure. The government is proposing an amendment that would apply in circumstances where an authorised officer decides not to allocate the disclosure for investigation under the PID Act because the authorised officer is satisfied on reasonable grounds that there is no reasonable basis on which the disclosure could be considered an internal disclosure within the meaning of the Act. The amendment would require the authorised officer to, to notify a discloser of any other course of action that might be available to them under another law or power, such as under the Public Service Act 1999. The amendment would ensure that the authorised officer is required to provide information to a discloser about how else they may take forward their disclosure of wrongdoing where the authorised officer has decided that there is no reasonable basis on which it could be considered an internal disclosure and so cannot be dealt with under the PID Act. Thank you, Senator. What? Senator Cash. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the Coalition will be supporting these amendments. Items 1 and 2 are avoidance of doubt provisions. Uh, these provisions will make clear that disclosable conduct is not excluded from the PID scheme if a complaint also includes information that is personal work-related conduct. The legislative note to item 2 helpfully confirms that a single disclosure which relates to multiple instances of conduct is not excluded if one or more of the instances is disclosable conduct. This is consistent with the Coalition Government's response to Recommendation 5 of the Moss Review. Similarly, Item 3 would require the decision maker to tell the discloser uh, what options they may have outside the PID Act, uh, even if it is not immediately clear the matter should be dealt with under another law or power. Uh, and we believe that these are sensible amendments and the Coalition, as I said, will be supporting them. Thank you, Senator Cash. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President. Uh, the Greens, too, will support these amendments, um, but we have some questions we'll be asking of the minister about the intent behind the amendments and how they'll actually operate in practice. Um, and I acknowledge that the Attorney, the Attorney General and his department um, have engaged with the issue and have engaged with the submissions that came in the inquiry that made it very clear that pretty much no key stakeholder was satisfied that the bill as initially drafted actually implemented recommendation five of the Moss Review and the carve out was likely to create significant concerns. One of the concerns that was raised in the committee that hasn't been addressed by the government, and I might put my first question to the minister in this regard, is that the Ombudsman's Office made it very clear that having these multiple tests in 29, now 29.2a, and 43.4, where disclosure tends to show or may tend to show disclosable conduct, um, was likely to be contested by whistleblowers, um, particularly if there was an adverse conclusion from the decision maker. It was likely to be tested by whistleblowers and then referred to the Ombudsman um, um, at seeking the Ombudsman's review of those decisions. Both, and now, now we have two separate points where that decision could be made. Um, so my first question to the Minister is, um, has the attorney, has the department engaged with the Ombudsman's office to start, try and address the concerns that the Ombudsman's office raised in the inquiry on these points? 
Um, thank Thanks, Senator, Sh Senator Shoebridge. I understand that we have the government has engaged uh, with the ombudsman uh, and the ombudsman's office about this matter, and that guidance will be provided to whistleblowers to address those issues. Senator Shoebridge. Um, thanks, Minister. And, I, and it was my understanding of my memory of the evidence of the ombudsman was that they expected something like that to occur in relation to the. I mean, the bill as originally drafted, and their concern was that even with the guidance, that there is likely to be a substantial uplift in the work that the ombudsman is required to do. Now, I note that the current budget provides no additional funding for the ombudsman to do this work. Um, um, did the did the government consider, and did the government? get a resource request from the ombudsman, because that's what they said to the committee. They said very clearly to the committee, this is, we're already strapped. We don't have enough resources to do our existing work. This is going to put a whole lot of additional burden on us with some highly agitated individuals who tend to be quite resource um, needy because they've got concerns about whistleblowing, can be complex. Did the, so, so it's two parts, my question. Did the ombudsman make a resource request? And secondly, did the government has the government addressed it? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Shoebridge. Certainly the resourcing issues uh, for the Ombudsman are something that the government is considering, and we will continue to engage with the Ombudsman about the, any resourcing needs that they have in relation to this piece of work. Senator Shoebridge. Um, yes, well I have to say that those answers don't address the concerns that were raised by the Ombudsman's office. And, um, and, and so it, it, it highlights the concerns the Greens have with the form of this amendment, because um, the, the proposal that was being put forward by a number of stakeholders was that we adopt the wording in the Moss Review, which is, you say, that matters that are solely personal work-related matters are excluded from the PIT Act, but you limit the carve-out to just that. It's an easy test. You can see the test readily applied. But instead, the government now has effectively a two-stage test, both under section 29.2a and then under 43.4, where it says, to avoid doubt, if a disclosure includes information that tends to show or may tend to show disclosable conduct, the disclosure is not prevented from being a public interest disclosure. Now, that's likely to be a highly contested definition in circumstances. Um, and then, if it, if it gets through that gateway, there's a separate test that may apply to the same complaint under section 43.4 that, again, to avoid doubt, if a disclosure includes information that tends to show or may tend to show disclosable conduct, there might be a reasonable basis on which the disclosure could be considered an internal disclosure, even if it includes other information and the other information tends to show or may tend to show personal work-related conduct. Each of those steps, the Ombudsman told us, is likely to be contested by a whistleblower who, or someone who purports to be a whistleblower and has an adverse conclusion against them by the decision maker. Um, Minister, who is going to be making the decision under 29.2a? And then the second part of my question probably flows from that. Who will be making the decision under 43.4? Minister. Um, I'm advised that it will be the authorised officer uh, under the PID scheme for both uh, matters that you are referring to. Senator Shrewbridge. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy. The, um, the, I understood from your earlier answer, Minister, that there will be some guidance given. Is it intended that the Ombudsman's Office will draft that guidance for the authorised officers? Or is it intended that that will come from the Attorney General's department? And, and again, I come back to the point that all of the concerns raised by the Ombudsman's Office now seem to be highlighted by these amendments. And I'm not, I'm not speaking ag against adopting the amendments. The amendments make it better. They, they actually they, they, they narrow the carve out and allow for mixed matters to still be considered as a, as a PID complaint. And that's a step forward. Um, but the way in which this is drafted just highlights the resource concerns with inside the department from the authorised officer 
and the process the authorised officer have to go to, and then the resource concerns that will almost inevitably flow to the ombudsman in seeking a review of those decisions. Um, because obviously whether a matter is accepted as a PID or not accepted as a PID fundamentally changes the protections that are offered to a public servant or somebody working in an agency. If their complaint is accepted as a PID, they've got a whole lot of protections. If it's not accepted as a PID, um, then it's pretty much at large the response that can be taken against them. Um, so who is going to be drafting the guidelines and, and what, if any, assurances can you give that the Ombudsman's evidence won't come true? Minister. Um, thanks, Senator Shoebridge. The, ombuds the Ombudsman and the Ombudsman's Office will be drafting the guidelines and that will be undertaken in consultation with the Attorney-General's Department. Senator Shoebridge. Look, I thank the Minister for that clarification. Um, I said in the second reading contribution that when this matter was presented many months ago, the bill was first presented many months ago, there was real agitation that came from the Attorney-General's Office about any suggestion that we have an inquiry. And there was this, there was this you know, how, how dare we have an inquiry kind of um, response that came back from the AG's office. Um, of course, the inquiry has been essential because it's highlighted the concerns and has led to these amendments, which I think will go a significant way to improving an identified problem in the bill. But in the course of that communication with the Attorney General's office, there was the suggestion made that if we hadn't passed this in March, that the public service and the public sector wouldn't be ready to implement it by the time the NAC um, opened its doors. Um, well, of course, for some reason that's inexplicable to us in the Greens, the attorney failed to bring this on in the last session. It was ready to go. The amendments were all drafted. The committee report had been provided. It was all ready to go last month, but for reasons that have never been publicly explained, the government chose not to bring it on. So my question, I suppose, is in two parts. The first part of my question is, why was it not brought on, given the purported urgency that had come out of the attorney's office? And secondly, what preparatory steps have been done to ensure it's going to be able to be operationalised by 1 July when the NAC opens its doors. Minister. Well, Senator Shibish, there's obviously a number of uh, different items that have been big priorities for this government. This has certainly been a priority, but there's been an awful lot to do across a whole range of portfolios, but we have brought this on as early as we possibly can while making sure that it's done thoroughly. Uh, and I encourage you, if you believe that this is something that we should deal with urgently, then how about we try and get it passed uh, before we reach that marker at 12.15? Sen Senator Shoebridge. So uh, it's not clear for me, to me from that answer if the attorney is satisfied that the preparatory steps have been put in place for this to um, commence operating from 1 July. Um, and I think that's a concern because we were told this was essential for the NAC to be in place and for whistleblowers to have that protection. And it's unfortunate that it, the direct question has been asked of the minister, is this actually going to be ready? What satisfaction can you give us that this is going to be up and running in the public sector by 1 July? It's an important matter and I agree with the attorney, it is important to be in place. And, and I agree that whistleblowers need protection from 1 July. But, any whist but my concern is from that answer from the minister is there's no commitment to actually have the public sector ready to go on and from 1 July when the NAC opens its doors. And anyone from the public sector hearing that answer from the minister would be troubled that this core issue of preparation hasn't been addressed. And I'm and I particularly note that the AG was hot under the collar and the office was hot under the collar months ago that you wouldn't have time to get this ready. Is that really the best response you can give about putting this in place, Minister? Minister. 
Um, well, Senator Shoebridge, I can give you an assurance that if we can get this legislation passed, the government will have this system up and running before the commencement of the NAC on the 1st of July. And uh, the only thing that's actually holding us up from getting this underway is passing this legislation. And now I know there are some people in this chamber who want to do everything possible to prevent this chamber from getting to a vote on uh, setting up a fund that will build 30,000 social and affordable homes. Um, but I would encourage you to get this legislation passed because it would seem that you think it's quite urgent. So how about we get that done? Senator Shoebridge. The, um, the, the, the utter effrontery of the minister making that contribution, having sat and warmed this bill under the backside of the government for a month or more, to make that contribution today, it's a wonder a bolt of lightning didn't come through the skylight and, um, and, uh, and, and provide some um, uh, some, the deity's response to that extraordinary proposition from the minister. Literally sat, cooling, doing nothing. We moved heaven and earth to get the inquiry done. We delivered the inquiry in record time. We limited the hearings in the inquiry. We cooperated to get the report done. We delivered it all in March. We got our amendments in in March. We were ready to go in March. And here we are in mid-May. And the, and the government is saying, how dare you ask questions about it? And, and, and the, the, what, the 25 minutes of delay we're going to have, or the half hour of, of delay we're going to have in asking questions about the bill, is the reason for the delay in getting this forward. The, the effrontery of that. And it, maybe it was under instructions. Uh, maybe it was a, a, some speaking notes the minister was given. But you shouldn't have done it, because it was unworthy. It was deeply unworthy of the minister to make that contribution. Deeply. Um, one of the other great concerns that this bill had, that, that the stakeholders have had with this bill, Minister, is, is the fact that under the protections that have been put with the NAC bill and the NAC, the NAC Act, the National Anti Corruption Commission Act that's now in place, unlike the Public Interest Disclosure Act amendments that are in place, there are no remedies for whistleblowers if the protections in the NAC, which mirror the PID Act, are breached. So if there's adverse action taken against a whistleblower and the whistleblower's only statutory protection are found in the provisions under the NAC Act, well, there might be a criminal prosecution taken for the adverse action. That might be um, that they may have been terminated, they may have been demoted. Um, there might be a criminal prosecution able to be taken under the, NAC, under the NAC provisions, but there's nothing that the whistleblower can rely upon to get redress. They can't get compensation and they can't get reinstatement. Um, is that an accurate reading of this bill, that it doesn't put in place those remedies? And if that is the case, is the government committed to providing those remedies for, for whistleblowers? Um, who, who have the purported protection under the under the, the protections in, under the NAC Act, but actually nothing to help them, nothing to get them their job back, nothing to get them the compensation or any kind of redress um, if if adverse action has been taken against them. And 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 when addressing that, Minister, if you could address the other core problem with those protections under the NAC Bill, which is, as 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 the Greens understand them only provide the capacity for criminal prosecutions for adverse action. And we know from the evidence before the committee and from our understanding of practice in the public sector that despite the PID Act having been in place with very similar provisions for a decade, there has not been a single successful criminal prosecution. So, Minister, given how ineffectual the provisions in the PID Act have proven over the last 10 years when it comes to adverse conduct without a successful prosecution, given that a criminal prosecution is basically the only kind of remedy that's been proposed under the NAC, under the NAC Act, is it true that this bill doesn't fix that and what's the government's intent to fix it? Minister. Uh, the issue of the remedy will be the subject of the consultation process that is going to happen after we hopefully pass this bill and get things started. 
Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Minister. Just on the consultation uh, process before the second tranche of changes, um, are you able to provide an outline of, of how that will be staged, what the timeline um, will be, um, particularly the consultation over a proposed whistleblower commissioner? Minister. Um, the government's intention is to uh, have a discussion paper released for consultation on those and other matters over the next 12 months, obviously moving as quickly as possible, um, but that consultation process is expected to get underway in the next 12 months. Senator, Senator Shoebridge. Um, Minister, you I think consultation is important, but obviously, of course, landing this and getting the protections in place um, are of equal, in fact, greater importance. If the consultation starts in 12 months, can, and, and given there are so many gaps in whistleblower protection, and I, I reference in particular the contribution that Senator Scar made in terms of the absence of whistleblower commission and the absence of any kind of substantive agency that's with the resources and the capacity to help whistleblowers in what are otherwise these David and Goliath battles. Um, if the consultation starts within 12 months, is there a commitment from the government to land the consultation within 12 months and to bring those statutory reforms before the, before the parliament within 12 months so that this time next year whistleblowers will actually have world-class protection? Um, or is it just a commitment to start the consultation sometime within the next 12 months with an indefinite conclusion? Because I, I think Senator Cash's point about trying to rush through legislation, complex legislation like this that has important public sector outcomes, public interest outcomes, trying to ram through that kind of legislation in the dying days of a parliament, in the last few you know, weeks or, or months of a parliament, well, has proven in the case of the Pitt Act to produce legislation that has problems and doesn't have the kind of thoroughness that's needed. Uh, so is the commitment to land the consultation and bring the amendments within 12 months, or are we going to be doing the same as repeating history and rushing to try and strap stuff up as this parliament comes to a conclusion? What's the commitment, Minister? Minister. I'm, I'm not going to be uh, preempting the consultation process by going into any of that. Senator Shoebridge. Um, the, um, I don't think telling us when the consultation will conclude is preempting the consultation process. And to suggest so is kind of either a misunderstanding of consultation, either you already have a predetermined outcome and the consultation is a farce, and therefore telling us when it's going to end will also determine the outcome, which would be unfortunate in a relatively new government or it just misunderstands the question I was asking, which is when will the process come to an end and when will you be bringing substantive amendments to the House? Telling us when it ends doesn't preempt the outcome. Giving us the time frame within which the consultation is intended to operate doesn't predetermine the outcome. And again, Minister, I'd ask for a good faith engagement with this because it's important to many people in the public sector. It's important to many key stakeholders. They would like to know what the commitment is to the government to actually fix this and when it's going to happen. Um, sorry, Minister. Uh, that, that decision hasn't been made at this point, Senator Shoebridge. What has been made is the decision to get this legislation passed to begin this process. Uh, and I am surprised that um, you wish to extend the debate on this to the degree that you are which is clearly all about filibustering. I, mean, I think we all know what's going on here, um, and that neither the Greens nor the Coalition want to have a debate or a vote on legislation to build 30,000 social and affordable homes. And so I think what we're going to see, whether it be this bill, any other bill, any other debate, it's going to be dragged out as long as possible. I don't know how many questions you've got on your list there, um, but I know that you'll keep adding more. So let's just keep going. And I know we're not going to get this done by 12.15 because you don't want to have a debate on housing. It's a shame because this is an important matter. You say that you care about this, um, but 
we, we actually could have had this passed by 12.15, um, but that's of course not your writing instructions from Mr Chandler Mather or whoever else is dictating your, your strategy. Um, it's disappointing that you don't want to have legislation passed for whistleblowers, and it's disappointing that you don't want to have legislation passed for housing. Senator Shoebridge. Well, I, I, to, to give some guidance to the minister, could I suggest the best way of bringing this to a prompt conclusion is to answer the questions and to provide some actual information in response to the questions? Because that would give us the opportunity to say, thank you, minister. That was very helpful. That answered the question. Unfortunately, in the exchanges we've had to date, I haven't been able to say that because you've made a series of uh, febrile political points rather than actually address the questions that have been asked of you. Now, that might be your right in instructions, but it's unfortunate because there are stakeholders watching this deeply concerned about whistleblower protections. And these are quite legitimate questions that you could provide if you were adequately briefed or had the interest adequate responses to. But instead, we're getting those febrile political points, highly agitated, not directed to the questions that have been asked. And it's an unfortunate, it's an unfortunate exercise an unfortunate breach of faith with the many stakeholders who are watching this concerned about these amendments. Um, could I indicate in relation to a number of the Greens amendments that the, um, the intent of these Greens amendments was actually to implement the Moss report in its, in its, as best as we could, but to also address the concerns that were raised with us in the course of the inquiry. One of the concerns that was raised by the CPSU, um, um, which, is, which is normally an organisation that the, that, that the Labor Party listens to and takes, a, takes, takes, concern, takes the concerns on board genuinely, and we do, we listen and we take on their concerns, but amongst other um, organisations that, that made submissions was that the amendment seek to rem that the, the, the bill as presented exempts MOP staff, members of parliament staff, from having access to the PID Act. We've seen how members of parliament staff need more protections, not less. That's been apparent from case after case after case. And this workplace can be very tough, particularly for members of parliament, for the staff of, of members of parliament. And there seems to me to be a pretty powerful reason to implement the recommendation that actually first came from the House of Representatives Committee in 2009, that mob staff should have the same kind of protections and be able to raise a PID, um, a disclosure under the Public Interest Disclosure Act. And it was also a key recommendation of the Set the Standard report that also said that parliamentary staff employed under the MOPS Act should be included as public officials in Section 69 of the PID Act and be permitted to make public interest disclosures. And likewise, it was a recommendation made in the Moss Review. So we have the House of Representatives Committee in 2009 saying it should happen. We have the Set the Standard Report saying it should happen. Um, and we have the, the Moss Review saying it should happen and that mob staff should have these protections. Well, I'm, I'm grateful that my party, the Greens, has looked at that material and thinks it's important that we put those protections in place. And so we will be moving that amendment in committee to try and put those protections in place because we've read that 2009 report from the House of, committee, House of Reps Committee. We've read the Set the Standard report and we've read the Moss report, and they all say, do this. So, Minister, my question is, given that, will you support the Greens amendment? And if not, why not? Minister. Well, Senator Shoebridge, I think the fact that you are simply filibustering debate in order to stop a vote on this bill, in order to stop the commencement of debate on the housing bill, can be made no more plain than the fact that you're not actually talking about the amendments that are currently before the chamber. Um, you've obviously run out of questions to ask about our amendments and you're moving on to amendments that haven't even been put yet being yours. We would of course have the debate about your amendments when we get to them, um, but clearly you don't want to talk about our amendments because you don't want to have a vote on anything. 
Uh, and it's a shame because I, I agree that there are a lot of people out there who are very concerned about having better whistleblower protections, and that's exactly what this bill is designed to do. And we could have had that legislation passed this morning um, if you chose to. Uh, you made a reference to some of my comments being agitated. Well, I am agitated about getting whistleblower protections in place, and I am agitated about building more social and affordable homes, and I'm agitated about the fact that the Greens are in league with the coalition to prevent a debate on housing being built in this country. So, yeah, I am pretty agitated about that, because there are a lot of people out there who need homes, and there are two parties in this chamber who are, starting, who are stopping us even having a debate about that because they're dragging out the debate on this bill, which is also important. Um, so I'm more than happy to address the Greens amendments when we get to them, but how about we pass these amendments that the government has moved now, rather than just continue filibustering until we reach the clock at 12.15? Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Minister, the spending like an hour, a minute and a half uh, only complaining and not addressing the things doesn't get us closer to bringing it to a vote. Answering the question gets us closer to bringing it to a vote. No, you, you get your chance, Minister. You get your chance. Um, I know you don't like questions, and I know I know you don't like. I can see you don't like the questions. That's very apparent. You don't you don't like the questions. You don't like giving the answers, and I can see you're agitated, and it's unfortunate. But it would, if you're less agitated and you're more directed to answering the questions, this will go quicker. Um, so I would invite the House to consider the government's amendments one to three. I've said before we don't oppose those amendments and we think they go some way to addressing the Moss review. Um, but the, the, um, I seek to move Greens amendments number one on sheet 1889, which is an amendment to the, Greens, to the, to the government's amendment number two. Um, This amendment seeks to implement Recommendation 5 from the Moss Review, and it does a pretty simple thing. It inserts the word solely into the government amendments to reflect the submissions we received in the inquiry that clarify the language to ensure that only matters that were solely in relation to personal work-related conduct should be excluded from the operation of the PITS game. It will also make... So it, 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 will, it will, in fact, make the amended explanatory memorandum, which references the word solely in the, in the, in the Moss Review, it will make it actually apply to the bill, which would be nice, wouldn't it? The, 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 the amended explanatory memorandum can actually relate to the bill. Um, and, of course, it's worth, it's worth confirming, it actually implements Recommendation 5 from the Moss Review. Um, uh, which expressly recommended that any personal work-related conduct carve-out be limited in this way. So I moved that amendment and I commend it to the House, and I'm, I'm curious on what basis the government says that they would oppose it. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well done, Senator Shoebridge. You've nearly run down the clock. Um, the government does not support this amendment. The addition of solely as proposed would not change the operation of this provision. The proposed amendment is therefore unnecessary as the current drafting of the government amendments achieves the same outcome in a more appropriate and effective manner. Senator Shoebridge. Chair, I, I have um, amendments 1 to 14 on sheet 1870 that I, mm -hmm. that I wish to have addressed, mm -hmm. but I'm more than comfortable if the House wants to make a um, um, consider separately now, the government's amendments one to three and my amendment on sheet 1889, if that, if that suits. Thank you very much, Senator Shubich. And there being no other contributions, the question before us is that the amendment to government amendment number two, moved by Senator Shubridge and listed at sheet 1889, be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those against, no. No. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
first of the Lock the doors. The question is that the amendment to government amendment number two, moved by Senator Shoebridge and listed at sheet 81889, be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair and those to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator McKim Teller for the ayes and Senator O'Sullivan Teller for the noes. Yes. The result of the division is eyes 13, nose 25, 
the question is resolved in the negative. As it is after 12.15, the committee will report to the Senate. The committee reports progress. The Senate will now move to Senator's statements, and I call on Senator Wong. Thank you, uh, Acting Pres Deputy President. I rise today to pay tribute to Alan Gingell, AO, a friend, colleague and trusted adviser. Alan passed away on 3 May 2023 at the age of 75, and he is missed by many Australians, particularly in the foreign policy community. I want to personally convey my condolences to his family and friends, to his wife Catherine, and to those in the chamber today, his sons Joe and Christopher, daughters-in-law Shell and Catherine, grandchildren Annie, Maxwell, Heidi and Pippin, and friends Dennis Richardson, Rick Smith and Darren Lim. So many people in this building, in this city and across the country are mourning Alan's loss. So many in this building, in this city and across the country are mourning the loss of Alan Gingell. He spent his life dedicated to public service. He made enduring contributions to the public and government debate on foreign and security policy for more than half a century. He was an official and unofficial advisor to governments and oppositions for decades, always in the singular service of Australia's national interest. In every venture, as a diplomat, advisor, intelligence analyst, think tank director, historian, professor and podcaster, he left a lasting impact on our country and on all who had the privilege of knowing him. Alan had a long and distinguished career in, in Australian international affairs, beginning in what was then called the Department of External Affairs in 1969 and went on to serve as a diplomat in Rangoon, Singapore and Washington. He led the International Division at the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and was the Senior International Advisor to Prime Minister Paul Keating. He was the Founding Executive Director of the Lowy Institute and from 2009 until 2013 was Head of the Office of National Assessments. In 2017, he became the National President of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, a role he performed until March of this year, and he was also an Honorary Professor at the Australian National University. He was awarded an Officer of the Order of Australia in 2009 for his services to international relations. Alan Gingell's contributions to the foreign policy of this nation span decades and many achievements. I want to pause, however, to talk about his earliest years. He joined the Foreign Service at a time when our country was beginning its long geopolitical realignment towards Asia, and he was motivated to centre Australia's outlook firmly in our region. The way he put it himself was to say, we were the generation who went to university with the Vietnam War hanging over us, and it caused you to pay close attention to the region. It never occurred to me that I wanted to go anywhere other than Asia. If you want to shape the country's future, Asia was where it was going to matter most. This conviction continued over the years and with his postings in the region, and some of his achievements, such as negotiating the 1995 security agreement with Indonesia, and advocating for the elevation of APEC to a leaders' level meeting spoke to this firm belief. More recently, Alan became the definitive historian of Australian foreign policy through his 2017 book, Fear of Abandonment, updated and reissued in 2021. He understood the importance of chronicling Australia's history as a foreign policy actor, to witness the past choices we have faced as a nation and to understand the context for decisions that were and those that were not taken. He relied on history as a guide for our future, not as a guide for our future, but as a tool to understand how we got here. He described the book as prologue, not prediction. To some, fear of abandonment as a title might have suggested a gloomy outlook for the country. But on the contrary, Alan Gingell viewed this national anxiety as the driver of one of the most consistent and commendable aspects of Australia's world view, its rejection of isolationism, its conviction that Australia needs to be active in the world in order to shape it, and that gathering combinations and friends and ad hoc partners is the best way of doing this. Alan Gingell was always optimistic. 
for Australia and ambitious for Australia. He always believed in what our statecraft could achieve, but he was never naive. He was also unfailingly humble, clear in his values and beliefs. He listened carefully and was open to a persuasive argument and to evidence. He didn't believe that foreign policy thinking was limited to the remit of Canberra or politicians around a cabinet table. He cared deeply about engaging the Australian public on foreign policy issues. He started the Lowy Institute poll during his years leading that institution with the belief that understanding public attitudes over time was essential to crafting foreign policy for the nation. And he understood that for foreign policy to maintain the consent of the Australian people, it must be an accurate reflection of our interests and values of who we are and of what we want. His last project, Australia in the World podcast, co-hosted with our new academic Darren Lim, sought to grapple honestly with the growing complexity of the world Australia faces. His focus was dialogue centred around ideas and inquiry rather than pushing an agenda. He knew that responding to our changing circumstances required all of us, the public and policy makers alike, to understand the world around them. When I spoke at the National Police Club last month, I invited Alan as my guest. I wanted to put on record in his presence my deep appreciation, not just for the substance of his contribution, but for the manner in which it was made. That day I said he was the finest mind in Australian foreign policy. I also said he had the smallest ego in Australian foreign policy. People laughed, but it was true. I didn't know it would be the last time I saw him. As Foreign Minister and when in opposition, you take forward your big ideas through speeches. And as I think back on the past six years, I have sought his counsel on so many of my speeches. Alan Gingell wrote as, as I wished I could. He had the ability to take abstract and dense concepts and explain them with a clarity that was compelling and essential to foreign policy analysis. He truly understood the meaning of speaking truth to power. He had the intellectual and personal courage to call things as he saw them, and I always listened to him, even when we didn't agree. What I particularly valued about Alan was his ability to question, debate, agree and disagree with such respect for opposing views and for the enormity of Australia's challenges. So as we confront these challenges, we will miss him. We will miss his commitment to both contestability and re respect. And his passing should remind us of how much better we are and better off we are if we take his approach. It has been so moving to see the outpouring of tributes in the days since he passed. Tributes that all speak to his wisdom, to his intellect, to his thoughtfulness. But one characteristic really does stand out. Each and every recollection remembers his generosity with his time. And this is also my experience. Alan Gingell always made time. To hear an idea, to review a draft speech, even when it was sent to him late at night with short time frames, to chair a committee and to have a cup of tea. He made time for everyone, whether you were an intern or a foreign minister. We only wish we had had more time. Alan Gingell often spoke about a high school teacher fostering his curiosity, sending him off as a teenager to the Australian Institute for International Affairs to listen and to learn. 60 years before he would become the AIIA's national president. And he in turn encouraged generations of Australians to be curious about our place in the world. And he mentored so many of our diplomats, intelligence analysts, academics and writers. Alan Gingell's legacy lives on in all those whose lives and careers were touched by his leadership and quiet wisdom. I will remember him for his intelligence his kindness, his wit and his warmth, and also for always finding the time. So I close again by offering my deepest condolences to his family and friends, and particularly to his wife, Catherine, who cannot join us today. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Rustin. 
Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Well, today I'd like to stand to join the nation, my state of South Australia, and the Commonwealth in congratulating His Majesty King Charles III on his coronation, which took place over the weekend. Like so many Australians, I was glued to the TV on Saturday night. Uh, and it was a momentous and historic occasion, particularly for the majority of us Australians um, who have only ever lived under the incredible reign of Queen Elizabeth II. And I think the age-old traditions uh, at the heart of the coronation ceremony allowed us to look into to history and see what had gone before us, but also to watch modern history play out with the beginning of a new reign and the family uh, of King Charles. But at the heart of the moment and its impact on those who watched it from around the world was actually, I believe, a resonating feeling of great celebration. For 73 years, King Charles, as Prince Charles, um, has lived as heir to the throne and lived his life in preparation of the day, one day, that he would become king. The world knows King Charles, and I think we can have great confidence in the king for his dedication to the nation and the Commonwealth throughout his time as the heir to the throne. And Australians, we can also have great confidence in the affinity that King Charles has with our country, Australia. Um, he has been to our shores no less than 16 times throughout his life so far. And I think King Charles has demonstrated an extraordinary and deep appreciation of the culture and the people and the environment of this country. Uh, and in um, 2018, I had the great pleasure uh, of meeting uh, King Charles, uh, as he was then Prince Charles, uh, when I was the Assistant Minister for Agriculture and Water Resources. I was able to join Prince Charles, as he was then, in the Daintree, in the Mossman Gorge, um, to conduct a roundtable on forestry, where King Charles demonstrated his extraordinary understanding of environmental conservatism uh, and rainforest and forest sustainability. Uh, and I think that experience was an ab absolutely invaluable for, for all of us who had the opportunity to be there. So it was a very positive moment of celebration for Australia and the Commonwealth as we watched his coronation on Saturday night. And I'm sure for many in Australia it was a welcome distraction uh, for those hard-working families who are under significant pressure at the moment with the greatest pressure, no doubt, being uh, the cost of living pressures that are currently impacting Australian households. So, as I said, it was great to start the week with such a positive celebration um, because I'm not sure there will be many struggling, hard-working Australians who would be celebrating after last night's budget was handed down. The, uh, the great challenge for Australia going forward, as has been reiterated time and time again by this, uh, the Shadow Treasurer, is that last night Australians were looking for cost of living relief that was not going to be adding to the pressure um, of their lives. But instead, last night we got a big spending, big taxing Labor budget. Um, and it appears as if Labor seems to think that they can spend their way out of this cost of living crisis. Well, the message to them, it's never worked before, so why would you think it's going to work this time? This budget doesn't do anything to help hard-working Australian families. Um, we needed a budget that was actually going to address the biggest issue, and that is reducing inflation. A and it needed to rein in spending and to combat the cost of living crisis facing all Australians. But instead, we find that Australians, on average, families will be $25,000 worse off every year under this Labor government. And when you consider that this government went to the election, the Prime Minister made so many promises to the Australian public. And the mechanisms through which he was, could have delivered those promises to Australians about cost of living, you know, cheaper electricity, lower mortgages, um, was through their budget, which was much awaited last night. But instead of confirming that the Prime Minister and his government was going to deliver on their election promises, what the budget did last night was just confirm that these are all going to be broken promises. So when you look at the cost of living measures across the board, there is so little in here. Um, we're going to see, um, despite 
um, a substantial investment um, in energy prices for low-income Australians. Low-income Australians are still going to be paying almost $500 a year more um, on their energy bills. I mean, what happened to the $275 headline figure that Australians were going to have off the bottom of their energy bills? That seems no longer to be a commitment of this government. Um, and so, despite um, the commitments around the emergency relief that we were going to be seeing in this budget, I think this budget has to be classically put down as probably one of the greatest disappointments when it comes to a budget um, of all time. But when it comes to my portfolio responsibilities, um, one of the uh, probably the, the, the saddest um, omissions from the budget last night is that despite uh, the drover's dog, he's a very clever dog, he, uh, he uh, knows, uh, knows lots of things. I mean, he could have predicted a budget surplus, but that drover's dog also knows that cost of living pressures are having a significant impact on the lives of all Australians. So we know uh, from research that we've received uh, that cost of living pressures are the single biggest issue that is impacting on Australians' mental health right now. And we did not see anything in the budget last night that acknowledged that mental health pressures um, are so severe and, and are increasing in Australia. Peak bodies of recent times have released information that supports this. Lifeline has reported an 80 per cent increase uh, in calls relating to cost of living. Headspace Australia's recent national survey has identified cost of living as one of the top three issues facing young people. And a recent reach out survey found that more than 50 per cent of young people in Australia are stressed out by the cost of living. Minister Butler had a round table earlier this year following his disastrous decision to cut Medicare subsidised mental health sessions from 20 to 10 in the intention of finding out from the sector about ways in which we could make sure that we support the mental health of Australians. That roundtable was in January. We have not heard anything from this government or this minister um, on actually implementing anything to improve Australians' access to mental health supports, exacerbated by the fact that we are in these extraordinary uh, challenging times. There has been absolute, complete radio silence about an issue that has been so strongly felt by so many Australians, um, I think the minister could not possibly have missed the fact that Australians um, who were relying on those additional 10 Medicare subsidised mental health sessions uh, have been calling out um, to explain the reason why they need the additional supports. So instead of us seeing the government last night actually admit to what has clearly been a bad policy decision, a fundamental mistake uh, in health policy. We saw them double down on it and refuse to acknowledge and make those changes. And I think Australians who are currently suffering from uh, moderate to extreme mental health, uh, ill health, uh, who were looking to, to be able to get access to those additional sessions again would have been extremely disappointed that last night there was nothing in the budget to, uh, to support them. So I think in summary, last night's budget was big on aspiration, which is something that this government is particularly good at, uh, but it was really light on the detail, which is once again something that is proving to be somewhat of a a track record of this government. But once again, the lack of detail leaves us um, not really knowing um, what the intention of this government is in relation to helping out Australians with cost of, of living. We can only assume from this hugely big spending, high taxing budget uh, that this government actually doesn't really uh, either care or understand that the most important thing that they can do to make sure that Australian families are getting the cost of living relief that they need, the cost of living relief that they were promised, is by this government actually addressing inflation, because it's inflation that is the thief in the night. It's inflation is the one that steals your cost of living um, 
opportunities, but it is the thief in the night that steals your quality of life. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to give the Australian Greens budget reply speech in the Senate. Last night's budget was a budget without ambition. It utterly failed to respond to the gravity of our times, to the twin crises of growing economic inequality and the breakdown of the Earth's climate and its ecosystems. But this absence of ambition from Treasurer Jim Chalmers should not be confused at all with a lack of effort. In fact, quite the opposite. The lack of ambition from the Treasurer took an awful lot of effort because he meticulously calibrated this budget to maintain the status quo. And any budget that maintains the status quo in this country in the face of the great challenges of our times is not a responsible budget. Hear, hear. Now, on responsible budgets, the Prime Minister said on the radio this morning what this government needed was a responsible budget. Now, it might be that he misspoke, but actually I think what he did was say the quiet thing out loud. And in doing so, he portrayed the real intent of this budget. This budget was never about what the country needed and it was never about what the planet needed. This budget was all about what the Labor Party needed. Now, we've got the LNP in a death spiral, so Labor is making a play for a decade in government. That's what's going on here. And in making that play, they don't want to upset, upset the status quo, no matter how unjust or how ecocidal the status quo actually is. So when Labor hands down a budget that was carefully calibrated to keep big business happy, to keep the wealthy relaxed and comfortable, it makes the task of actually doing something meaningful to respond to the crises that we are in all the more difficult in the future. Because every time you don't fight for ground, you lose ground. If right now, with a cost of living crisis, forcing people to live out of their cars, with parts of regional Australia becoming uninsurable thanks to climate change, with a leader of the opposition who doesn't know his yepin from his yapoon, if the Labor Party won't make progress now, when will they ever make progress? Well, here's the news. They won't. Last night's budget is what the Labor Party of today actually is. This is as good as it's ever going to get from the Labor Party. Those hoping that a second term Albanese government is suddenly going to start to act on the great injustices of our time are clinging to a fool's hope, because Labor have a clear strategy. They're cementing themselves as a centre-right party, a party that defends the market power of the monopolists and the rent seekers, and at a party who uh, defends the wealth of the property class in this country. And that means handing down a budget that makes a deliberate choice to fail to lift people, lift people out of poverty and continue to provide public subsidies to the corporate psychopaths who are destroying the capacity of this planet to sustain life as we know it in order to line their pockets with obscene profits. Those people and their psychopathic facilitators in this place are chewing up the planet and they are excreting misery and poison. That's what's going on and that's what Labor is facilitating. This Senate budget... Senate, Senator McKim, I need to interrupt you. Can you withdraw the statement, psychopaths? It's not appropriate parliamentary language. Uh, well, uh, uh, on a point of order, uh, I have not accused any uh, individual senator of being a psychopath, and I do not believe that I have been out of order. Uh, so, no. No, I won't. Sen 
Senator McKim, I'm simply asking you to withdraw that unparliamentary language, and I'll let you know that it was also an issue drawn to my attention by the clerks, and I um, would note that I also consider it unparliamentary language. Oh, I won't withdraw it, President. Who's seeking? Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Just on the point of order, uh, it does concern me, and I understand Senator McKim uh, is quite passionate about these subjects, but it really does concern me when that sort of language is used in the context of a parliamentary debate. There are people all over this country who have chronic mental health issues, and I think we should be very, very careful when we use that sort of language. I'm sure Senator McKim is extraordinarily intelligent. He could come up with uh, potentially some other adjectives to make his point and potentially help uh, assist the chamber. Senator McKim. Thank, thank you, Acting um, Deputy President. Could I uh, say that I, I genuinely do not believe that uh, I'm out of order and in contravention of the standing orders? And, and could I ask you, please, to perhaps um, take the matter on notice uh, and come back to me? And if it is the view of the President on advice from the clerks that, in fact, I'm out of order, I certainly will withdraw that. But my understanding very clearly from the standing orders and numerous previous rulings given by the President is that uh, if you do not identify somebody specifically, then you are not in contravention of the standing orders. <clears throat> Senator, Senator McKim, if you say the word psychopaths in this place, you are indeed very close to the line. And when we look to good order and conduct in this place, it is not always exactly where the line is drawn that we should draw it. It is something we need to be aware of more broadly in terms of um, pejorative terms about people in this place or indeed terms that affect other people in the broader community. Notwithstanding, I note that you have at this point said you will not withdraw and on that basis it of course uh, will be referred to the President unless of course you would choose to withdraw now. Well, what I'll do, because I know we're chewing up time that other senators uh, have got um, allocated to them. So, in order to facilitate uh, the order of the Senate, I will withdraw, and I do withdraw. But I will be raising this matter directly with the President because I think the Senate needs some guidance, um, uh, formally made by the President in relation to these matters. Now, as I was saying, um, people. Senator who... McKim, thank you. I now return the call to you. Thank you. Uh, as I was saying, these people who are deliberately destroying the capacity of our planet to sustain life as we know it in order to um, line their pockets with the most obscene levels of profit are chewing up the planet and excreting misery and poison. And in Australia, we are in a situation where millions of Australians are struggling to make ends meet and they cannot actually pay their school fees, pay their rents, put food on the table. And many of them are actually living out of their cars or their tents at the moment. And they'll continue to be living in those circumstances, notwithstanding the measures in this budget. And for people who are renting or on income support, it is particularly tough. But let's not kid ourselves that this is by accident. It's not. This is a deliberate choice made by those who are in power. Poverty is a political choice, and the failure of last night's budget to change the status quo in any meaningful way is Labor endorsing a choice to leave people in poverty in this country. Instead of investing in essential services and providing meaningful support to those who are most vulnerable, they have chosen to retain a $254 billion, a quarter of a trillion dollars in stage three tax cuts that overwhelmingly favour the billionaires and the already super wealthy in this country. And that's who the big winners are from this budget. The big winners are not the people who most needed help from the government, the people who are living in poverty, the people on income support, the people whose real wages have been going backwards for the last decade, the people who are trying to pay mortgages after 10 consecutive interest rate rises. They're not the winners. The winners of this budget are the super wealthy, and we should all be very clear 
about that. The government is choosing to hand over $360 billion for nuclear subs, no austerity for the military industrial complex, I might add, half a trillion dollars that the government could have chosen to use to lift people out of poverty, addressing the housing crisis, wiping student debt. But instead, it is the wealthy and the military industrial complex that are the big winners, while every single day people are skipping meals, struggling to pay their power bills or to keep a roof over their heads. It's a fundamental job of government to make sure people have the basics they need to live a life with dignity. But this budget, in, for many Australians, is going to make things actually worse. $74 billion cut out of the NDIS. $74 billion removed from the NDIS, more spent on subsidising the burning of fossil fuels than in the totality of the government's climate change programs. Nothing for nature repair, nothing for our oceans, four times as much in tax cuts for the rich than, of, than on cost of living support for Australians who desperately need it. This budget is a betrayal of the people who Labor promised would not be left behind. Nobody left behind, says Labor. There must be an awful lot of nobodies in this country because there were plenty of people left behind by this Labor government. Jim Char Treasurer Chalmers has made a choice to put a surplus ahead of supporting people living in poverty. I want to issue, quickly address the issue of budget repair. This is a mantra of those in power, the neoliberals and the deficit hawks. Let's be clear. Budget repair is a garbage excuse to, to ensure that help is denied to people who need it. Australia does not have a government debt problem. By international standards, our debt is very low, and by historic standards, our interest rate repayments on debt are very low. We didn't need to pay down the, net, the debt. We needed to help people. And a surplus is not an end in itself. You cannot eat a surplus. The government should not be crowing about having banked 82 per cent of the windfall revenues while people are living in cars and tents. So here's the question. Why should we accept a government that is content to leave so many people behind while showering the benefits on the wealthy? And the answer is simple. We shouldn't accept it. We deserve better. The Greens are absolutely committed to achieving better. We want to see bold action that looks after our ecosystems and creates a fairer, more just Australia and we are absolutely willing to take up the fight to deliver those things. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And, uh, today um, I, I rise to uh, talk about uh, a report which was released um, from Net Zero Australia, its analysis which recognises the, how forestry and agriculture uh, can help Australia's fight uh, against climate change. And, um, uh, I, it is great to see uh, my uh, good friend and uh, co-chair of the Parliamentary Friends of Forestry, Timber and Paper, uh, here in the chamber today, uh, Senator Dunningham, and um, uh, who is a very great supporter of, of forestry, particularly in his home state of Tasmania. Um, but I do so today because it's important to, to raise this uh, important issue here in the Senate. Uh, the analysis uh, by Net Zero Australia you know, because you know, forestry does get a bad rap by some in this place, but thankfully there are a number of senators who do support the important role that forestry plays, uh, not just uh, in terms of the environment, but also in terms of jobs and, and, and the role it has in, in many regional communities. Um, forestry is the economic bedrock for so many regional communities, as I've said countless times in this place. It employs around 80,000 Australians, 80, Australians directly and another 100,000 uh, people indirectly and contributes $24 billion to the national economy every single year. Jobs in forestry industry are good jobs. They provide security and decent wages, affording workers and their families the dignity and the respect that they deserve. And I've had the pleasure to meet many great people in this industry who work so passionately 
about uh, the work that they do in terms of uh, timber uh, and paper products. Uh, and shortly after his appointment as the Minister for Forestry, um, Senator Watt travelled down uh, to my home state in Victoria and to visit a, a great mill there, uh, Australian Sustainable Harbors in Hayfield in, in the Gippsland region, alongside the local MP, Darren Chester. Australian Sustainable Harbors is exactly the type of business that we all should be supporting. It supports a very large number of apprentices and all the management team started out on the shop floor. It's a great role model for many, many businesses in the sector. Uh, the business provides good jobs and has a respectful relationship, not just with the unions, but also with the local community, sponsoring many, many local events, as uh, we saw earlier this year, the Hayfield Timber Show. Unfortunately, there are some, and, and some on that end of the, of the chamber, that uh, like to undermine this great industry and the businesses and the communities that rely on, on, on businesses like Ash. They want to destroy forestry, destroy these jobs and put many families on the brink and you know, sadly destroy many regional communities whose, economics, whose uh, economies are built around the industry. They claim that this destruction is necessary in order to save the planet. They say that because of climate change we need to kill off these jobs. But what they don't realise, or what they choose to ignore, is that the forestry industry needs to be bigger, not smaller, if we are serious about reducing our emissions. This has been confirmed in numerous reports and studies, and most recently the Net Zero Australia report that I mentioned at the start of my speech. The Net Zero Australia report highlights the important role that the industry plays in fighting against climate change. It makes clear that we need to focus more on planting trees, on creating forest to meet our emission goals if we are to get there by 2050. To quote the report, land use, land use change and forestry account for a net sink of carbon dioxide. And this highlights the climate benefits of expanding the forest estate. The Net Zero Australia report adds to what we already know. As trees grow, they remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they convert this into carbon to make wood. This is obviously beneficial to our efforts to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in our environment. And that is why we refer to timber as the most sustainable product that we could use, especially when we are building uh, uh, things like homes or, or other um, construction sites. We are in, you know, need, desperately need, to have a, a, a long supply of timber products in this country. So using timber products stores the carbon and in sustainably managed forests like Australia, a new tree is planted for every tree that is chopped down. We need to build an estimated one million homes over the next five years. A strong forestry sector is essential to ensuring these homes are built sustainably more and more broadly, moving us to a much lower carbon economy. So let's consider what happens if the industry were to be shut down like those across the chamber seek to do. Yep, those as Senator Grant. Sheldon. As I speak in this chamber today, just five minutes down the road in the High Court, 1,700 illegally sacked Qantas workers, their families, their union, the Transport Workers Union, are fighting. They're not just fighting for their jobs, they're fighting for their rights at work. They're fighting for the rights for every working Australian. In a case that has massive ramifications for every Australian workplace, at its very core, this case is about whether a boss, in this case Alan Joyce, who is presently swinging his arms around this parliament today, has the right to sack workers before they can exercise a workplace right. In 2022, Qantas illegally sacked 1,700 workers in what they refer to as a vanishing window of opportunity. A vanishing window of opportunity to sack, sack 1,700 hard-working Australians before they could be, begin bargaining for a new wage arrangement. Qantas is arguing in the High Court that because they could not begin bargaining for another few months, their sacking was not illegal. Now, let's be clear about what the argument means. It means that if a female employee tells her employer that they're trying to have a child and their boss turns around and sacks them before they can go on parental leave, then that is OK. That is Qantas's argument. Take another example. If someone tells her employer they intend to take leave to volunteer with the SES or the Rural Fire Service, 
and their employer sacks them in response. Again, that would be OK. That is the precedent that Qantas and Alan Joyce are trying to establish. That if you sack a worker for exercising a workplace right before they are able to take it, then it is legal. If the Alan Joyce and Qantas board precedent is approved by the High Court, it would impact every single working family and every single workplace in this country. Now, that's, this is really what is at stake. Now, the Albanese government has intervened against Qantas in this case because we know what's at stake here. And you can contrast, contrast that with the approach of the former government. You can contrast that with former Assistant Minister for Industrial Relations, Amanda Stoker, who was rumoured to about to be parachuted into the seat of Fadden. When Qantas illegally sacked those 1,700 people, she came into this place and said it was their own fault. That's the difference between us and them. That is what we stand for working people. They stand for Alan Joyce and the reckless Qantas board. And unfortunately, other employers have taken examples set by Alan Joyce and the Qantas board. Now, and let's have a run at what's been happening at McDonald's. Who couldn't just stop stealing $250 million in wages theft from their workers, so some McDonald's stores have gone even further. Some stores settled with the union for retail and fast food workers, the SDA, last week for conducting an illegal five-year union-busting campaign. To quote Heather, a supervisor from Donald's in Murray Bridge, South Australia, I quote, I was pressured into resigning my union membership. They may be frightened I would lose my position as a supervisor. Then after I gave in to the pressure to give, give up my SDA membership, my hours were slashed because I raised a workplace safety concern. Or take it from Leisha, a former shift manager, who said she felt pressured to resign her union membership every step of my employment. Now, I'm sure we'd love to blame this on a few rotten franchisees. Now, that might be ex work except for the fact that McDonald's own corporate lawyers tried to defend this conduct in the federal court. In fact, a survey of 1,500 McDonald's shift managers found 10 per cent had been instructed to engage in anti-union activity. Now, this is happening in hundreds, if not thousands, of McDonald's stores around this country. Now, if, I'm sure if Senator Stoker was here, she'd rig vigorously be defending McDonald's, just as she so loved standing up for a legal sacking of 1,700 Qantas workers. Now, I can guarantee we will hear deafening silence from those opposite who are still in this chamber about the illegal union-busting wave that is smashing hard-working families around this country because it's this behaviour that is driving the cost of living crisis. This is what's underpinning the problem in our workplaces. Senator Dunham. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, last night's budget, of course, was um, quite the letdown for my home state, can I say. And uh, Sadly, Tasmania as a state is going to be much worse off, and indeed the people that live there. Tasmanians as individuals, as families, as business operators, they're all going to be worse off, despite the glib throwaway lines that you might hear from the government about what's on offer and how they might notionally benefit from what they served up last night. We've had time now to sort of go through the budget papers and have a look at what the Australian Labor Party, now in government, have delivered for our state. Uh, and I have to say it was quite interesting reading. Um, that catch cry that no one will be left behind sort of formed a centrepiece of what they, uh, as an opposition heading into an election, were saying. It was very big in the October budget, and of course it formed part of the narrative around the budget that they delivered last night. And of course, there were a multitude of promises made to that effect, and we've canvassed a couple of those. Uh, earlier today in a previous debate, and for the first time since the election, we have had a member of the Australian Labor Party that is in this parliament say the number 275. That promise made 97 times before the election to drop household power bills by $275 a year, made 97 times before the election, but uttered not once since the election. We had our first reference to it today, courtesy of 
Senator Ayres from New South Wales, and I'm grateful I'm going to be snipping that hand up because it is important to so show them that they haven't abandoned that promise altogether. I look forward to holding them to account on that. But what we've had since those promises were made match up not at all with the promises that were made. Quite the opposite, in fact. And this is where I come to Tasmania, where the budget delivered last night, that one that was supposed to ensure that no one was left behind, fails on so many fronts. Tasmanians are let down every way they turn, be it on the inflationary impact of their handout for power prices. They've done nothing to reduce power prices. Instead, they're using that finite resource we have, taxpayers' money, to offset the power prices they promised to bring down. That's an indication of failure, and it will have an inflationary impact. We also in Tasmania know that, in particular in regional communities, they are crying out for permanent full-time GP services. Uh, there are many communities, particularly throughout the electorate of Lyons, which covers most of central Tasmania and the east coast, where they want permanent full-time primary health care through general practice clinics. It's something they've been calling out for and something their local member, the Labor member for Lyons, Mr Brian Mitchell, knows about. But you know what, Acting Deputy President? Last night he didn't deliver on that. He did nothing for his electorate when it came to the provision of these services. One comes to mind, and that is the GP service in the Central Highlands, and I see Senator Tyrrell, a proud Tasmanian, nodding her head. She acknowledges and knows what the Labor government needs to do to support that community that have been crying out for this service. But the opportunity came and it was lost. It was missed. Mr Mitchell has failed his electorate by not guaranteeing the provision of these services. And I bet you we hear nothing from him into the future about what he's going to do there. It should be his central focus, but it is not. And then I want to turn to roads. Roads are an important part of our economy. They're also life-saving. Good roads mean better road safety outcomes. And we have one of the worst road death tolls in the nation, if not the worst, I think, uh, in recent times in Tasmania. And uh, the Australian Labor Party, who say no one will left, be left behind, of course, are leaving the state of Tasmania way behind on terrible substandard roads, road projects that have been scrapped. Now, there was a claim made yesterday in question time by the Leader of the Government in the Senate that nothing has been cancelled. Well, I mean, they're pretty rubbery words when you consider they've basically pushed all of these projects and the funding required for them off into the never-never. That's a problem. They won't be funded. These roads will not be built. Tasmanians miss out. And you only have to go as far as Tasmania's peak uh, road user body, the RACT, who today, in a press release, expressed concern about the significant reduction in road funding to Tasmania in last night's federal budget. And this is not some Liberal Party talking head. This is the RACT that represents its members, road users in Tasmania. And I quote their CEO, Mark Magnaioni, who says, it's extremely concerning that there's a reduction of nearly $350 million in federal funding to Tasmanian land transport infrastructure. We're a small state, but that's a fair lick of cash they're taking out. No one's going to be left behind. Oh, hang on, unless perhaps you're in the state of Tasmania. He goes on to say, now's not the time to cut investment in our road network, given Tasmania has the highest road toll of any Australian state. We need more investment, not less. But that uh, well-connected Australian government with hard-working local members like Mr Mitchell, of course, missed that call and have taken funding out of it. Finally, Mr Magnoni says, we're calling on the federal government to urgently, urgently explain what road upgrades will be delayed, deferred or cancelled as a result. Now, again, I expect there will be a deafening silence because they won't want to talk about it, much in the same way they didn't want to talk about their broken promise on power prices, for example. Shameful. But can I tell you Order. something that is of on my interest? Right. The centrepiece of our budget having, and I, I ask senators to remember Senator that 300. Dunham, resume your seat. Senator Urquhart, as a senior member of this chamber, you should know Standing Order 197, such interjections disorderly. Senator Dunham, you have the call.
I thank you for your protection, Acting Deputy President. I feel much safer now. But, uh, and uh, I'm sure Senator Urquhart is interested in this as a Tasmanian. I wasn't going to mention her by name, but she's invited that uh, reference. Order. So we've had $350 million taken out of road funding in Tasmania. We've had no provision for essential se uh, health services in regional communities. But you know what the centrepiece of Labor's budget for Tasmania was, Mr Acting Deputy President? It was a stadium on Hobart's waterfront. $240 million to go into a stadium. Order. So they've made their decision. A deed is being signed. We've got a team. You know what? That's good news. But there was a point that others in this chamber, and I include Senator Order. Tyrrell in this point, all of us in Tasmania have a list of priorities. And we made the point that if you're going to fund Senator the stadium, Dunningham, if you're going to fund Senator the nice resume your seat. I As members of the front bench and whip, you should understand that you have opportunities to speak. There are standing orders that provide for order in the chamber. I would ask you to respect them. You'll have your opportunity if you wish to make a contribution later. Senator Dunningham. Thank you again, Acting Deputy President. We made the point that if the Australian Labor Party are going to fund the nice-to-haves, the stadium, then they have absolutely no excuse not to fund the must-haves. Roads, health, the services Tasmanians are calling out for and demand equality on, not what we've been served up, but instead they take money out of roads and they put it into a stadium. And it's interesting, though, I have to say, Acting Deputy President, that there's barely been a peep out of any Labor federal member of parliament post-budget or, indeed, post the stadium announcement. It does say about, a lot about uh, um, Labor's priorities in Tasmania, and I do just want to make a couple of quick points in my final couple of minutes. I do want to turn our minds back to the 28th of November 2022, last year, when Senator Carol Brown, a proud Tasmanian, made some points in a debate on the very issue we were just discussing, the stadium. And she, she, says, uh, she made the point that the Premier of Tasmania, a very, very good Premier, isn't listening. She says, nearly everyone I've spoken to has indicated that there are other things the Tasmanian government should be looking at. There are other priorities. They go to health, hospitals, housing and education. They've all talked about people coming up to them and asking, and in this she's referring to the Tasmanian state opposition, led by Rebecca White, why can't we put the money into hospitals? Why can't we put that money into housing? We're in desperate need. And of course, Senator Brown does acknowledge uh, that the Tasmanian government have asked for funding for those things. It's interesting Senator Brown made those points in November of last year, but only a couple of weeks ago found herself standing there on the waterfront of Hobart, nodding furiously in the background as the Prime Minister handed over $240 million for the construction of a stadium. Now, it's going to happen, but the Australian Labor Party have pulled a swifty on Tasmanians. They're going to take away our GST as a result of giving us money for a stadium. Not only are they dogging us on health funding, on roads, but they're giving us a stadium and they're making us pay for it by taking away our GST. Yesterday I asked the Leader of the Government in the Senate to guarantee we would not lose our GST funding through this. She refused. Not one Labor member has stood up and asked that this be quarantined. So today I challenge any Labor federal member of parliament to seek a guarantee from the federal treasurer Dr Chalmers or the Prime Minister that we will not be worse off under GST because of your commitment to a stadium. It's the wrong thing to do by taking away our GST, to which funds— your remarks through the chair. Beg your pardon, Chair, uh, Deputy President. Priorities need to be corrected here, and they need to make sure that they fund our essential services. Order, your time has expired. Senator Tyrrell. Thank you, Deputy President. I think there's a theme about to happen. You know, did you catch the white elephant in last night's budget? It's big, it's white, it's costing nearly a billion dollars and it's supposed to live in Hobart. And the federal government wants to fund it. At a time when money is supposed to be really tight, somehow Labor found $240 million to fund a stadium that is going to lose $2 for every day it makes. You know, if the federal government wants to burn money, it can do that. The federal government doesn't run a single hospital or a single school. It's an ATM that doles out money, except for once a year when it makes you give some of it back. The federal government funds things. It's what it's there to do. It's not their job to fix Tasmania's health care system or build shelter for people sleeping rough. That's the job of the Tasmanian Liberal government. They're the ones choosing to put up money. We don't have to fund a project we don't want. 
You couldn't make this stuff up. Except apparently you can. The Tasmanian government has taken its playbook straight from an episode of Utopia. I'm sure you've seen it. Some of the conversations in the show are almost word for word arguments but put forward for the stadium, right down to the idea that it has to be a stadium with a roof. They were written as jokes, but here they are being presented as real life reasons for Tasmanian Liberal government is spending close to a billion dollars on a stadium. I know politics can get a bit ridiculous sometimes, but this really takes the cake. We're building this stadium because the AFL said we had to. They issued the threat, no stadium, no team. Despite the fact we already have two perfectly good stadiums where we play AFL games. Every single thing about this project says Tasmania has been sold a lemon. And they know it. They've taken us for mugs. The AFL are sitting there, grins on their faces, patting themselves on the back. And they're not even hiding it. Here's what Nathan Buckley said in a radio interview, and I quote, I think the AFL have done remarkably well at playing the game of we're not sold on this until everyone else has invested absolutely in it. So that's another tick for what they've been able to get, selfishly for the game of football, end quote. I mean, that speaks for itself, doesn't it? Tasmania, so desperate to prove themselves in the rah-rah of sport, they've made taxpayers across the country chip in for a project that no one even wants. Tasmanians are angry, really angry. I just spent three days at AgFest talking to thousands of Tasmanians. The conversations were all different. We talked about health, housing, how much groceries cost lately, but every single conversation mentioned the stadium. People hate it. They're furious. They're furious because this doesn't feel like it's for them anymore. It feels like it's about the AFL and the Premier, and we're all just spectators, maybe in the stadium. If the Tasmanian government has found $375 million down the back of the couch, when do we get a say on how to spend it? When do we get to say no? Because it's not the Premier's money, it's our money. It's not his to spend. All this about we can walk and chew gum at the same time. Let's put this into perspective then. We're talking about a stadium that's nearly a billion dollars. Tasmania's entire health budget is 2.5 billion. What would our healthcare system look like if we put an extra billion there instead? The Premier is all in, but he doesn't need to be. We don't have to spend a dollar on this. It's not too late for the Premier to walk away from this. The spend doesn't start straight away. The Tasmanian Liberal government can still decide to invest money where it's truly needed. Some people would call it flip-flopping, but I think it takes courage to say, you know what, I've heard what the people of Tasmania want, I've listened to what they're saying, and I've changed my mind. I said in my first speech that the public needs to stop marking politicians down for changing their mind. And I don't think Tasmanians would see this as a betrayal or walking away from a promise. They would see this as a decision from a strong leader, one who listens. The opposition to this stadium is everywhere. Tasmanians want him to walk away. The only thing stopping the Tasmanian Liberals is the pride of the Premier. So I'm asking Jeremy Rockcliffe, will you do the right thing and walk away from this dud deal? Senator Urquhart, you have the call. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Before I begin, I just want to reiterate the comments that I uh, inadvertently said out over the um, speech of Senator Dunham, and that is that Jeremy Rockliffe, the Tasmanian Premier, is very excited about the, and in fact so excited that he's tweeted, eligible Tasmanian households will receive $250 off their power bill each year for the next two years. He's excited about it, even if those opposite aren't. So last night's budget detailed the Albanese Labor government's economic plan for Australia. It was a Labor budget through and through. Help for those most vulnerable, it looked to the future and endorsed Labor's long record of fiscal responsibility. Relief, repair and restraint, the values that this Labor government was entrusted with and is delivering on. 
Just like last night's budget, today I'd like to talk about another Labor initiative that the Albanese government has been hard at work at since its election last year, the continuing work on improving mobile black spots through the Improving Mobile Coverage Program. For nine long years, the electorate of Braddon in the northwest of Tasmania, my home, was held back as the former government neglected rural and regional investment. So when Labor in our election platform publicly committed to deliver $40 million for improved mobile coverage in specific locations, it was a welcome relief to the businesses and people of Braddon. This funding was confirmed in last year's October budget. A delivery, delivery on a commitment which was just one part of our more than $2.2 billion commitment to improving regional telecommunications in Australia. In March, the government opened applications for round three of the regional connectivity program and another round of the mobile black spot program, a $160 million combined grants opportunity designed to help those living in rural, regional, remote and First Nations communities stay connected. Let's not forget, in the 2016 priority round of the mobile black spot program, those opposite committed to 125 mobile locations, of which 124 were in Liberal national seats. And opposition senators in this place have the gall to ask questions about the propriety of the Albanese Labor government's programs to address black spots created and exacerbated under their watch. At the time, the coalition had the benefit of being in government and could, not, could have run a competitive process through the department, but they chose not to. Instead, they committed a staggering 99.2 per cent of priority round funding to their own held electorates. So you can imagine my surprise and amusement when the member for Braddon in the other place has been advertising his Plot, plot Your Black Spot campaign, criticising poor network coverage and mobile black spots. Those networks were neglected by the member for Braddon and his government at the time. He complains about poor network coverage, a lack of investment he presided over as a member of the previous government. He claims to be a friend of the rural and regional Tasmania. In government, he boasted about having the ear of ministers. Well, clearly he never spoke to them about the failings of their program in Braddon. Clearly he never advocated for investment in mobile black spot coverage, Yet he has no problem criticising our government. He spins the poor decisions of the previous government into a failing of this one. This is a hallmark of the opposition that he is a shadow minister in, and it is a hallmark of the government he claimed to actively lobby. But the people of Braddon know this. People are sick of hypocrisy and spin. People who want politicians that just get on with the job. This is what the Albanese Labor government is doing in delivery on its promises. This starts with programs like the one that addresses the mobile black spots. Last night's budget paves the way to the better future that the Albanese Labor government was elected on. This starts with looking after our regions and supporting the people of Breton. The budget projected a surplus, a surplus of Labor values values that go right to the heart of addressing the disregard that the former government had for Braddon and its people. Hear, hear. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, last night, the budget delivered by the Treasurer was yet another disappointment for the people of my home state in Western Australia. After 10 years, uh, after 10, sorry, interest rate rises, under this government, spiralling cost of living pressures and out-of-control inflation not seen for 30 years, the government has been fumbling around looking for solutions. And we heard last night, no doubt when the Treasurer was putting together his speech, he, he looked for others to blame. And the first thing the, the Treasurer did was blame the, the previous government. And then he moved on to blaming the events in, in Ukraine. Now, the pain of inflation and rising interest rates is spreading across the community to families, to renters, to small businesses and to young Australians trying to save to buy their own home. But the reality is that inflation is homegrown. It starts here. It starts here in this place. It starts in Canberra. It's not coming from Vladimir Putin. It's not coming from the war in Ukraine. Inflation is coming from Canberra. I see Senator Ayres smirking at me across from the chamber. It comes from this place here. And, and the decisions we make here, that the government makes when they're in power, is critical to the future of this nation. 
And last night, the Treasurer couldn't even bring himself to say a very important word, a very important word to the productivity of this nation, that is infrastructure. Not once was infrastructure mentioned. Now Labor has announced a razor gang under the guise of an infrastructure review, which frankly will do nothing but inflict major cuts to vital rail, road, water, hospital, school and other infrastructure projects. The government has sneakily ensured the review concludes after last night's budget was handed down. Now we all know what this means, that vital infrastructure projects are getting slashed. This, this will likely include major uh, transport projects in Western Australia. The government must rule out that it will not cut or delay the much-needed Nicholson Road Garden Street intersection upgrade that borders the electorates of Tangney and Burt electorates. This is a major bottleneck in this part of the world, and it's, it's impacting significantly on freight getting through into Canningvale, into that, that part of the electorate, and indeed for people getting to and from their jobs and into schools. And this is impacting upon the productivity of that part of Perth. The government needs to rule out that they won't be impacting these projects. The previous coalition government committed half the funding for the project, something that uh, the former member for Tangney, Ben Morton, provided that commitment and backed by the government. And the WA government committed that they would fund the other half. Now, this project must stay fully funded. This project cannot be delayed. It must go ahead. The local community, my local community, demands this project gets underway. Road safety at this intersection will only be improved with this project being completed. Now, locals know when you drive through that area, my parents just live about three, four hundred metres from that intersection. They know how unsafe it is. Locals know how unsafe it is. It's been designated as one of the, the, the biggest black spot issues, one of the biggest crime, um, accident areas in the whole of Western Australia. This project must go ahead. Now, the government should also be getting on with planning projects like the widening of the Quinana Freeway south of, of uh, Gibbs Road down through uh, further south to Thomas Road. This section of the freeway is a major bottleneck. It's important for the future of industries down in that, that part of the world. In Henderson, where we know the AUKUS uh, project is going to be significant uh, the, and the, the opportunities in that area, the, the, fixing these sort of infrastructure projects are important, but we didn't hear anything from the Treasurer last night on that important issue. Sadly, we're understanding that, there's a, that the, 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 the WA Comprehensive Cancer Centre, an announcement made by the previous government, a $750 million commitment that was provided. This project seems to be at risk as well, and this is something that, that sadly, West Australians are desperately needing, yet we're not seeing this government come forward with important projects that are going to make a difference in the lives of the people of Western Australia. The wafer-thin budget surplus that was announced by the Treasurer comes on the back of Western Australians. It comes on the back of the resources sector. This, Labor likes to call this a responsible budget. Well, it's only a responsible budget that serves its own sectional interests. Western Order, Australians are not— time has expired. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This year has seen a windfall in both political and budget capital for the government. As we face the crises of climate and environment and cost of living pressures, Australians are looking to the government for leadership. Yet we've seen another budget that's a step in the right direction but is lacking in ambition. While doing some good things, this budget cannot be described as bold and decisive. And voices in my community are calling for ambition, ambition that is backed by experts, if we're willing to listen to those experts. We face a biodiversity crisis, and scientists tell us that we need to invest $2 billion annually if we're going to deal with the extinction crisis. We're seeing nowhere near that. We're seeing hardly any new money for the environment. We've got experts telling us what it will take to lift people out of poverty to allow them to get back into the workforce. We've seen a measly increase to job seeker and youth allowance. This is a barrier to employment, a barrier to get, getting people back into the workforce, which we hear both sides of politics saying should be the number one goal. If it is, why would we put barriers in the way of people achieving that? 
housing experts tell us that the Housing Australia Future Fund isn't big enough, yet we've got a government pushing forward with a fund that is not up to scratch. There wasn't a huge amount for small businesses in the budget. That is a continuing challenge for us to better support small businesses in Australia coming out of the pandemic. One thing that really stood out to me was R&D, research, research and development spending being the lowest on record. The lowest R&D spending as a percentage of GDP on record. This should send alarm bells ringing. Labor themselves have a target of 3%. It's at 0.49% uh, at the moment. There's a lot of work to do in that sp space. Just finally, running out of time, I think the budget surplus shows that we do need to have a conversation about revenue in this country. We're going to have to have some tough discussions about tax and stop being so reliant on income tax. There are plenty of other ways we can shape our tax system to provide the services that Australians want. Uh, order the time being 1.30. We move to two minutes statements. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Acting Deputy. Sorry, we've got a hard marker and we have a two minute statement list. Uh, Senator Dunham, you have the call. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a brief contribution about a terrific organisation in uh, the state of Tasmania, uh, Hobart Legacy. And Legacy would be known to nearly everyone in this place, the wonderful work that they do. I've recently become acquainted with uh, two legatees, Peter Hodge and, of course, also uh, Graham Manning, who presented me with a, a book about uh, chronicling the 100-year history of Hobart Legacy, uh, authored by Stefan Petro, uh, and it's entitled Look After the Misses and the Kids, a fantastic compilation of the history of a great organisation. And I want to pay tribute uh, to the legatees who provide such essential and amazing support to many in our community that are left behind. Uh, of course, also to the Friends of Hobart Legacy, who on a regular basis you'll find around the Hobart community raising funds for the work that Hobart Legacy does. Uh, at present, uh, they're caring for around 900 widows and junior legatees, and uh, uh, Legatee Manning was able to give me a bit of an outline of the fantastic work that they do in mentoring a, a number of these young people who sometimes, because of the situation they find themselves in and their background, um, require extra support. And so the work that they do do, the 70 volunteers they have at Hobart Legacy, these legatees, is just amazing. And it is a huge relief, of course, to our government entities that would otherwise be seeking to support them. This work that they do um, is a recognition of the sacrifice that these families have made. And so I can only commend Hobart Legacy, its members, uh, led by legatee Peter Hodge, um, for the work that they do, and I want to say thank you to them and commend them for the work that they will continue to do into the future. Thank you, Senator Dunning. And I call Senator Pratt. Senator Faruqi. Oh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. As the Australian Greens new spokesperson for Republic, I want to be unequivocal about our commitment for Australia to become a republic hand in hand with treaty and truth telling. More and more people are waking up to the historic crimes of the British monarchy and wanting to cut ties with them. But while nations like Barbados are becoming a republic and speaking truth about empire, our Prime Minister is taking us backwards. There was absolutely no need for Prime Minister Albanese to make it a priority to fly to the UK for the coronation, to bask in the excesses, pomp and pageantry of an institution that is so out of touch with everyday people. The British monarchy is an outdated, colonial and racist institution built on the blood, backs and stolen wealth of brown and black people. If you needed any reminder of this, just look at the coronation necklace Queen Camilla wore to the crowning. It features the 22 carat Lahore diamond, stolen wealth from the city I grew up in, just as the Kohinoor diamond adorning the crown jewels was stolen from the subcontinent. The wealth looted by the empire from colonized countries knows no bounds. The violent legacies of British colonialism are felt by people and countries all over the globe, including here in Australia, a nation born of dispossession and violence. We must forge a new path, one that reckons with this past and makes reparations, one that moves us forward on justice for First Nations. 
It's time to cut ties with the British monarchy. It's time for democracy, not monarchy. And it's time to abolish the monarchy. Thank you, Senator Farouk. I call Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. Last night, we, we witnessed the great Australian deception. The backbone of our country, our farmers who produce everything we eat and everything we wear, our resource miners who keep our economy running, and our regional, rural and remote communities, along with middle Australia, were cast aside. In his budget address, address, the Treasurer did not even utter the following words. Road. No mention of roads in the budget. Rail. There was no mention of rail in the budget. Dam. There was no mention of dams in the budget. Bridge. There was no mention of bridges in the budget. Agriculture. No mention of agriculture in the budget. And didn't mention infrastructure, farming and mining. So those words roads, rail, dam, bridge, agriculture, infrastructure, farming and mining were not mentioned at all in last night's budget. So if anything shows you the priorities of this Labor government, it was the lack of those words in that budget, because they do not understand how our economy works. And they do not understand that unless you grow the economy, unless you support business, unless you support those who are willing to put put their livelihoods on the line, then you will not grow the Australian economy and you will not, you will not, you will not take an axe to inflation because last night's budget showed Labor's priorities, but more importantly, it showed their lack of priorities. So Australia needed a budget that reduces inflation and reins in spending to bring down the cost of living for all, but instead we got a typical Labor budget high taxing, high spending, a budget that leaves all Australian families off by about $25,000 a year. Shame, Labor, Thank shame. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Call Senator Payman. Acting Deputy President, it was a proud moment last night as a Labor senator watching the Treasurer hand down our second budget. It's truly a Labor budget, doing what we can for those who need it most and creating more opportunities for Australians. This budget is responsible. This budget is practical and this budget is sensible. I'm really proud of our commitments to women's equality, with this budget ensuring women are front and centre with measures like cheaper childcare, expanding flexible paid parental leave and investing in women's safety. As a West Australian, I'm really proud of what this budget is delivering for my home state. $110.5 million for energy bill relief that will be matched by the McGowan government. Cheaper medicines by allowing more than 620,000 West Australians to buy two months' worth of medicines for the price of a single prescription. Given that this is a common sense budget, it's no surprise that the no coalition on the other side are already opposing it. This morning, I heard Senator Hughes elevating comments that frame our budget as taking money from hard workers to give to lazy bludgers. This is absolutely disgusting language and it's really disappointing that those opposite are airing comments that characterise vulnerable Australians in such a demeaning way. This budget has struck the right balance of providing relief for the most vulnerable Australians and I want to say to those opposite, single mothers are not bludgers. Pensioners are not bludgers. Students investing in their futures are not bludgers. Those opposite are always quick to turn their backs on the most vulnerable, but the Albanese government is determined to, um, is committed to a better future and making sure no one is left behind. Thank you, Senator Payment. Call Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Never in the history of this country has so much money been wasted on a referendum Australia shouldn't even be having. There is no question this referendum is bitterly dividing Australia and dividing Indigenous Australia too. And there is no doubt this will be the most expensive referendum exercise ever. In this week's budget, this government is blowing more than $364 million on this unnecessary, divisive and racist referendum. Add it to the $75 million in the October budget, this means taxpayers are forking out more than $400 million for the Prime Minister's personal vanity project. 
The last referendum in 1999 cost approximately $67 million. Adjusted for inflation, today it would have cost about $124 million. There is every reason to believe the extra money is being banked to fund the voice, which in their arrogance Labor will legislate even when the Australian people reject it. That is why the no vote must be overwhelming and send a clear message to Labor that Australians will not permit them to create a voice. The money also includes more than $10 million to increase mental health supports for Aborigines during the referendum period. Typical Labor hypocrisy. They have halved the mental health support for everyone else at a time when nearly all Australians are struggling with the legacy of pandemic lockdowns, the cost of living and the housing crisis. We won't ever get a straight answer from this government about why this racist referendum is costing more than three times what it should. That's because this government has never considered itself accountable to the Australian people and never will. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Hanson. I call Senator Cadell. Deputy Chair. Last night's budget took me back to a time, and I, I worked hard for a few years. And I bought myself, when I was younger, a little sports car. And looking back, a bit of a hairdresser car now, but at the time I was pretty pleased with it. And I walked back from Sydney down to the street, went down there, don't know why, but was there. Came back, glass on the ground outside it, on the windows. Window smashed, car gone through, things stolen. Something I worked very hard for, others have pilfered. I think that's what the budget was last night. I'm going back to the Hunter on Friday the hunter where we mine coal, the hunter where we build things, the hunter where we do things, just like regional Queensland and where uh, Senator Hanson and Senator Roberts are from, where they mine things, they make things, they do things. In Western Australia, where they mine things, they make things and do things. And these people have worked to make this surplus. These people have run to create an Australia that has a good economy, has a growing economy, can deliver these sorts of windfall gains. And what have we got back? Not a thing. The regions have been pickpocketed like my car was pilfered. The glass on the ground is as we sprint towards ending these people's jobs and we crawl to replacing the energy that they make. There is a massive disparity going on in Australia. It is this. If we go back to the regional statement of the budget of the last government last year, 381 pages going in what we'll do for regional Australia. Yesterday, 81. If you don't live near a city capital, you don't count under this government. And that is sad, because it is the regions that deliver this country's wealth. And we are such in a blind philosophical rush to shut down these people. They deserve more. They aren't getting it. You tax them $1,500 more and give them nothing. Thank you, Senator Cadell. I call Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I'm incredibly proud of the budget that we've announced, uh, in particular for First Nations Australians uh, with the portfolio areas that I have as Assistant Minister in Indigenous Affairs and Assistant Minister in Indigenous Health. We've invested in a range of measures to improve health outcomes for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians, a landmark $238.5 million to improve First Nations cancer outcomes through building capability and growing the healthcare workforce. $28.2 million to support the delivery of 30 dialysis units for First Nations peoples in regional and remote Australia with end-stage kidney disease. We've already announced uh, that Tea Tree, uh, Hearts Range and Borrelia in the Northern Territory two places in South Australia, a place in, in Western Australia, communities that will also uh, have, have already been announced in terms of those 30 dialysis units. $16.7 million to promote increased uptake of health assessments by First Nations people, which has reduced since the start of COVID-19. And this will assist more First Nations people to receive essential support for the management of chronic and mental health conditions and $1.4 million to expand the delivery of the Strongborn program to provide information about fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. We are also addressing the social determinants of health through better housing, education, jobs, food security and community safety in the cities, regions and the bush. This includes $150 million over four years to support First Nations water infrastructure and provide safe and reliable water for remote and regional communities. 
and $111.7 million under a new one-year partnership with the Northern Territory Government to accelerate the building of new remote housing. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. I call Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I want to use my two minutes to talk about the ongoing Senate inquiry into missing and murdered First Nations women and children, which was first established in 2021. Since its establishment, the committee has carefully considered how to move through this process with much care. It's not your average committee inquiry, and nor should it be. We have moved slowly so we can take the necessary steps to ensure that families and communities feel that they have a safe space to this much needed and difficult yarn. Two weeks ago, members of this inquiry sat down for a day and a half of hearings in Perth on Wajak Noongar country, where we heard from families right across from my home state of Western Australia about their experiences of racism, police neglect, lack of support services and underreporting in the media. We closed the hearings with a yarning circle and smoking ceremony. In particular, I want to highlight the case of one young child, a child's mother who was a victim of family and domestic violence. In this instance, police were called to the scene. She was treated as the criminal. and In fact, she was arrested along, alongside her father, whilst her abuser left free. Her abuser abducted, abducted her child. Police ignored the victim's father's concerns and about the baby's safety. Shortly after, the baby was found in a roadhouse some 900 kilometres away after being tortured and tragically died shortly after. This is one of the tragic and definite heartbreaking stories that we heard as part of this inquiry's proceedings. And I want to thank each of the families for taking their time to come together and to talk to us in the committee. I recognise that this is not easy to relive such horrific events, but it's so important that we as senators hear these stories firsthand and connect with these families so that we can all fight for better outcomes for First Nations women and children. I want to acknowledge uh, my committee members, um, Chair um, Senator Scar, uh, Deputy Chair Senator Green, Senator Shoebridge and Senator McLaughlin that joined us for this. Thank you very much, Senator Cox. And I call Senator Babette. Thank you. A society is ultimately judged on how it nurtures and cares for its most vulnerable, its children and its elderly. So how will our society be judged if we persist in allowing our children to be used as props in drag queen shows? A small group of men who want to caricature women in a highly sexualised fashion must not be allowed to corrupt the innocence of children. If drag queens, if drag queens want to perform for adults at stage shows or local pub bingo nights, good luck to them. But the insistence that drag queens must be able to gain an audience with children is where a line must be drawn. No civilised society agrees to sexualise or confuse its children. We are still at this moment a civilised society. And so it is still within our power to say no to the sexualisation of our children. I'm absolutely committed to joining parents, grandparents and all civic-minded community members in opposing drag story times being promoted around our country. The civilised majority will not kneel to a vocal minority of fringe activists who want to push adult concepts of sex, gender and trans ideology onto kids. We will not be manipulated by hypocritical rhetoric about diversity or inclusion. Sexualising children is not diversity. Putting kids alongside drag queens is not inclusion. We say no to drag queen story time, not because we are bigots, but because we are civilised and we want to remain so. Do what you want around other adults, but simply this, leave the kids alone. Thank you, Senator Babbitt. I call Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, one of Australia's most recognised artists and my friend, Charles Billich, and his wife, Krista, are great contributors to not only art but to the social and, the, and society part of life. However, the champagne filled parties at the Sydney Gallery are not a reflection of how Billich's life started, nor a true measure of the battles he's still fighting. At just 21 years of age in his homeland of Yugoslavia, with Tito's secret pol police hunting him, Bilic was jailed for two years and just three years later he travelled to Australia via Austria. 
However, when communism crumbled and Croatia was born, Bilic returned to the town of his birth, Lovran, to celebrate and invest in its development. However, all was not as it seemed. After investing in a new gallery, renovating the space and filling, the deal he believed existed that it would be rent-free for 10 years was reneged upon, and his art collection was seized in lieu of payment. And so began Bilic's efforts to see the return of his artwork. He's always been prepared to pay for it, but he and Krista just want the works returned. Thanks to the hard work and then the support of filmmaker and friend Steve Ravick, it looked like a resolution was in sight after at least 15 years. But it now looks that the municipality of Levran and its mayor, Simonich, are reneging on a mutually amicable res resolution that was in the process of being finalised. In fact, it now appears that those artworks se are set to be auctioned. This continues to echo the shameful treatment that Charles Billich has endured for over the 15 years he has tried to resolve this matter, and the municipality of Levran has gotten away with manipulating the circumstances and deceitfully carrying out actions against Billich. I'd like to acknowledge Steve Ravick and the work that he's done, and we certainly hope that these artworks are returned to their rightful owner in the very near future. Thank you, Senator Hughes. I call Senator Tyrrell. Thank you so much, Acting Deputy. The government wants pharmacists to dispense 60 days' worth of medication at a time instead of 30 days. It means patients with chronic illnesses don't have to go to the GP as often and they'll save time and money. Sounds good, right? But the Pharmacy Guild isn't so sure. They say this could force smaller pharmacists into closing on weekends, cutting staff and potentially closing down altogether. The government says this simply isn't true. They're in a stalemate and it's starting to get ugly. So I've got a solution for them. The government should commit to two years of transitional support payments for pharmacies while this change comes into effect. Any pharmacist who's losing money as a result of this policy can apply to be reimbursed the difference by submitting their income history from the previous year and their income for this year. If there's a serious difference, then, go the, dif then the government tops them up to what they were in 2022. After two years, we review the change to prescriptions. If the government is paying out to every pharmacist in the country, the policy is a stinker. If nobody's receiving any payments because they're not actually losing any money, then we're all clear. If the pharmacists are right, this policy would see them no worse off, guaranteed. If the government is right, this policy wouldn't cost them anything, guaranteed. Pharmacists do important work. In regional areas, we rely on them to plug the gap when you need health advice. And a shout out to my local pharmacist, Alec, love you. I rely on him quite a bit. This policy will help people save time and money, but you can't make these changes without having a safety net in place. Two years of transitional payment isn't going to bankrupt the country, and we can't afford for regional pharmacists to go under, because in the end, it'll be the patients who lose out. Thank you, Senator Tyrrell. I call Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak about inflation. Inflation. Inflation which was not addressed, which was not addressed in the budget that was handed down last night. You don't solve inflation by having an expansionary stimulatory budget. And that's what we saw last night. A typical Labor big taxing, big spending budget. And what do we know about inflation? I often quote, I often quote, and I know those opposite enjoy it when I quote from my book on basic economics, which I keep in this chamber. Basic economics. Inflation is in effect a hidden tax. Inflation is a hidden tax. The money that people have saved is robbed of part of its purchasing power, which is quietly transferred to the government. And inflation is not only a hidden tax, it's also a broad-based tax. It siphons off wealth across the whole range of incomes and wealth, from the richest to the poorest. That is basic economics. And what we saw last night from the Labor government was a typical Labor budget. Big spending, big taxing. It will do nothing to solve the cost of living crisis that Australian families are facing all over this country. You do not spend your way out of an inflation cost of living crisis. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. And the budget last night will contribute to inflation. 
We are already seeing in the Australian Financial Review, in an article that was just put up recently, economists are already predicting that there is going to be another interest rate rise, another interest rate rise directly flowing from last night's budget because of its expansionary impact, an injection of $21 billion this year into a red-hot economy facing inflation. Wrong budget at the wrong time. Thank you, Senator Scott. And I call Senator Stirl. American Deputy President, thank you. I'd like to do something completely different today. I'd like to quote from an article in the Australian Financial Review yesterday by Joe Aston, and I will go word for word his words, not mine. The decision by Qantas, and it's titled How Low Will Alan Joyce Go? The decision by Qantas in recent days to banish the AFR from its lounges and in flight Wi Fi network is only what we've come to expect from our national carrier remade in the image of Alan Joyce. It is, of course, the second such wobbly he's chucked in 10 years after yanking all Qantas advertising from the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age back in 2014. It's an incredibly petty act that actually bears out what we've been saying all along about the corrosion of Joyce's leadership. Remember, the most important thing to Joyce isn't money. He made $130 million, so he doesn't need any more of that. The most important thing in the world to Joyce now is what other people think of him. In his mind, clearly, he has, a con he has constructed a heroic image of himself as the saviour of Qantas. He truly believes this. Indeed, he may be incapable of believing anything else. This is why Joyce makes statements that come across as comically self-unaware. He cannot express gratitude for the Australian government handing Qantas $2.7 billion during the pandemic. He even goes as far as claiming Qantas ended up getting very little government support. He is una unable to acknowledge that taxpayers helped rescue Qantas because it, because it is incompatible with his conviction that he alone rescued Qantas. All of this delusion is enabled by Joyce's chairman, Richard Goiter, from whom Joyce garners sympathy by playing the vulnerable teenager. Goiter is fully signed up to all of Joyce's narratives. The duo exhibit all the dynamics of an enmeshed family. It is frankly creepy. I have a lot more to say about this, and I will, Madam Acting Deputy President. I do wish the new CEO can bring this once proud Australian icon back to its former greatness, because he's destroyed it. Thank you very much, Senator Stirl. I call Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The Albanese government has shown yet again in this budget that it does not care about refugees, and it cares even less about the human rights of people seeking asylum. Never under underestimate the capacity of the Labor Party to disappoint. In no policy area in this statement more true than in regard to refugee and immigration policy. While claiming that this budget won't leave anyone behind, there is absolutely nothing in there for people seeking asylum. Not a single mention. I welcome the targeted support measures that will positively support people seeking asylum and refugees, but the Albanese government continues the Morrison government's punitive approach and disgracefully poor social supports for people seeking asylum. These limited measures aren't anywhere near Labor's election commitments and don't go nearly far enough to tackle the unfair, unjust, unequal and, frankly, violent system that this colonial government yeah. enforces on people seeking safety. The Albanese government will spend a staggering $6 billion over the next four years to maintain a cruel and dehumanising immigration detention system, with a lot of this money going to private security and prison companies who have no regard for human rights and torture people who are simply trying to keep themselves and their families alive. If this Labor government wants to show it has any integrity and respect for human rights, it will commit to its election promises to increase our humanitarian intake, expand social support services and close the violent, torturous and Thank shockingly you. expensive Thorpe, immigration detention. I call Senator Jacone. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. Uh, last night, uh, the Albanese Labor government delivered a budget that set stronger foundations for a better future. Treasurer uh, Jim Chalmers presented to the Australian people uh, a budget that provided cost of relief, 
delivered historic investment to Medicare and the care economy, broadened opportunities, laid the foundations for growth and strengthened our budget. And in addition to that, what we have seen this week is that it's, instead of supporting the budget, those opposite, the Liberals, the Nationals and, sadly, the Australian Greens have all decided to justify an unjustful opposition to the Albanese government's Housing Australia Future Fund. The absolute hypocrisy by those opposite, and especially those on the crossbench, who come into this place and argue that we need to do more for social and affordable housing, but they continue to oppose this fund, the $10 billion fund, the single biggest investment by any federal government in social and affordable housing in a decade. But it is hardly surprising that the coalition is in this position, but I am disappointed the Australian Greens, who love to stand in this place to use clips on their social media, are now the ones who are blocking this reform from being passed. So you would have thought that they would be supportive of this investment, this investment to help thousands of vulnerable Australians. But what we find with the Australian Greens, and in particular their spokesperson in the other place, who is opposed to 1,300 new affordable homes, social housing in his own electorate, running a campaign with the support of local councillors, local councillors, green councillors in the city of Brisbane who are opposed to, to, opposed to affordable housing. So it is shameful on the Australian Greens who are blocking this key reform to help thousands of vulnerable Australians to have a roof over their head. Our time. Thank you. Uh, Senator Farrell, you were sick. Oh, sorry. Oh, OK. Sorry, we'll now move to question time. Senator Hume. Thank you, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. With energy bills up $500, even taking into account Labor's limited temporary payments, and the average family $25,000 worse off under this budget, hasn't Labor let Australia down by failing to deliver a budget that gets the cost of living down for all Australians. Thank you, Senator Hume. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President, and I thank Senator Hume for the question and for the opportunity to talk about what a strong, responsible budget uh, we have handed down. And in, in answer to, to the figures that um, Senator Hume's re, uh, read out, well, I don't trust them on figures, right? Because I've just worked through this budget and all the dodgy budgeting the that went into their years in government, the hidden funding cliffs, the under-resourcing, the failing to account, a significant part of the investments that we are making in this budget is to deal with funding that just terminated and was never accounted for in their budget. Senator Gallagher, please resume your seat. Senator Henderson. And interjections are disorderly. Senator Watt was in interjecting from the moment the question was asked. I would ask if you could bring him into order. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson. I'm very glad that you um, noted that interjections are disorderly because there were interjections across the chamber. I will remind all senators that interjections are disorderly, as Senator Henderson has reminded everyone. And when questions are asked and ministers are on their feet, I expect all senators in this place to respect the silence that's required. Minister. Uh, thank you, this budget takes pressure off families while not adding to pressure on inflation. We have taken our job in finally and carefully calibrating this budget so that we don't add to inflation, but that we are able to provide sensible cost of living relief to those that need that support the most while still at the same time making historic investments yeah, yeah. in bulk billing in Medicare, tripling the Medicare bulk billing incentive yeah. to make it easier for parents of children, for concession card holders, for pensioners to ensure that when they need to see a doctor that they get that consultation bulk billed. Yeah. That's what you get under a Labor government, not dodgy budgeting and failing to account, but fiscal discipline investments where they need to be made, cleaning up the mess of nine years of your administration, putting the budget on a more sustainable, more resilient footing so that we can make room for the things that we know Australians depend on and expect from their government. That is the approach that we took in this budget. I am very proud of this budget. 
very proud indeed because we have had to balance up a range of competing pressures to land a document that is right for the current economic challenges and circumstances we face. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Hume, first supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. Why has the government removed the objective to tackle inflation from the federal budget papers? Thank you, Senator Hume. Minister Gallagher. Order. Did you get past the glossy, Senator Hume? <laughs> right. Okay. It's run throughout Order. all of the budget papers. It was in the Treasurer's speech the to the Parliament when the budget was introduced last night. It's in budget. It, it, it is filtered through every single uh, Senator, document. Uh, Minister Gallagher, please resume your seat. I'm asking for order across the chamber once again. Order on my left and my right, Minister. The, the Treasurer and I have been talking about the inflation challenge since we came to government. The, the, my, the, the, largest, the, the, the largest increase in inflation actually happened in the March quarter of last year under your administration, where you poured $8.6 billion into the economy in six months. Now, that wasn't inflationary then, according to you. We have got a very carefully calibrated budget that looks to repair the budget over time, put it on a more sustainable footing, make the investments we need and ensure that we can support those people that are doing it really tough across the country. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator Hume, second supplementary. Thank you, Madam President. After three quarters of inflation with a seven in front of it, why did the government deliver a budget with $185 billion increased spending that will add to inflationary pressures? And as Chris Richardson, SP, Goldman Sachs, and UBS have all said, will force the RBA to raise interest rates. Thank you, Senator Hume. Um, Minister. Well, I don't accept the numbers that Senator Hume has, has used in her question for a start. I don't know where they came from and I don't know who got the calculator operating on the opposition's Order. benches to come up with that Order. figure. But I, what I would say uh, is we've taken our advice from the Treasury. You see the inflation forecasts in the budget papers if you get to that point in Budget Paper 1. Uh, you can see what, what uh, the Treasury, who advises us, uh, is actually saying about this budget and its impact on inflation. 6 per cent in the 22-23 year, declining to 3.25 per cent next year and declining back into the target range in the year after that. Let's, let's go with what the budget books say. Hey? Order. And in terms of, of economists, yes, you will get a range of views from economists. I just sat next to one at a lunch where they said their view was the budget was neutral. The budget was neutral. And in fact, that's what a lot of the major banks are saying. At worst case, it's neutral. So I think you know there will be opinions, but Thank we you, are Minister. very confident the time with what we are doing. Has expired, Senator Payman. Order. Uh, Senator Payman, please resume your, your seat. Order on my left. Senator Payman. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister update the Senate on the budget that the Treasurer delivered last night and how it delivers for all Australians? Good question. Thank you, Senator Payman. Minister. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Payman for uh, that question. I appreciate it. Uh, the budget the Treasurer delivered last night does many things. It responded to the immediate challenges and set Australia up for the future, as well as forecasting a surplus and providing relief for the most vulnerable. Helping the vulnerable and delivering a forecasted surplus aren't really experiences familiar to the coalition, are they? They never managed it during their nine whole years in government. They got the mugs printed, but they didn't actually deliver it. And we remember all the photos. We remember all the photos. Nine years of financial mismanagement, nine years of bad budgeting, gaps in the budget, fiscal cliffs, booby traps that have taken us two budgets to uncover. We have inherited it all and we have dug the budget out of that hole in order to deliver a forecasted surplus. We have cleaned up the mess left behind. We have managed to deliver for Australians, particularly those who need it the most, and those that had been left behind uh, uh, under the former government. The budget brings stronger, builds stronger foundations for a better future by delivering cost of living relief that does not drive up inflation a historic $5.7 billion investment to strengthen Medicare, 
investing in a strong and more secure economy through significant investments in renewable energy, skills and to modernise and grow Australia's industrial capabilities and, of course, broadening opportunity, President, including advancing women's economic opportunity. We don't see women as an add-on, as something that you look at once you've finalised the budget. Women have been front and central of our decision-making, and we are absolutely determined to ensure we seize the economic opportunities that come from a country that treats women equally. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Um, can the Minister outline how the government's responsible economic management allows it to make significant investments in Medicare to benefit all Australians? Minister. Thank you, President. And I can, Senator Payman. Thank you very much for the question. And I think this has been a very key part of this budget, is how, with the upgrades to revenue, how much we have uh, provide, uh, put back to budget repair. 87 per cent over the last two budgets in revenue upgrades to the budget, compared to about 40 per cent under the previous administration. This shows how serious we are around fiscal repair, about ensuring that we don't have to uh, avoid borrowing hundreds of billions of dollars in debt and then paying the interest on that debt. And to do so, we have ensured that we are putting the budget on a more sustainable footing, which allows you to make critical investments in things like Medicare, things that people value, tripling the bulk billing incentive, putting a range of measures in place to ensure that people can have their health care needs looked after, including those with chronic disease. <coughs> in terms of the bulk billing incentive, 11.6 million Australians Thank will benefit from that measure alone. Expired. Senator Payman, second supplementary. Thank God the adults are back in charge. Can the can the, minister, can the minister provide further information on how the government is delivering cost of living relief through its $14.6 billion in responsible and targeted cost of living relief? Thank you, Senator Payman. Minister Gallagher. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Payman. Thanks, President, for the call. The, uh, the cost of living package was, is a, is a, a a key part of the budget. And we've been clear, as we've been dealing with the inflation challenge, accepting that we needed to provide targeted and calibrated cost of living relief uh, across the forward estimates, and we have targeted that, targeted that carefully. So the $14.6 billion cost of living package over four years allows us <laughs> to make those investments into energy bill relief. Uh, for 5 million households and 1 million small businesses, which I will remind people that those opposite voted against in December when we recalled the parliament, the more affordable health care, cheaper medicines and support for those who need it most, including extending parenting payments single for parent, single parents who have children between the ages of 8 and 14, $4.9 billion to increase the rate of eligible working age and student payments, which will benefit 1.1 million Australians. The largest increase Thank to you, Commonwealth Minister, rent assistance in 30 years. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. President, my question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Is it the government's assessment that Labor's budget makes future interest rate increases more likely or less likely? Is fiscal policy working complementary to monetary policy? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, we have been very clear. Uh, in the lead up to the budget and in the decisions taken, which are outlined in the budget paper, uh, that we uh, see that as dealing with the inflation challenge in the economy is a priority. Uh, as to decisions that the Reserve Bank may make, we don't foreshadow those, and we, don't, we, we leave that for the independent bank itself makes those decisions. We, we never. We never we never try and get ahead and say what we think they should do, what we think their decisions would, will be. They are independent of government for important reasons, and I think that was something that the opposition uh, has previously accepted. In terms of the, in terms of, in terms of the inflation forecast, well, I'm trying to answer your question, Senator Birmingham. If you stop peppering me, um, well. In terms, in terms of the inflation forecasts, you can see them in the budget. You can see them in the budget. Um, they're outlined in the budget, the forecasts. You can see that when it comes to energy bill relief, the package that you voted against, 
uh, the caps that you voted against, the relief that you voted against. Right. When it comes to that, that actually has a downward uh, pressure on inflation of three quarters of a per cent, and that the other measures that we are taking, carefully calibrated over four years, do not have a negative impact on inflation. That is the advice the government Senator has. Hume. That is re represented in the budget papers. It might be an uncomfortable truth for those opposite that you actually find a government that actually wants to do a number of things in the budget, that actually wants to show a bit of compassion and deal with some of the pressures that people are feeling and be responsible about how we manage the budget. I think that is probably a foreign concept to you, so I can see how it is challenging you. But we are able, with the approach we've taken to this budget, with returning money back to budget, with cleaning up the mess, with making investments and, and making sure they're carefully targeted not to add to inflation. Thank you, Minister. Uh, just a moment, Senator Birmingham. Senator Hume, your interjections, your constant interjections are disorderly. I'd ask you to stop. Senator Birmingham, first supplementary. Thanks, uh, thanks President. Uh, Minister, contrary to your claims, the Financial Review has reported that, quote, extra spending is not offset by meaningful cuts to neutralise the fiscal pulse. Economist Chris Richardson said of the budget, I had thought the Reserve Bank was done and dusted, Senator but this Watt. has notably raised the chance that they will do another swing of the baseball bat. Given that the minister is unable to say that future interest rate increases are less likely as a result of Labor's budget, aren't you acknowledging that the Albanese government's fiscal policy settings do not put downward pressure on interest rates? Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Minister Gallagher. Uh, President, it is, uh, it is sort of amusing to me that Senator Birmingham is able to ask that question with a straight face, to be honest, after the work that I've done having to clean up the mess of the previous administration, including, including finding $40 billion in savings. $40 billion in savings in two uh, budgets, and what happened in your last Minister, budget? Please resume your seat. Order on my left. Or, Senator Payne, I've just called the chamber to order. Minister. $40 billion in savings that we have identified in just two budgets, less than a year, when in the March uh, budget, uh, zero. Minister, please resume zero. your seat. Senator Hume. Thank you. A point of order. The minister is misleading the Senate. Offsets uh, and saves are very different things. Not, yeah. Are debate. they saves or are they offsets? Minute, are they saves or are they Senator offsets? Hume. No. Senator Hume, that is a debating point. Minister Gallagher. $40 billion in savings. Zero in the March budget. Zero. You poured cash in in a pre-election cash splash and zero savings. And part of the saving, part of the spending that we are doing in this financial year is to keep the lights on, the agencies and services that you were going to flick off. That's a, that is a single, that eleven and a half billion dollars that we have had to make room for, find unexpected, didn't know it was going to happen, in order to keep services going. That's Thank the you, legacy Minister. of your the time government. time for answering has expired. Senator Birmingham, second supplementary. Thanks, President. I refer the minister to the remarks of Better Shares chief economist, who said the spending in this budget is, quote, unambiguously expansionary and risks one, if not two, additional interest rate increases. Or Goldman Sachs, who say the budget has created a hawkish outlook for monetary Senator policy, Watt. risking more interest rate rises. Or UBS, who say the budget shows an increasing risk of further rate hikes. Are all of these experts wrong about the Albanese government's budget? when they say it will put more pressure on the Reserve Bank to keep interest rates higher for longer. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as I've said in previous answers, the decisions we took in this budget were to ensure that the spending where we had to spend and where we needed to spend, including in targeted, calibrated cost of living relief for vulnerable households in this country, that we did it in a way that didn't add to inflation. That is the advice from Treasury. That is what you'll see if you make it past the glossy in the budget papers, and I suggest you read it. And no doubt we will go through this in estimates. Well, I have had a number of discussions. I, I presume you selectively quote Senator Birmingham with due respect. I have had a number of conversations, and indeed there are a number of opinions in, across, econ, across the economic field, across economists. What a surprise that is. In the ones that I've just had this morning, their view is, it, it, in the worst scenario, it's neutral. That is the assessment of some. 
You choose to uh, selectively quote others. So be it. We're in, we're in a contest here. I understand I thank that. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Rice. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, last night's budget left people in poverty. People who are struggling to survive on mm. Centrelink mm. poverty payments have criticised the budget for leaving them in dire straits, and they've been backed in by organisations like ACOS, the Anti-Poverty Centre, the Tomorrow Movement and the National Union of Students. The Business Council of Australia said this morning that we have to lift JobSeeker to 90 per cent of the age pension over time. Your hand-picked Economic Inclusion Advisory Committee recommended an increase in JobSeeker and other payments more than six times what the government delivered last night. When will you listen to this advice and raise the rate of job seeker and other income support payments to above the poverty line? Thank you, Senator Wright. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President, and I thank Senator Rice for the question. And it's an important question, but I would also say that welcome to the Senate. We have questions here. We're doing too much and we're fueling inflation. And we have <laughs> questions here which are saying you're not doing enough and you should triple or indeed uh, progress it more than that. I mean, I think that makes the point the Treasurer and I have been trying to make for some time is that this, this budget has been balancing up a range of decisions. Senator Rustin based on the economic circumstances of the time. We have high inflation. Our spending has to be calibrated, it has to be careful and it has to be targeted. And so when you look at the work that we've done in just this budget, or even if you attach it to the October budget, to look at what we've been doing, making gradual, and pro gradual progress towards addressing some of the needs uh, that have been left to us by those opposites' failure to deliver, and some of uh, the work that we know needs to be done because we're Labor people. And you'll see that in this budget. You'll see it in the childcare investments. You'll see it in the cheaper medicines. You see it in the Medicare. You see it in the investment in skills. You see it in the growth side of the budget. And you'll see it on the compassion side of the budget in relation to uh, social security and payments. A significant uptick for single parent parenting payments, significant, so only Labor governments an increase to the base rate of job seeker, an increase for the, the most significant increase to Commonwealth rent assistance seen. All of this working together to make sure that for those who do need an extra helping hand, we are giving them an extra helping hand. These have been difficult decisions to land. Some say it's too much, others say it's not enough. But I think you can see the genuineness with the approach that the Albanese government has taken. When we said we would assess payments, we would do what we can to adjust them in every budget, we've been doing that. We've been doing Thank that you, work. Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Rice, first supplementary. Minister, as for your compassion, last night's budget gave people living below the poverty line an increase of just $2.85 a day, which won't even cover the cost of a loaf of bread. But it gave billionaires and politicians almost ten times more, with the stage three tax cuts giving every one of us here $25 a day or $9,000 a year. Why do us politicians need $9,000 a year in tax cuts while job seekers are left on poverty payments? Thank you, Senator Rice. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, President. And I would, again, to Senator Rice, uh, say that the, the cost of living package, which is targeted and was carefully calibrated so as to be affordable and sustainable going forward, not add to inflation, but also see it in the context of a range of other me measures. The energy bill relief, for example, the efforts that we're putting in for cheaper medicines, the efforts we're putting into urgent care centres and bulk billing rates so that people on payments can actually access bulk billing health care. We know that that's a problem. So I don't think you should see one payment in isolation of all of the other work that's been done in this budget. On top of that, we've found $4 billion for the community sector indexation, providing services to people, many of whom are on payments. $4 billion. Do you think that mob would have ever done that? I mean, these are the difficult decisions we've taken. It's carefully calibrated Thank and it's you, the Minister, right thing the to do. The time for answering has expired. Senator Rice, second supplementary. Thanks, President. Um, last night's budget sets out a $4 billion surplus. You can't eat a surplus. 
Why have a surplus when you've still got too many Australians living in tents and cars, <laughs> trying to survive on one meal a day and not able to afford critical medications? Order on my right. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, being in government means you have to do a range of things. One of them is repair the budget. We have to repair the budget so that we can ensure that as needs grow, and we know they are growing, as pressures on the budget increase, we have room to meet those pressures, be it in climate policy, be it in social services, be it in investments in women, be it in investments in housing. All of those pressures are going to have to be met. So we have to get the budget on a better footing. We have also avoided borrowing hundreds of billions of dollars to pay for our services, avoiding interest payments on that debt, which again makes a difference to find room and create room for those people that we want to invest in and for those programs we want to invest in. In terms of this year, when the payments come in, in it, sorry, in the next financial year when the payments come in, there is a deficit. The budget is in deficit in three of the in four of the Ford estimates years. And so budget repair remains a challenge. Finding room to do good things for thank good you, people Minister, is also a priority. Has expired. Senator Marielle Smith. Uh, thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Don Farrell. Oh, sorry, Senator Farrell. <laughs> uh, Minister Farrell, indeed. We Minister, we know that Labor created the welfare system and has been a champion of strengthening Australia's social security safety net. Can the minister outline how the Albanese Labor government is continuing to strengthen the safety net through measures in the budget to support Australians doing it tough? Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, minister Farrell. Thank you. Thank you, President. And can I thank uh, Senator uh, Smith for her uh, question and the great Marielle job Smith. that she's uh, doing for the people of South Australia? And I can answer her question. Um, this government, but particularly that terrific uh, Minister uh, Rishworth, understands that many Australians <laughs> are doing it tough. We know that households are feeling the pinch as a result of cost of living pressures. That's why we set through this budget to address these pressures, providing responsible, targeted relief as the number one priority in our budget. As the Treasurer announced last night, our $14.6 billion cost of living plan includes help with power bills, record investment in uh, Medicare bulk billing and cheaper medicines. We are also increasing working age and student payment rates and Commonwealth rent assistance. These increases are responsible and targeted to help vulnerable people to strengthen the social safety net. Rates of job seeker, youth allowance, partnered parenting payments, Ausstudy, Abstudy, youth disability support pension and special benefits will rise by $40 a fortnight. This will benefit around 1.1 million Australians. We are also expanding eligibility for the existing higher rate of job seeker to single recipients aged 55 and over who have been on income support for nine, months, uh, nine or more continuous months, which currently applies from age 60. We will provide additional support for renters with the largest increase to Commonwealth rent assistance in more than 30 years. Yes, 30 years. Budget will increase the maximum rates of this payment by 15 per cent. Combined, these changes provide additional support to around 2 million people. They provide responsible, balanced support to those who need Thank it you, most. Thank you, Minister Farrell. The time for answering has expired. Senator Smith, first supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and uh, please feel free to call me Marielle. Um, <laughs> we know, Minister, that single parents in our community are doing it really tough. They're doing one of the most challenging but rewarding jobs all on their own, raising their children. How is the Albanese Labor government showing our support for single parents and older Australians by strengthening Australia's social security safety net? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Smith, for your first uh, supplementary question. Uh, and I can answer that question because single parents uh, are the family type most likely to experience financial hardship. It can be tough for these parents, who are overwhelmingly women, to balance caring responsibility and full-time work, studying or looking for work. This doesn't end when the child turns eight. 
With the government's changes announced in the budget, which expand eligibility for single parenting payments to parents with the youngest child under 14, more than 57,000 single parents will be better off by at least $176.90 per fortnight. Similarly, we know that older Australians face barriers uh, when they are looking for work. Our changes expand access to existing uh, higher rates of job seeker for those on payments of nine months or more uh, or those over 55. This acknowledges their circumstances and provides greater financial support while they look for work. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Minister, how will young people benefit through the strengthening of Australia's social security safety net? Minister Parrish. Thank you, uh, President, and thank you, Senator Smith, for that second uh, supplementary question. And I know this is a group of people you have uh, very deep interest uh, in. And our government understands the unique challenge that young Australians are facing, and we want to ensure that young people are set up to succeed. Students and young people will benefit from Labor's changes to payment rates, with 318,000 young people on income support, including those on youth allowance receiving an additional $40 per fortnight. Many students and young people will also benefit from the government's increases to Commonwealth rent assistance. For those who already receive the maximum amount, uh, their payment will increase by 15 per cent, uh, and this is a vast majority of students and young people who receive rent assistance. For example, a 20-year-old student on youth allowance who rents with flatmates and receives the maximum rate can receive more than an additional $55 per fortnight. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, Madam President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Social Services, Senator Farrell. Does the Albanese Labor government acknowledge the fact that many Australian men are victims of domestic and family violence? Minister Farrell. Yes. Uh, Senator Hanson, first supplementary. What actual physical, financial or legal support is the Albanese Labor government providing to men who are victims of domestic and family violence? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Hanson for her, uh, her question. Uh, well, the, uh, the government uh, takes uh, the issue of uh, domestic uh, violence uh, extremely seriously and, uh, of course, uh, as part of uh, all of the things that this uh, government is doing in the, in the uh, social security space, um, we're ensuring that the issue uh, of domestic violence is front of mind and one of those issues which um, uh, ensures that, uh, as a government, we seek to address, uh, address this issue. Um, we don't seek to sweep the issue under the carpet. We acknowledge the seriousness um, of the issue, uh, and uh, in every way that we can, through a range of uh, uh, projects, uh, we seek to try and uh, deal with the issue. Um, it's a serious social issue. It's uh, an issue uh, that affects uh, so many. Oh, sorry, uh, Senator Farrell. Uh, it's time. Um, Senator Hanson. Second supplementary. I didn't ask the question. Maybe you could answer this one. Statistics show that while a woman dies every six days due to domestic homicide in Australia, a man dies every eight days due to domestic homicide, with the main perpetrators being women. This week's budget includes an additional $326.7 million for women's safety, but none for men. Why is the Albanese Labor government not providing support and funding to adult male victims of domestic and family violence when men make up 25 per cent of all domestic violence victims? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator Hanson. I thought I answered your first question very, very directly. I don't know if I could have answered it uh, any more directly, more directly than, uh, uh, than I did. Um, Look, the re re reality of the circumstances, and unfortunately, is that uh, women um, are for uh, w women and children are far more likely um, to be victims of do domestic uh, violence. Even the figures that you've just uh, read out to me um, demonstrate that uh, that fact. Um, um, look, 
We don't support domestic violence, whether it's against a man or a woman or a child. Um, and we seek to address that serious um, social and community issue by um, injecting funds into those um, communities to try and resolve and reduce the level of domestic— Thank you, Minister. Uh, the time for answering has expired. Senator Macdonald. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, what is the contribution made by, the Australia, by Australia's resources sector, including coal and gas, to the budget bottom line? How much revenue does it contribute? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, I don't have the exact figures at my fingertips, but it is a significant contributor through company tax and through uh, other taxation arrangements. Um, I don't think anyone's pretending otherwise. Um, and in terms of the revenue upgrades uh, that we've seen and the very welcome revenue upgrades that we've seen to the uh, budget, of which uh, 87 per cent across the uh, last two budgets have been returned for budget repair, of, of that, um, around uh, 20 per cent is related uh, to the strong uh, prices that we're getting for commodities. Uh, I would say the other parts where there is significant contribution to the upward revision in revenue is because of the strong labour market, the low unemployment rate, the fact that more people are in jobs, which is absolutely fantastic, and that we're seeing for the first time in a decade the beginnings of some solid wages growth. Um, we've overturned the policy that the former government had of wage stagnation, um, determined and deliberate wage stagnation. Uh, and we are seeing for the first time uh, good sustainable wages growth, which is good for working people in this country. Um, we expect Order. in that yes, we'll see real wages growth. We'll see real Order. wages growth as, as foreshadowed uh, in the Minister budget Gallagher, paper, and that is contributing Minister to the Gallagher, revenue upgrades. Resume your seat. Order on my left. You have one of your senators on her feet, Senator Macdonald. Uh, just on relevance, perhaps the minister could take my question on notice if she doesn't have the answer. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Um, well, Minister Gallagher. Uh, well, I said that I didn't have the number for him. More than happy to find the exact number of how we break down uh, the receipts from company tax. Essentially, is what you're asking me to do to break it down into a subset of a particular industry. I'm happy to do that and come back to the chamber. The point I'm making, though, is that whilst uh, that is a contributor to the revenue improvements that we're seeing in the budget, and we, are, we welcome that, that there are other factors at play here. One is the fact that we are strongly uh, handling the economy and that we've got low, low um, unemployment and strong wages growth, which is also relevant Thank to you, the Minister budget Gallagher, bottom line. The time for answering has expired. Are you on your feet for first supplementary? Thank you. Minister, to what extent is the government relying on the continued success of Australia's resource sector, including coal and gas, to fund the additional spending in the budget? How much revenue do you assess is being generated by iron ore, by coal, by gas and by other parts of the mining sector? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister. Uh, well, it, makes a, it, it certainly makes a significant contribution uh, to to receipts, but I, I don't think anyone has ever said otherwise. I don't think anyone has ever said otherwise. I mean, it was the same under the former government as it is under us. Uh, we've outlined some proposed changes around PRRT going forward, but we haven't made we haven't changed any of the uh, revenue. Uh, arrangements uh, that operated under the former government in relation to um, taxation of, of those companies that you talk about. Um, and I hope that with PRRT that we would have your support for those changes when they come through this. Oh. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister. Senator Davey. Macdonald. Macdonald, sorry. That's right. Uh, again, on relevance, uh, if you don't have the answer here in the chamber, could I ask that you bring the specifics back, uh, please? Senator, uh, Senator Macdonald, the minister is being relevant. Thank you. Minister Gallagher. Not a point of order, exactly. Um, and I hope that when we bring the sensible, modest changes to PRRT that we've worked on um, together with the companies, with the relevant companies, that we would have the, the support of the opposition uh, in Minister making Gallagher, sure that those changes get through. Minister, uh, Senator Macdonald. Thank you. Relevance. 
the specifics to my question, uh, please? Will the minister bring them back to the chamber? Uh, Senator Macdonald, you were on your feet a little few minutes beforehand, and I said I believe the minister was being relevant to the question. I believe the minister is still being relevant, and I'll listen carefully to the remainder of her answer. Minister Gallagher. Uh, the senator asked what contribution those companies make. I said it was significant. I've answered the question. Um, Senator Macdonald, second supplementary. Minister, will you thank coal and gas communities in regional Australia whose success is providing over a million direct and indirect jobs, billions in taxes and royalties, and propping up Australia's economy? Will your government commit to supporting these industries rather than penalising them? Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Minister Gallagher. Um, well, I don't. I'm not trying to be negative, but um, you know we don't usually go around thanking people for abiding by the law. Um, you know, well, well, the budget uh, the budget relies on a whole range of, of um, revenue measures, uh, a whole range of re revenue measures across the board. I am very happy to thank across the board every part of the economy that That's contributes right. to uh, generating revenue that allows us to provide the services that we need to the Australian people. Uh, Very Minister happy Gallagher, to do that. Please resume your seat. Order. Minister, please continue. Um, well, I think I've answered the question. In terms of all the revenue that comes to the budget, I am deeply thankful as the Finance Minister. I can tell you, if we didn't have that revenue, then we would be in a very difficult position uh, about Minister ensuring we are funding please sir. resume your seat. Senator Macdonald. Just on relevance, I'm wondering if you can say coal and gas. Uh, uh, Senator Macdonald, that's not the minister. Order on my order. Senator Watt. Senator Watt. Senator Watt, I am addressing a point of order. The minister is being relevant. Senator Macdonald, Minister, please, as Minister, please continue. Pleaded my answer, and I know what the game Senator Macdonald's trying to play and being divisive because it's a common tactic. I have already acknowledged the significant contribution that those industries play in generating revenue for the budget. I have done that, Senator Macdonald. I hope it makes you happy. Thank you, Minister. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Watt. We are in a black deaths in custody crisis in this country. The Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody recommendations clearly outline the importance of Aboriginal legal services and the need for adequate funding for those as per recommendations 226G and 234. Instead, First Nations legal services are breaking under the demand they face, and some have had to shut down to cut their services due to underfunding. My question is, why aren't you funding Aboriginal legal services? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Thorpe, uh, for this important question. I guess the short answer, Senator Thorpe, is that we are funding Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services, and that's because we recognise the importance of funding those legal services as Aboriginal community controlled providers of culturally appropriate legal assistance services. Um, and as I think you're aware, the Attorney General himself has very extensive experience, including in his pre-parliament career in working with those legal services. So I know that he's a strong believer in them. Uh, in terms of the funding that we're providing, we are of course continuing funding that already existed under the National Legal Assi Assistance Partnership, uh, which lasts until 2025. Over the life of that agreement, that partnership provides over $440 million over five years in baseline funding for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services. Additionally, those legal services also receive over $11 million over five years in quarantined funding for the Justice Policy Partnership and expensive complex cases and coronial inquiries funding. Uh, there's additional funding that we're continuing outside of that partnership, uh, through, particularly through the National Indigenous Australians Agency, uh, which will, is providing over $48 million uh, to legal services over a five-year period. And in fact, our last budget in October uh, provided additional funding, $13.5 million over three years from 2022-23, in additional funding to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, legal services, 
to provide culturally appropriate legal assistance for coronial processes and $1 million over three years from 2022-23 to build capacity and support leadership uh, of the peak body uh, for those legal services. But we recognise that there, are, there are remain serious issues here, and it has been concerning to hear about service delivery freezes and closures across some of these legal services. Uh, and perhaps I can provide a bit more information about what we're doing on that front following your next question. Thank you, Senator. What, uh, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. Thank you for your response, Minister. The government claims to be closing the gap, but incarceration rates are going up. Without legal support, it is certain many more of our people will be locked up. Why does your government want to lock more of our people up, which will inevitably lead to more deaths in custody? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Um, thanks, Senator Thorpe. And I think that is an unfair uh, suggestion to make of the government, a government that is deeply committed to reducing Indigenous incarceration uh, and deeply committed to closing the gap, including uh, making sure that we have a voice to parliament to allow and pr permit, uh, provide uh, First Nations people with an opportunity uh, to provide their views to this parliament about these matters. Now, as I've said, uh, the Attorney General has been meeting with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services for some time, and in those meetings, he's heard directly about the positive impact that those legal services can have on Aboriginal people's lives, their families, and communities. As I say, we have been concerned to hear about service delivery freezes and closures across these services. And we understand that funding for the services much ma must match the high demand for services, both legal and non-legal. That's why we've commenced an independent review of the National Legal Assistance Partnership, which provides the bulk of these legal services funding. That will start shortly and be completed by the end Thank of the you, year. Minister, the time for answering has expired. Senator Thorpe, second supplementary. Thanks, President. The budget contains some funding for family violence prevention services for First Nations survivors of family, domestic and sexual violence. Minister, how much of this funding will actually go to Aboriginal legal services? Thank you, and Senator. I did give you the heads up on this one. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. I wasn't going to reveal that you'd given us the heads up, uh, but, uh, but, but thank you for doing so. I appreciate the opportunity to provide you with a, uh, a decent answer, and I invite the opposition to give us a heads up about any questions as well so that we can provide you with full and frank advice as well. Um, that, look, these are serious issues, obviously, Senator Thorpe, and uh, as I was saying, um, on the legal services matter, uh, a review of the funding arrangements will start shortly and be completed by the end of the year. That will include an assessment of unmet legal need and demand for disadvantaged groups across regional, rural and remote Australia. And I have no doubt that it will look at some of the issues that you've been raising, including in relation to family and domestic violence. The review will also specifically look at options for alternative funding arrangements for these legal services. The Attorney General's Department is working closely with states and territories to support the continued provision of frontline services to First Nations people, uh, and I know the Attorney General is personally Minister, committed to this. Resume your seat, Sen uh, Senator Thorpe. Thanks, President, the question was how much of the family violence money goes to Aboriginal legal services. That was announced last night. So how much of that is going to Aboriginal legal services? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. I'll direct the minister to that part of your question. Minister. Um, I'm, I'm happy to come back on notice with the specific answer to that question, but uh, the Family Violence Prevention Legal Services uh, in the Northern Territory also provide an important role, and we want to make Thank sure you, that minister they're adequately funded. The time for uh, answering has expired. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, President. I'm really excited to be asking my question today. Really excited. And I'm excited because I'm the first senator to ask the Minister for Agriculture about a question on Australia's agriculture industry. Minister, I've learned that Australia has never had sustainable and predictable biosecurity funding. And last night's budget marked a historic moment for Australia's agriculture industry. Order. With the Albanese government delivering. Uh, Senator Coney, please resume your seat. Order on my left. I can barely hear the question. Minister, uh, Senator Coney, please continue. That's all right, President. Thank you. The excitement. Uh, I can't hold myself. But as I was saying, last night, the Albanese Labor government marked a historic moment. It was the first time that the government is investing in our agriculture industry, delivering sustainable funding for biosecurity. So, Minister, could you please explain to the Senate how the budget delivers on the government's election commitment to provide sustainable long-term funding to biosecurity to protect our $90 billion 
agriculture, fisheries and forestry industries. I thank you, Senator Giacconi. Minister Watt. Well, Senator Giacconi, the only thing that I think tops the level of excitement you've got in asking that question is my excitement in answering this question. And it is good to get a question from a senator about agriculture. It would appear the National Party have completely vacated the field. Well, this morning a new, dawn, dawn, a new era dawned for Australian agriculture. For the first time ever, Australia has a sustainable biosecurity funding model. This will be a lasting Labor legacy of the Albanese government in the agriculture, fisheries and forestry portfolio, something that not one, not two, not three or recycled agriculture ministers from the National Party was ever able to achieve. The Albanese government is locking in higher, ongoing and more predictable biosecurity funding from year to year. Order. We have drawn a line under years of stopgap temporary funding from coalition governments that put our agriculture industry at risk. This decision of the Albanese government in last night's budget will result in more than $1 billion of additional funding for biosecurity, including $845 million to support biosecurity operations across the country, protecting our valuable agricultural industries. And isn't it good that at last we've got a Labor government standing up for our agriculture sector and biosecurity, rather than the mess we inherited from the other side? Now, in how will we pay for this? This is a good question. Importers will contribute about 48 per cent of the total cost through their clearance costs, with increased fees and charges expected to take their total contribution to biosecurity costs to almost $390 million from next year. And this in includes expanded cost recovery to include the biosecurity clearance costs of parcels and non-letter mail. Now we know that the other side didn't want to pass on the cost of these services to industry, and that's why they were on the verge of bankrupting the Department of Agriculture and Wilty until we took charge. Taxpayers will contribute about 44 per cent of the total funding, about $350 million, and we'll also introduce a modest new biosecurity protection levy on agricultural uh, producers, you, it, which will see them contribute 6 per cent. Minister, the time for answering has expired. Senator Giacconi, first supplementary. Thank you very much, President. Minister, thank you very much for that answer. Uh, as we know, sadly, that this government had to fund the department, uh, otherwise it would have been defunded. But could you please um, explain to the Senate why is it important that all beneficiaries of a strong biosecurity system need to contribute to funding the certainty for that system in order to make sure that our farmers have certainty in the long term? Minister Watt. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. I'd, I'd be delighted to do so. Now, as I say, biosecurity is a shared responsibility, and what that means under our new, new funding system is that importers will contribute about 48 per cent of the total cost of biosecurity, uh, taxpayers will contribute about 44 per cent, with producers being asked to pay a modest 6 per cent of the cost of biosecurity protections that will stop them from having devastating diseases that will destroy their crops and destroy their livelihoods. Now, as we know, we are not the only people who think that biosecurity is a shared responsibility. And I note that this view attracted support in the consultation process we undertook last year. The Cattle Council of Australia, as it was known at the time, said that biosecurity is a shared responsibility and for our biosecurity measures to be most effective, all parties must contribute. In fact, the National Farmers Federation said that biosecurity is a shared responsibility and, as such, all biosecurity beneficiaries, including the community, the economy at large, the agricultural sector and the environment, should invest in biosecurity activities. Thank we you, will Minister finally Watt. have sustainable biosecurity funding. Thank you, President. Uh, it is great. Thank you, Senator Stirl. The Australian community and farmers benefit so much from our favourable biosecurity status. Minister, what are the benefits for our agriculture, fisheries and forestry industries of a sustainable funding model? Minister Watt. Thank you again, Senator Giacconi. Well, our landmark sustainable funding model for biosecurity will provide certainty and security for the Australian agricultural industry. It is a landmark and it is historic because it never happened once under the 10 years of coalition government. But you don't have to take my word for it. Today I see the Australian Food and Produce Alliance have said that the additional funding is welcome and will strengthen Australia's biosecurity to help ensure our nation is better protected. In contrast, the Liberal and National parties had nine long years but did nothing nothing to secure permanent, sustainable, long-term funding for biosecurity. But their incompetence on these matters went beyond that. 
a conga line of incompetent and economically illiterate National Party agricultural ministers left us with funding cliffs in vital frontline areas that would have seen biosecurity funding fall by nearly 20 per cent this year if we hadn't acted. They failed to maintain the integrity of cost recovery. They said they'd introduce a container levy. They backed down under pressure, and then they went out to send out the department to explain it. And let's not forget about Ruby Princess and all the other biosecurity uh, disasters you, under that lot. The time for answering has expired, Senator Cash. Uh, you. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Gallagher. Minister, middle-class families with surging mortgage payments, surging grocery bills, and energy costs have little to celebrate in last night's budget. Labor's budget confirms cost of living continues to go up, gas and electricity bills continue to skyrocket, real wages have not grown, inflation remains stubbornly high, unemployment will rise and Australians will pay higher taxes. Given that under Labor's budget a family with kids will be around $25,000 worse off, why is Labor making life harder for middle class Australians? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, President. And I thank the, uh, Senator Cash for the question, and I reject. Uh, I, I completely reject the numbers that she has outlined. Uh, Minister, Minister, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Stirl and Senator Cash, interjections across the chamber are disorderly. Minister Gallagher. Oh, thank you. I think. I think the. Um, I think the opposition has had to dust off their dodgy calculator that they used to put budgets together in the past to come up with this set of numbers that they keep shouting across the chamber. This budget is a very strong budget for all Australians, for all Australians, and we don't seek to divide as you do. We don't seek Senator to carve Cash. up the country in a series of demographics and different Senator age Hume. groups and different income groups. We make decisions on what is right for the country based on the economic circumstances of the time. That is why the cost of living package is targeted. But here are some things in the budget that you didn't take into account. Fastest wage growth since 2009. Real wages growing. Historic boost for wages for aged Order. care workers. How about that? What about the low unemployment? More people earning more in more uh, Minister, jobs. Minister Gallagher, more please jobs. resume your seat. Minister, please resume your seat. Minister, Minister, please resume your seat. Order, Pen Senator Wong. Again, particularly the interjections and the disorder on my left but and on my right is disorderly. The minister is entitled to answer, to have her answers heard in silence. I would ask the interjections cease. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. Building more homes. What about that? What about what about some of the build to rent? What about the programs that we're doing there? For the first time in a decade, the Commonwealth engaged on housing Minister policy. Gala Shock Minister horror. Gallagher, please resume your seat. I just called the chamber to order, and the minute the minister got onto her feet again, the disorder continued. I, Senator Rustin, Minister Gallagher, please continue. <laughs> Minister, I'm not a true Goldilocks. <laughs> Please continue. <laughs> Rustin. Minister Gallagher, I've, I've asked you to yeah. continue. Yeah. Order. <laughs> Order. Minister Gallagher, I've invited you twice to continue. Uh, thank you very much. The work that we put in place, caps on the uh, putting caps in, on energy prices that you voted against. Look at what that says in the budget paper. A 25 per cent reduction in what people will spend on their energy bills, on their electricity bills. Order. And you voted against Order. it. What about the jobs to be generated in the energy transition, net zero economy, the investments we're making uh, to drive those opportunities? Uh, what about Gallagher. them? You voted no Minister to those Gallagher, as well. Please. Order again. There are many opportunities across this week for senators to have a say on the budget or any other matter. Question time is not one of them, unless you are one of the people that's asking the question. Minister Gallagher. Thank you, 
Thank you. We'll have our investments in childcare start on the 1st of July, again helping households across Australia. There are a number of measures in this budget Thank you, that are targeted Time to help middle expired. Senator Cash, first supplementary. Thank you. On the Today Show this morning, Corey from Perth, a mortgage holder with a family, had this message for the Prime Minister regarding last night's budget. The government's not listening. They're not caring. They don't. And this budget proves that they don't care if you work. We're just going to slog you harder, and that's the way they want it. Again, given that under Labor's budget, a family with kids will be around $25,000 worse, why is Labor making it harder for Australians like Corey? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Uh, well, I haven't had the opportunity to speak with Corey, and I didn't, I didn't hear what he said on the Today Show. Uh, but I am happy to go through, as I have in the previous answer, our investments in childcare will go and help people on middle incomes. In fact, I think we've been criticised by the fact that it's going to people on what you see as two higher incomes. Our investments in TAFE, our investments in the new, uh, the net zero economy, all of those driving jobs, putting the budget Order. on a more sustainable uh, footing, borrowing please. less Minister. debt, paying less. Minister, please resume your seat. Order on my left. Minister Gallagher, please continue. The extensions to paid parental leave. I could go on. The energy efficiency fund that's going to be established under Jenny McAllister's leadership. Uh, Minister Gallagher, please uh, resume your seat. Minister Wong. It's a robust contest, but this answer has not yet had any period without interjections. Not one. Oh, I've left it a long time. I, am I have left it a long time. I would ask you order. to call them to order. order. And again. Order. And again. There is. Sorry, Mum. This uh, is Senator what you're going to treat women. Senator really. Oh. Sorry, Mum. Order. Order on my left. Senator McGrath. Order. Order. Senators Cash, McGrath. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Order across the chamber. Senator Wong. Senator, Wo Senator McKenzie. Senator Wong. Sen Senator Cash. Order on my left. Order. Order. Senator Stirl. Senator Rustin, I am going to ask you to withdraw. To the chamber, I withdraw. Thank you. The chamber has been disorderly. I appreciate people have questions to ask, Minister Senator Wong. But when a question is asked, we are all entitled to hear the answer, and I'm asking for order in this chamber to be respectful of one another. Minister Gallagher. Thank you. So, uh, President, on wages growth, on jobs growth on uh, the budget repair strategy that we've put in place to ensure that we're borrowing less money and paying less interest on that, on that debt is all part of the approach that we've taken to this budget. That benefits all Australians. The tripling the bulk billing rate benefits all Australians, making Thank sure the Minister, investments the in Medicare work for expired. everybody. Senator Cash, second supplementary. Sydney Radio this morning, another working Australian, had this message regarding Labor's budget. So once again, the workers who carry this country get screwed over. My wages have been going in one direction, backwards. Jim Chalmers Order. has no clue of the day-to-day -day reality. We're under the pump, Senator, we work, Order. we pay full taxes, and we get nothing. Senator again. Wong. Order. Just a moment, Senator Birmingham. I will come back to you. I want to deal with other things first. Senator McKenzie, you were out of order. Senator Birmingham. President, a point of order in relation to interjections. You just had <laughs> Senator Wong, yes. in answer to the previous question or during the previous answer, yes. uh, provide a commentary of concern about continuous interjections. We've seen nothing but continuous interjections 
during the bulk of the 23 seconds that Senator Cash has been attempting to ask this question, coming directly from Senator Wong. Uh, Senator Birmingham. Order. I am more than willing to pull up individual senators for their behaviour, and you would have heard that I did call Senator Wong to order before you, you stood. I appreciate your point of order, but I would reiterate that there have been many interjections today, many points of disorder. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. That I would reiterate, there have been many interjections today from a range of senators. I take the point on Senator Wong. I called Senator Wong to order. I would expect, when Senator Cash finishes her question, that all senators in this place will listen to the answer in respectful silence. Senator Cash, I'm going to ask you to start your question again, and I don't want to hear any interjections. Senator Cash. On Sydney Radio this morning, another working Australian had this message regarding Labor's budget. So once again, the workers who carry this country get screwed over. My wages have been going in one direction, backwards. Jim Chalmers has no clue of the day-to-day -day reality. We're under the pump, we work, we pay full taxes and get nothing. Again, why is Labor making life harder for middle-class Australians? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Gallagher. Well, I don't accept uh, that question at all. Um, I, don't, I don't accept it, and I think if people see the budget in its entirety— uh, Senator Gallagher, please resume your question. Why won't resume you let Goldilocks seat. answer? I have just asked the Senate to listen in respectful silence. Senator Cash was able to ask her question in respectful silence. I'm now asking all of you in here to listen to the answer, whether you agree with it or not, to listen to it in respectful silence. Minister, please continue. Uh, thank you. And, and uh, Senator Cash's question included a reference uh, to uh, the young man's uh, wages and how he'd been feeling the pinch on wages. We agree. That's why the industrial relations changes we put through this parliament, more jobs, better pay. You opposed it. You opposed it. You opposed improvements to the industrial relations system that would allow workers to get a better crack at wage opportunities through the bargaining system. You've opposed our position on arguing for wages growth on the minimum wage through our minimum wage cases. You didn't make the commitment to fund the aged care workers' wage claim—15 per cent in this budget, found room for it, on top of all the other things we had to do. We're absolutely determined to get wages moving, and this budget shows that they are, they, we will have real wages growth Thank faster you, than had the previously been expected. Senator Thank you, President. I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. In uh, question time on the 28th of March 2023, I took questions asked by me from uh, Senator uh, Smith, that's Senator Dean Smith, on notice in my capacity on that day as Minister representing the Prime Minister, relating to further information regarding the breakdown of expenditure on franking credits. I have now written to Senator Smith, Smith to provide additional information, and I table my letter to uh, Senator Smith for the information of all senators. Thank you, Senator. Senator Scar. Mr Deputy President, I rise to take note of all uh, questions asked by coalition senators of, of government ministers and take note of the answers to all of those questions. What we saw last night was a typical big spending, big taxing Labor, Labor budget. That's what we saw last night. Big spending, big taxing. It's expansionary in terms of the spending measures which were undertaken. It's also stimulatory. And there is an incoherence, an incoherence at the heart of the budget strategy that was put up by the federal government last night. On the one hand, they acknowledge that inflation is an issue. There's a cost of living crisis in this, in this country. We've got the RBA lifting interest rates on numerous occasions, impacting average families across the whole of Australia. But then, on the other hand, they deliver a budget last night where the fiscal strategy is not in keeping with, is not complementary to, is not consistent with the monetary strategy being 
adopted by the Reserve Bank of Australia. And that goes to the heart of the issue that the Australian economy is facing at the moment. And it is not just Senator Scar saying this. Many of Australia's leading economists are pointing this fact out and are saying that last night's budget, last night's budget will provide a basis for the Reserve Bank of Australia to increase interest rates yet again. Last night's budget, there will be a direct line, a direct line between future interest rate increases and the budget that was delivered by the government last night. And it's not just me saying that. Let me quote from some of Australia's leading economists. Chris Richardson, who's probably the most, one of the most well-known economists to the Australian pub public, I quote, direct quote, I had thought that the Reserve Bank was done and dusted, but this has notably, this being the budget, this has notably raised the chance that they will do another swing of the baseball bat. End quote. That's from Chris Richardson, one of Australia's leading economists, saying the budget last night, the budget last night, will increase the chance that the Reserve Bank of Australia takes another swing of the baseball bat, which means higher interest rates, higher mortgage payments. And that goes to the heart of Senator Cash's question, which said, if you compare, you compare the prosperity of an average Australian family before the last federal election to today, that average Australian family, mum, dad, two kids, that average Australian family is $25,000 a year worse off. $25,000 a year worse off. Why? Because of mortgage rate increases, inflation increases, 7 per cent inflation, electricity power bills going up. $25,000 worse off. Let me quote from Standard & Poor's Global Ratings. Again, this isn't, this isn't a politician saying this. These are actual participants in the market who are making decisions every day with respect to interest rates. And this is what SP Global Ratings said in their press release in relation to the budget. Quote, Further, we expect inflation to be stubbornly higher than the Reserve Bank of Australia's target until fiscal 2026. Handouts in today's budget may add to inflationary pressures. End quote. That's Standard and Poor's, drawing a direct link, drawing a direct link between last night's budget and future interest rate increases and inflation. Andrew Boak, Goldman Sachs chief economist, again someone who engages in the markets. That's their profession. That's their expertise. They live and die by how well they engage with the markets in relation to issues like this. What does he say? Quote, we assess the budget's near-term boost to household incomes to have an incrementally hawkish read-through for monetary policy. That means it's going up. It's going up. Interest rates going up. That's what that means. Quote, more tightening being required. That means interest rates going up and potentially as soon as next month's board meeting. End quote. So just when Australian households, just when Australians who've gone out and borrowed money to buy that key asset, key asset in their family's prosperity, the centrepiece of that family's prosperity, their family home, interest rates going up again. That's what we're going to see as a result of last night's budget. David Bassiz, who's a chief economist for Beta Shares, described the budget as, I quote, unambiguously expansionary. The he was quoted in the Australian newspaper today as saying the budget consisted of, and I quote, smoke and mirrors, end quote. That's what the chief economist of Beta shares, how he described the budget. Robert Gottliebson, there is a risk that a shocked reserve bank will not cut interest rates and may even be forced to raise them. The blame will sit squarely on the government. Senator Stirl. Deputy President, um, look, I want to raise to make my contribution today, but for all those Australians sitting out there listening, I mean, really, you have to be in here to understand, understand some of the absurdity and some of the craziness that goes on. And it's alive and well on that side. And, but I will say this, Mr Deputy President, through you, there are some very smart cookies on that side. I counted three of them today, and you're one of them. And uh, seriously, you know your stuff, but I can tell you how you can tell the smart ones. They're the ones that aren't interjecting. They're the ones that aren't saying anything. They're the ones that know, in all the nine years that we've just gone through, of the uh, irresponsible 
fiscal attitude that was taken, particularly in the last term, by Mr Frydenberg and Mr Morrison. And we know for, for a fact, I mean, even in the infrastructure area, millions, billions, billions and billions of dollars announced for infrastructure, knowing damn well that they didn't have the money to pay for it, knowing damn well that we didn't have the contractors to do it, knowing damn well there wasn't the tradies to carry out that work. Exactly. And it's quite embarrassing, because I can say this with my hand on my heart, as of some of the smarter ones over that side, the three I've, I've identified, well, one and the other two will keep a secret. One's walking out now, so it leaves one more. But I've got to say this. It's basic, fundamental fiscal management. You can't spend what you don't have. You can go out and borrow money. And, and we were all brought up in this nation by our parents to start saving, go to work, put your boots on, get out of bed, get a car, pay your board, pay off your car, put some money aside to try and get a mortgage. And that's how we learnt to deal with debt. And we were taught by our parents, debt is something that we'd rather not have, but, but responsible debt or good debt if it puts a roof over your head or buys you a car is nothing to fear. But when you get the situation where the incompetence of the Morrison government and Frydenberg in particular, and have that lot screaming that we're not spending enough or we're spending too much. They can't quite get their story exactly. right. This is the embarrassing bit. Depends who you speak to. When you go down to the, the, the corner, down the bottom of the garden path here to the concrete gnomes, it gets even crazier because, you see, I can deal with money. I understand. When Fiona and I started our own little trucking business, we understood that every single cent... Am I keeping your wakes in the bag? Oh, that's all right. Okay, good. But I could just about call you number three, just about. But let me tell you, when we had to spend the money, it was our money. And if we didn't have the money, we had to make the decision: do we go to the bank to get a loan to buy a new truck, or do we go to the bank to get a loan to repair the diff that just blew up, or the or the engine? And then we had to work out what was in the bank that we did have, and we had to pay it off. And it just amazes me. I can't. I can't even comprehend the pre-selection processes from that side of the chamber. I really don't. I don't get it. I really can't because some of you, some of you, have never been in the real world. Some of you are very good at telling people how to spend other people's money. And when you sit and listen to the interjections coming from that side, I really do scratch my head. I'm all for interjections when they're witty and they're, they're intelligent. But some of the stupidity comes out of this side. How some of them on that side, Mr Deputy President, can even open their mouths to start screaming abuse of us trying to manage the mess that they left us. A trillion dollars of debt. And already, and let's not forget the mugs, the black mugs with the back in black, and there's a few of them still, got, they've got them hidden in their offices. And, and after our second budget, within seven months, and all Hats off to the, to the Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, and the uh, uh, Treasurer, Mr Chalmers, to deliver a $4 billion surplus in our second budget in seven months. But quite clearly being responsible, of course we'd like to hand out more money, but we've got to pay off the debt. Now, seriously, and I do have to apologise to some of the poor people that may have been in the gallery listening to the, to the carry-on today, and it does really make you wonder. I know there's tension within the LNP. I know the LNP really are battling with y your mates in, as the other half of the no alition in the Nats. And I know I'm not deaf. They're not painted on. I hear the conversations because I know you all still blame them for bringing down your government. I all still, also, you know, whatever the deal was done with Mr Joyce and Mr Morrison, God only knows, love to know, but look at the results left you. I know you're divided. I know that you can't stand the side of each other sometimes. And I know in my heart of hearts there are a number over, over there who understand business, who actually understand fiscal responsibility and actually understand if you're going to start spending money, you've got to have it in the bank. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Chair. This country was built by the battlers, and it belongs to the battlers. And last night there was nothing in the budget for the battlers. The working class Australians didn't get an income tax cut. Now, the one thing that the coalition did when it was in government was always gave a low to uh, middle income tax offset to the lower working class people of Australia. It, was co it cost the budget $11 billion a year. We could have went back to surplus earlier than we could have, 
but we did the right thing by the battlers. We did the right thing by the battlers. We didn't get caught up on honouring the gods of the foreign banks, oh, we've got to pay back their debt. No, 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 no. No, that's not the way the world works. The way the world works is that we keep the battlers and we keep their head above the, wa uh, above the water. We don't want them drowning. Because what this party is doing, what the Albanese government is doing, is that they are out of control on immigration. Last year's budget forecast 235,000 people to come into this country in this financial year. We've got 400,000 people coming in. And what's that doing? We've got a housing crisis and a rental crisis in this country. I'll tell you what that's doing. Is that's kicking Aussie battlers out on the street. They're living in the backs of cars. They're living in the old panel vans. You know, who can forget the old 70s saying, don't come and knock if this trucks are, uh, vans are rocking. Well, I'll tell you what, that spirit doesn't live on anymore. Well, it kind of does, but the van's not rocking that much because they're just freezing out there. Imagine living in a panel van in Canberra in this cold weather. That is not easy. That is not easy. And yet, and yet, sorry, Senator Stirl, you, I, I know, I know, you just got your head down there. I know you zipped up there. Um, it's all good. It's all good. Um, I, I can tell you, I can tell, I can tell you that we are never, we are never, should never turn your back on the battlers. Never turn your back on the battlers. And we know that. And what else are we doing? Now, we've got an energy policy from this side, the other side. They're basically importing foreign renewables at the expense of our coal miners and gas workers in Australia. I mean, these guys, the reason why that these guys are back in budget, apart from massive immigration, is that we've had windfall profits from coal and gas companies that are luckily keeping our head above the water. And what do these guys want to do? They want to destroy those industries. They want to destroy those industries. Now, Senator O'Neill here, she's from near the Hunter Valley herself. And what's she doing? She's trying. Well, it's close enough. It's close enough. It's cl I do know. I used to go mountain biking up at a Rimba and a Wabba. I know those areas. I know those areas like the back of my hand because I used to have to ride the tracks. I used to race up there. And uh, let me tell you that the Labor Party has turned its back on the coal miners, the blue collar workers, the blue collar workers in this country. And I haven't. I haven't. I'm an openly avowed protectionist. I'm here to protect this country. I'm here to protect the workers and our families. And I can tell you what, when mum and dad come home from work tonight, there is nothing in the jar for them. Nothing. Nothing. And what about the cost of living? What about rents? What are we going to do? How on earth are you going to find houses for all these immigrants that you've got coming in? And OK, if they're moving out to the regions, I can live with that. If they're doing what, you know, building dams and adding more water and irrigation and food to the to the um, supply side of the economy, that's all good. But when they're just going to university and these universities are collecting lots of revenue, and then un as per Section 5050 of the 97 Tax Act, they don't have to pay any tax on that. Why is it these universities don't have to pay tax on foreign students? They add to the demand side of the economy. So why aren't we actually making the universities in these inner, inner city elite academics pay tax on the increased supply, on the increased demand. I mean, we've got this enormous demand in infrastructure, and by all means, you know, if you want to go to Central Queensland University, where I was a couple of weeks ago, and go to the School of Mining and the School of Manufacturing, and go do a TAFE degree, where you actually get some real life skills, and not one of these inner city unis where you just get brainwashed with all these new crazy ideas, that's fine. But don't come in here, don't bring people in here, if all they're going to do is go to uni, and then go and work with Uber and deliver ice cream to people who can't be bothered buying you know, ice cream from supermarkets. That's not on. So this budget isn't going to do anything for the working class Australians. Senator O'Neill. Hey, thank you very much, Deputy President. And um, after that contribution, you know, I am aware of the literary form of stream of consciousness, and it's got its place in literature. But what we just heard from Senator Rennick, despite the fact he's an elected senator, was just a riff on nothing that made sense to anybody who has any vision for this country. It was just a rant of dissent 
and idiocy, in my view. It didn't speak to anything truthful. And that's really the story of today. Yesterday we had a budget, a very important budget. And it's delivered after nine years, nine long dark years, of government by the Liberal National Party, who purport to be the party that is good with the finance. Well, let's just get the facts on the record. Nine years, and in that period of time, they never delivered a surplus. Despite all their crowing, despite all their assertions, the facts tell the truth. They just didn't do it. And, and it's that, that knowledge that we need to apply to the comments that have been put forward today. And my colleague, Senator Gallagher, in response to questions uh, from Senator Cash, just completely reduced to nothingness this absurd claim, absurd claim that's done on a dodgy, broken calculator that somehow the budget that's going to deliver incredible relief to families is going to cost people $25,000. Those figures are as dodgy as the Liberal government's claims that they would ever deliver a surplus. There is no coherence. There is the myth that they create and there is the reality of what they deliver, which was an Australia that was in pretty bad shape, an Australia that was anxious, an Australia where businesses couldn't figure out what was going to come at them any day. People are telling me now that there is sort of a post-traumatic response to what they experienced of nine years of chaos under Liberal National Party government. Three leaders, never a surplus in sight, a billion dollars in debt and permanent panic every day, wondering what the next disaster was that they were going to talk about, the fearful nature of what they created for Australia. And that is what we saw in the questions today. The first question was hysterical. The second one was, be afraid. Be very afraid of the Australian Labor Party's budget. You know, it's going to be bad for you. At odds with the fact that this is a budget that is responsibly looking to the future, investing in Australians, give, building our capacity, making sure that those alongside us who are doing it a bit tough get a little bit of a hand up because that's what they need today, and dealing with the debt that we have because of those bad economic managers on the other side. The third question from Senator Macdonald really revealed what they try to do. I'm standing up for the miners, she says. You need to say thank you to the miners for the money that they put in in tax. Of course we say thank you to the miners for the money that they put in tax. 20 per cent. I also say thank you to the part-time worker at Woolworths or Coles who paid their tax. All the workers of Australia who lifted the revenues of this country since we've come to government by 40 per cent because their wages are going up and there are more jobs and more Australians are working and they're paying more tax that we can then use to invest in our own country. That's what's really going on. I say thank you to every Australian business owner, every Australian worker in every sector. Thank you for doing your bit. And we will responsibly, very responsibly, manage the money that you entrust to this government in your name to benefit the country. This is a budget that is responsible economically. It's a budget that will ease the cost of living pressures for households. It's a budget that will absolutely deliver a, a, a change in the way our economy is working, moving towards a better and sounder future with a, re a direct reduction of inflation by three quarters of a per cent in 2023-24. Now, I want to say that again because the myth that this, this opposition is trying to stitch together in the response to an excellent Labor budget is that we're at all sorts of financial crisis. Well, we will have a surplus. There are headwinds. We need to manage our economy responsibly, and that is what we do. We, we've, we've made sure that we've banked the revenue gains that were somewhat unexpected, but we've banked them so that we can deliver a cost of living relief for Australians and invest in a way that will make it possible for Australians to access the services they desperately need, like their local doctor. Senator Bragg. Yeah, thank you very much. And I rise to take note of all the answers. Uh, now, obviously, there has been a lot of discussion this afternoon about inflation, and the question is, has this budget done anything to try and fight inflation? And the evidence from 
today's financial review and the other esteemed publications and people like John Keogh uh, have said that the big fib at the heart of this budget is that it will help the Reserve Bank to reduce inflation when, in fact, Labor's policies are tipping a net extra amount of $44 billion into the economy. Uh, the same thing is said in the editorial and also in the financial review that it is a $44 billion stimulus to the economy which starts to feed in during this high inflation year. And S&P Global Ratings agree that these handouts will add to inflationary pressure. Uh, so, uh, Given the government has now spent over $100 billion since the election, uh, it has decided to run an inflationary fiscal position. Uh, that is its right, uh, but it should be honest that that's what it is doing. It is making the Reserve Bank's job much harder, uh, and that has been, been clear. And I think uh, a lot of these debates are unfortunate that everyone wants to sort of hug the talking points, but the truth is that the last uh, certainly the last coalition budget was, was inflationary, and this one has been significantly inflationary, and that is hurting uh, people who are the most impacted by inflation, and that is um, lower and middle income earners. And to walk around and argue that this is a deflationary position uh, is not the case. And the fact that we saw the Reserve Bank feel that it needed to raise rates and it surprised economists, I think just only about 10 days ago, I think is a very worrying sign uh, that the government has chosen to plough another $50 billion uh, into the marketplace, uh, into the economy, uh, is a very much a negative for those lower and middle income earners uh, who are going to have to contend with higher in interest rates because it is very likely uh, that given that the federal government has decided to run an inflationary fiscal position, that the central bank will have to uh, increase interest rates. And in fact, Chris Richardson, who is a well-known economist, uh, has said that I had thought that the Reserve Bank was done and dusted, but this has notably raised the chance that they will do another swing of the baseball bat. Uh, now, the other market economists like uh, David Bassanese from Beta Shares, it says it's unambiguously expansionary. Uh, and Sherelle Murphy from Ernst & Young uh, has said that uh, inflation is already running at the annual rate of 7 per cent, and more than one in four dollars spent in the economy is by a government. And that is really the central problem here, is that the government has decided to fuel inflation. That is, that is the decision that they have taken, but they have not been honest with the Australian people that that is the decision that they have Taken. Now, I understand why, because politically it's very difficult to cut spending and they have a lot of vested interests and lots of mouths to feed and lots of noisy stakeholders. But it is better to be honest about the problem, and this has been done before by uh, both parties of government. Um, certainly in the 80s, uh, the Labor government did it and we did it um, in the 90s where spending was cut and hard decisions were made because there was a recognition at the time that that would be the best way to protect lower and middle income earners. I mean, this is not going to be a massive problem for the super rich people in this society. It is mainly going to impact people uh, who are at the lower and middle income uh, bracket. And so that's really the issue that we have today. Now, the government have predicted in their budget that they will basically halve inflation over the next 12 months. And you will see uh, an inflation number with a three in front of it as opposed to a seven or a six. Now, that is a prediction that they've put in the budget, and that is, again, they're right. Uh, I would say that it is a very bold prediction to be predicting that inflation will be cut by 50 per cent when they are running a budget strategy like this. They don't seem to be able to say no to many of the rent seekers and bloodsuckers who are wanting to line up outside their doors and ask for more and more and more money. And these are the unions and the super funds and the, all the usual suspects. Uh, but that is going to be the great test for the government now. They've been deceptive and we will ensure that they wear that crown of thorns if they fail to cut inflation. I'll put the question, those the questions say aye against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Furuki. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to take note of Minister Gallagher's response to Senator Rice's question on poverty and the budget. 
Labour's budget yesterday was a betrayal to the millions who were hoping not to be left behind. We are in the midst of a crushing cost of living crisis. We are in the midst of a painful housing and rental crisis. We are in the midst of a soaring student debt crisis. And we are in the midst of the climate crisis. And yet, the Treasurer's speech didn't even mention climate change. And Labour is spending more on fossil fuel subsidies than they're spending on climate change. People are having to make impossible choices between heating or eating, fuel or medicine, or paying rent or paying off student debt. Given how tough things are, the choices in this budget should have been easy for Labour. It should have been an easy choice to raise support payments like job seeker and youth allowance above the poverty line. It should have been an easy choice to make early childhood education and care free. It should have been an easy choice to freeze rent increases. It should have been an easy choice to wipe student debt or at least stop 3 million Australians from being hit with a 7.1% increase to their student debt come June 1. But instead, Labour has not even done the bare minimum. Those on Job Seeker, Youth Allowance and Our Study will see only a $2.85 more a day. And the increase to Commonwealth rent assistance is as little as $1.12 a day. So many will remain in poverty at Labour's choosing. But all Labour cares about is bragging rights to a budget surplus. People doing it tough don't care about your meaningless surplus. People don't care that you've banked billions in the kitty while they skip meals and live in cars. All the surplus demonstrates is that there was more money sitting there that could have helped people doing it tough, but you chose not to. Labour's budget leaves people in poverty while the big corporations and the wealthy win. Shame on you. Senator Thorpe. Oh, sorry, uh, is this on the same question? Oh, sorry, the same answer or not? Different one. So I'll put the question. Those the questions say aye, against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of Minister Watt's response, and I'm aware that Aboriginal legal services receive government funding and for the funding provided in the October budget, but it's clearly not enough. First Nations legal services all over this country have called for emergency funding because they simply cannot meet the demand for legal support with the current funding levels. Factors like, now listen hard, bail laws, inflation rates, COVID and over-policing and tough on crime measures on our communities have grown the pressure over the years. Since 2018, demand for First Nations legal services has increased by up to 100 per cent. But core government funding has declined in real terms, so don't be gammon when you provide a gammon answer. This is why, in the lead up to the budget, First Nations legal services around Australia called on the government to deliver a $250 million emergency support package to prevent imminent service freezes and unjust incarceration. You want the voice to tell you that? Is that what you're waiting for? Yet the amount provided was zero. Your, your and the Attorney General's verbal appreciation is like white splaining, to be honest, that the service of these organisations are providing is worth nothing. And it does not result in any actual support for the sector. All your nice words, all your waving the flag for blackfellas means nothing when you're still allowing deaths in custody and incarceration rates to go out of control. We need these services to have a chance to equal access to justice in the colonial criminal system that this place set up to kill us, to get rid of us, incarcerate us. Many of our people who are locked up are on remand. They may never even be sentenced. But you want to take away the lawyers and the black legal services that support them and keep them out of the system? Where being, people are being deprived of their freedom and their rights. 
The Aboriginal Legal Service in Victoria had to implement new client freezes. They're freezing services to our people on the ground in Victoria. And on Monday, there will be a number of other Aboriginal legal services in New South Wales shutting. What do you call that? A voice? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Put the question. Those of the question say aye. Against, no. The ayes have it. Move on to notices. Are there any notices of motions to be given for another day? Senator Chisholm. I give notice that on the next sitting day I shall move that in accordance with section 5 of the Parliamentary Act 1974, the Senate approves the proposal by the National Capital Authority for capital works within the parliamentary zone relating to the John Gorton campus car park. I will so present a proposal relating to the works. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to uh, postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Urquhart. Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators. Senator Gallagher for 9 May 2023 on account of ministerial business and Senator Walsh for 10 and 11 May 2023 for personal reasons. So the motion is moved by Senator Gallagher. Those in favour say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Urquhart, sorry. Yes, about Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Senator Wong. Senator Askew. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Patterson for today for personal reasons. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal. At, oh, we're not. We're going to Senator Chisholm. Uh, I move that general business order of the day number 21, parliamentary privileges amendment, Royal Commission response bill 2022, be considered on Thursday, 11th of May 2023, at the time for private senators' bills. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Chisholm be agreed to. Those of the opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Call the clerk. Uh, no postponement notifications have been lodged. A committee has lodged an extension as shown at item 12 on today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. We now move to the condolence motion. It is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 29th of March 2023 of the Honourable Stuart John West, a former Minister and Member of the House of Representatives for the Division of Cunningham, New South Wales from 1977 to 1973. I call the Leader of the Government in the Senate, Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, I move that the Senate records its sorrow at the death on 29 March 2023 of the Honourable Stuart John West, former Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs, Minister for Housing and Construction and Minister for Administrative Services and former Member for Cunningham, places on record its gratitude of his service to the Parliament and the nation and tenders its sympathy to his family in their bereavement. I rise President, on behalf of the government, to express our condolences following the passing of another highly respected former Australian Labor Party minister and member of the House of Representatives, the Honourable Stuart John West, at the age of 88. And I convey the government's condolences to his family and his friends. The day after the Senate eulogised John Kerrin, we are lamenting the loss of another member of a great generation of Labor ministers. The cabinets of the Hawke government set the standard for executive government in this country, and Stuart West left his own mark when he served among some of the greatest of Labor's ministers. But his contribution extended beyond his ministerial portfolios. He had a hand in policy decisions that left a lasting legacy. And notably, he took a stance on issues of principle even when it was not convenient or came at personal cost. As the Prime Minister has said, he was a politician of unbending principle, one who cherished the privilege of being in Cabinet, but who nonetheless 
prioritised principle over career. Stuart West was born in Forbes in 1934 in the central west region of New South Wales. The Illawarra became his home where he was a waterside worker in Port Kembla and, obviously, was involved in industrial and labour politics. When Rex Connor, the then member for Cunningham, sadly died in office in 1977, Stuart West was elected to replace him, and he would be re-elected uh, for the seat in the 77, 80, 83, 84, 87 and 1990 elections. He served a term on the backbench before being uh, elevated to the shadow ministry following the 1980 election. He first served as spokesperson on Aboriginal affairs, and in this portfolio he worked with the, the, the leader of the opposition, Bill Hayden, to put in place long-term policy proposals focused on Indigenous jobs, housing and health, in contrast to the actions of the Fraser government, which had cut real spending uh, by some $35 million over four years. In late 1980, he, Stuart West took on the shadow portfolio that he would hold for the majority of Labor's final term in opposition, environment and conservation. And here he built on the legacy of ministers like Moss Cass, formulating policies that would come to define a new approach from Labor in government. He oversaw development of the environment, environmental policy that Labor took to the 1983 election and that we implemented in the face of significant opposition once Bob Hawke led Labor to victory. And at the heart of this policy was Labor's pledge to save the Franklin River in Tasmania. Four decades later, later, that the Franklin still flows wild and free can be attributed to his courage and foresight. So too can the protection of Kakadu. These are substantial achievements, which are a magnificent legacy. When Bob Hawke, and Bill Hayden, when Bob Hawke replaced Bill Hayden as leader, and led Gay Labor to government in 1983, Stuart West became the Cabinet Minister. Appointed Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs, it was another issue that would result in him having a brief hiatus from the Cabinet room early in his ministerial career. In the early 1980s, there was passionate debate within the Australian Labor Party and the broader community about uranium. A strong anti-uranium proponent, Stuart West had already endured uh, much anguish as the party thrashed out the issue at its national conference prior to coming to government. When the issue came before Cabinet and a decision was taken that he felt was inconsistent with the party's platform, he resigned his Cabinet position. At the time, he was the left's sole representative in a Cabinet otherwise comprised of members of the right, centre-left and independents. In making this decision, he prioritised principle over career. He did, however, retain his ministry, and Prime Minister Hawke restored him to the Cabinet the following year. As Minister for, Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs, Stuart West articulated the importance of diversity and non-discrimination in Australia's immigration policy. At the time, our refugee and special humanitarian visa intake was under particular scrutiny, as, especially as a consequence of the Vietnam War and other conflicts in Southeast Asia, as well as the repudiation of the White Australia policy by the Whitlam government. Immigration to Australia from Asia was the subject of political debate. Stuart West took on the falsehoods being peddled in the community by what he rightly described as a pre prejudiced minority that was being supported regrettably by the then opposition. These falsehoods range for the, from the perpetuation of myths that government policies discriminated against people from Europe and the United Kingdom to bold-faced anti-Asian racism. And he called on the opposition not to lend its support to emerging anti-Asian racism in Australia. Sadly, we know, particularly under the leadership of John Howard, these calls were not heeded. We will never forget it was Mr Howard who called for a reduction in Asian immigration in 1988, saying the pace of immig Asian immigration was a cause for concern. I am grateful that we on this side of the, cha on the, of the chamber can count those such as Stuart West amongst our number. He was prepared to clearly articulate the damage done by those who exploit race as a weapon for political advantage. All of us in this place, on all sides, must always guard against such tactics uh, and, uh, and recognise the damage that such tactics wreak on our community. Following his two years in this portfolio, Stuart West went on to serve as Minister for Housing and Construction and Administrative Services. 
Uh, he did not return to the ministry after the 1990 election and retired from politics prior to the 1993 election. After returning to private life, he maintained his activism on those matters that were close to his heart, including the plight of refugees, continuing to give voice to the compassion he had shown as minister. Stuart West died two days short of his 89th birthday. His life was one of passion and one of principle. He was a champion for the cause and he laid a path for Labor ministers to come. The Prime Minister reflected that he was proud to sit behind, beside Stuart West at our national conferences and proud to stand alongside him to improve the lives of working Australians. We are a better nation as a consequence of the impact of Stuart West at the highest levels of our government. So once again, uh, on behalf of this Labor government, I express our condolences following his passing to his friends and family, especially to his widow Mary, their children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Thank you. And Senator Wong. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, President. President, I rise to associate the opposition with the remarks of Senator Wong in relation to paying tribute to and honouring the life of the Honourable Stuart John West. Uh, and extending our condolences to his family and loved ones. Uh, born in 1934 in Forbes and attending Wollongong High School, Stuart West would go on to represent the greater area of Wollongong as the member for Cunningham for some 16 years in the Australian Parliament. But before entering the Parliament, he held the position of President of the Waterside Workers Federation for five years, a position that uh, I can only but imagine would be one that would strengthen uh, one's ability uh, to enter into political combat. He served as campaign manager for 10 years to the then member for Cunningham, Rex Connor, who died suddenly in office, leaving Stuart West to be elected as the next representative for the seat of Cunningham in 1977. In his maiden speech, Stuart spoke with passion for his electorate, advocating for capital expenditure grants and employment revitalisation, which he believed his community needed to succeed. Publicly and proudly labelled as one of the few members of Labor's left faction, Stuart was a class of politician who wore his heart on his sleeve. Three years after entering Parliament, as Senator Wong said, Stuart was given his first appointment as opposition spokesman, then for Aboriginal Affairs, followed by the responsibilities for environment and conservation, and then finance and trade under opposition leader Bill Hayden. Stuart has been recognised as being vocal and indeed playing a key role in the campaigns to save the Franklin River in Tasmania and preserve Kakadu in the Northern Territory. In one newspaper article, a few words describe just how devoted Stuart was to the responsibilities of his portfolios. During his time as Shadow Minister for the Environment and Conservation, the Canberra Times reported on his contribution to a Labor National Conference in 1982 that was, as Senator Wong indicated, debating the ALP's position on the future of Australia's uranium industry. The article stated that, and I quote, watching Stuart West from the press galleries of the House, he has always seemed mild and self-effacing and dutiful. But at the ALP conference, he did a deal of ranting. In a passionate afternoon, Mr West was mega-passionate. Following the 1983 election, the mega-passionate Stuart West became the only identified member of the left faction of the new Labor government to be appointed to a cabinet position under Prime Minister Bob Hawke. As Minister for Immigration, it was, though, to be a relatively short-lived position initially. Man of principle, Stuart resigned from the appointment eight months in when he opposed the Cabinet decision to sell uranium to France. He was subsequently reappointed, though, to the position just five months later by Prime Minister Hawke. For another two terms, Stuart West would remain in the Cabinet for the Hawke government as Minister for Housing and Construction and then as Minister for Administrative Services until 1990. In the decade following the Vietnam War and the establishment of communist governments in the region, many residents within Southeast Asia became refugees. As Immigration Minister, Stewart approached his portfolio wholeheartedly, leading an agenda that would welcome these refugees to Australia. Stewart championed the goals of the Hawke government. In one address to the House, he stated, whilst humanitarian considerations dictate that resettlement is still necessary, this government maintains strongly that solutions must be found to the cause of mass population movement in Southeast Asia. He didn't just say, state those words, he would contribute to these solutions. Travelling to intergovernmental consultations between the US, Canada, Japan and Australia, he would also visit Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia and Thailand to stress that resettlement alone was not the answer and there was need for voluntary repatriation and other efforts. Throughout his time in Parliament, 
as Senator Wong has acknowledged, Stuart West was principled, particularly principled when it came to refugees, matters of migration, as well as those of conservation. And even after his time in parliament, Stuart continued to advocate for the rights of refugees. After the re-election of the Hawke government in 1990, Stuart's principles were further challenged uh, within his party. The invasion of Kuwait by Iraq led Stuart to abstain from voting on the Hawke government's resolution on the Gulf conflict, which would see Australian troops sent to support UN forces against Iraq. In a piece he penned appearing in the Sydney Morning Herald, Stuart wrote, quote, I also fear the US UN forces will win the war but lose the peace. The post-war problems will exceed the pre-war problems. Even now, a devastating ground war should be averted. We need another diplomatic approach. Many would see the words he wrote now as being prescient for at least future challenges and problems uh, to come. It was clear that Stuart's desires during his time in parliament were of humanitarian and conservation priorities. His passion for his portfolio is as strong as that for his community. Stuart retired from the parliament at the 1993 election. I have little doubt, and Senator Wong acknowledged, that his interests and values would have ensured strong opinions continued to be expressed throughout his life, particularly on the issues near and dear to his heart, and no doubt probably most passionately when he believed that the party he loved and served was straying from the principles that he would have believed it needed to uphold. Lauded as a political giant of the Labor movement, Stuart West was, I'm told, surrounded by family and friends at the time of his passing. On behalf of the opposition and as part of this Senate, and we extend to Stuart's loved ones, his wife Mary, their children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren, our deep and sincere condolences and thanks for his service to our nation. Thanks, Senator Birmingham. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to signify their assent to the motion. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. Oh, Senator Wong. Thank you, President. I ask that government business notice of motion number two relating to the death, to, to the death of Mr Alan Gingell, AO, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Wong. I thank the Senate. I move the motion. So the question is, the mo oh, Senator Birmingham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Birmingham. I thank the Senator and I thank Senator Wong for the accommodation. Uh, I wish the uh, President to associate myself uh, and indeed the Coalition with the remarks of Senator Wong in her speech during Senator's statements today uh, that, of course, is complementary to the motion being moved. We offer our deep and sincere condolences at the passing of Alan Gingell AO. Remembered as a giant and one of the finest minds in foreign and strategic policy, Alan devoted a lifetime of service to Australia. From his thoughtful uh, probing and, and um, principled stances throughout his career, whether in postings across Rangoon, Singapore and Washington, service in Canberra, service in the Office of Prime Minister Keating, or work as the Director General of the Office of National Assessments, Alan Gingell always put Australian interests first with a principled approach. Before his appointment to the ONA, he was a founding executive director of the Lowy Institute for International Policy, also serving as a founding board member of China Matters uh, and later an honorary professor at the Australian National University, whilst perhaps most recently being the immediate past president of the Australian Institute of International Affairs. A diplomat, senior policy advisor, director general, founding executive director general, president, an honorary professor and author, put into perspective his extraordinary contribution, but it should not be abbreviated to titles, his knowledge and quiet wisdom influenced strategic and foreign relations in this, of Australian governments for decades. In public policy, many participate. Some contribute. A few are both skilled enough and fortunate enough to be able to make a difference. Alan Gingell made a difference to Australia's engagement with the world. It was a testament to his skills, to his principles and his approach. He's rightly been recognised by many. It is right that this chamber also recognise him and his contribution to our foreign and strategic policy. His vision has left a lasting legacy. Uh, we thank Alan Gingell for his service and pay our respects to his wife Catherine, his loved ones, family, friends and all who knew him. 
Thank you, Thank Senator. You, Senator Birmingham. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Wong, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Now going to move to uh, government business number one, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Is that you, Senator Chisholm? Senator Chisholm. I ask that government business notice of motion number one relating to the hours of meeting and routine of business for this week be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Chisholm. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Chisholm, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? Aye. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
So the question is that government business number one, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Askew as teller for the noes. Order. There being 23 ayes and 42 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll now move to um, general business notice of motion number 224, standing in the name of Senator Rice. Thank you, President. I seek leave to amend General Business Notice of Motion Number 224 relating to the Smart Cards scheme. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Rice. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the Chamber and ask that it be taken as formal. So the question is the um, motion as amended. That, uh, is it agreed that the amendment be taken as formal? Yes. Thank you. Senator Rice? I move the motion as amended. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 224 as amended by Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Yep.
Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 224 as amended uh, in the name of Senator Rice be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. There being 42 ayes and 20 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I advise senators there may be further divisions. I will now move to government, uh, general business notice of motion number 226, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Birmingham, I ask that general business notice of motion number 226 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general. Oh, beg your pardon, Senator Chisholm. Seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Chisholm. Uh, instead of feigning hurt feelings because they didn't like the answer they received to a question or notice, the opposition should practice what they preach, stop wasting the time of the Senate and talk about the real issues that are impacting on Australians rather than wasting our time. Thank you. Order. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 226 standing in the name of Senator Birmingham and moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Uh, against. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 226 standing in the same name of Senator Birmingham and moved by Senator Askew be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order, there being 42 ayes and 20 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. We will now move to general business, notice of motion number 227, standing in the name of Senator Hume. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Hume, I ask that general business notice of motion number 227 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There, there being none, I'll call Senator Askew. Uh, Senator Chisholm? Seek leave to make a short statement. Our leave is granted for one minute. Yes, thank you. We are a government that delivers on our commitments, and that is what we have done today in relation to the release of the budget process operational rules. As the Finance Minister indicated to the Senate through a letter to the President in February, Minister Gallagher said that the government would be in a position to release the budget process operational rules after the delivery of the 23-24 budget. The 23-24 budget was released last night. This morning, the B pours were released. That's our commitment delivered. It is worth putting on the record again that those opposite never once released the B pours following a budget, so this OPD is not only unnecessary but hypocritical at the same time. Instead of wasting the Senate's time again, I suggest that those opposite check for documents on public and accessible government websites before moving unnecessary motions in the Senate. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 227, standing in the name of Senator Hume and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Ring the bells for one minute. Order, lock the doors. So the question is that general business, notice of motion number 227, standing in the name of Senator Hume and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 42 ayes and 20 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now move to business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Rice. We're debating that tonight. Thank you very much. I'll now move to um, 
General Business, number 212, standing in the name of Senator Fawcett. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, President. I ask the General Business Notice Motion 212, proposing the introduction of a bill, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Fawcett. I move that the following bill be introduced, a bill for an act to establish the Defence Capability Assurance Agency, the Inspector General of Defence Capability Assurance and the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Defence and for related purposes. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Fawcett be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Fawcett. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanatory Sorry, I present the bill and move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Fawcett be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator, I'll call the clerk. A bill for an act to establish the Defence Capability Assurance Agency, the Inspector General of Defence Capability Assurance and the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Defence and for related purposes. Senator Fawcett. I move that this bill now be read a second time and I seek leave to table an explanation memorandum relating to the bill. Is uh, leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Fawcett. I table an explanation memorandum and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard and to continue my remarks. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Fawcett. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. We will now move to general business. Notice of motion number 223, standing in the name of Senator Bragg. Yep. Now? Yes, Senator Bragg. Are you ready? Uh, I ask that general business notice of motion number 223 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Bragg. I move the motion. Beautifully. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, President. I seek leave to move an amendment to Senator Bragg's motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you. I move the amendment as circulated in the chamber, and I seek leave to make a one-minute statement. Uh, is leave granted? Is leave granted? Yes, uh, leave is granted for one minute. Senator uh, thank you, President. If uh, the Chamber agrees to our amendment, we will be supporting uh, this motion from Senator Bragg because we do support open access to information so the Senate can properly do its job in scrutinising legislation before it. But I do want to make it clear that if the amendment is accepted, the motion would be directed squarely at the Minister representing the Treasurer, not at the Parliamentary Budget Office. Uh, we do think the PBO has acted appropriately in not providing the information to Senator Bragg and that the information has to come from the Minister representing the Treasurer and be provided to the Senate. The free flow of protected and sensitive information between government agencies and the PBO is critical in the PBO being able to do the job they do so well in serving MPs. We would not support a motion if we knew it would result in a chilling effect on the flow of information between government agencies and the PBO. So the question is that the motion is the amendment is moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I now am putting the amended motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number two two three as amended by Senator McKim and moved by Senator Bragg be agreed to. Those with that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I will now move to business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senators Colbeck and Cadell. Is that you, Senator Askew? Um, so on, on I'll come of, back. If so you no, you're, on behalf of senators, I can do it. On behalf of Senators Colbeck and Cadell, I request that business of the Senate number two be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. Move the motion.
I believe there was an amendment circulated in the name of Senator David Pocock. Thank you. That's not being proceeded with. So the question is that business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senators Colbeck and Cadell, moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. And I'll now move to business of, business of the Senate, number three, standing in the name of Senator Chisholm. I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number three, proposing a reference to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee, be taken as formal. Just a moment, Senator Chisholm. Is this about this matter? Uh, no, I, I just didn't hear how you called the previous, um, the previous vote, President, on um, uh, the motion from Senator Colbeck. I called it for the ayes. Uh, we said no. Uh, so, so we, 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 we say no and we, and we say that the noes have it. I seek the uh, indulgence of the Senate. If I'm happy to put the motion again, if that's the wish of the Senate. And we would normally do that. Um, I've called the Senator Chisholm motion now, so I intend to continue with that. So, uh, so Senator Chisholm, is, uh, if you start again. I ask that business of the Senate notice motion number three, proposing a reference to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Chisholm. I move the motion. So the question is that um, business of the Senate number three, standing in the name of Senator Chisholm, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I'm now moving back and recalling um, business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senators Colbeck and Cadell, and moved by Senator Askew. I'm just putting um, Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, President. Just uh, for clarification, we're, we're happy to facilitate a re-putting of the question, but I did not hear a single voice when you uh, asked for the um, uh, positions to be declared, but I guess we would hope to have, have heard that given we're now recommitting, but we'll facilitate. Senator McKim. Thank, thank you, President. Just with the indulgence of the Senate, I, I can explain uh, what happened. We understood that there was an amendment that was going to be moved to this motion, so we thought the question that the President was putting was in relation to the amendment. So I accept what Dunning, Senator Dunning was saying, and I thank <laughs> the Senate for its indulgence in allowing this matter to be recommitted. Thank you, Senator McKim. Did you just throw me under the bus? Because I think I was quite clear in the way that I called it. <laughs> but that's okay. That's my job. So we're now putting the we're now putting the question. So uh, business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senators Colbeck and Cadell, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So the question is that business of the Senate number two, standing in the name of Senators Colbeck and Cadell, and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart the teller for the noes. Order. There being 29 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. There is one more um, biz general business notice, and that is number 225, standing in the name of Senator Cash. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Cash, I ask that general business notice of motion number 225 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 225, standing in the name of Senator Cash, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. That concludes um, notices and motions. We now move to the MPI. I'll just Thank you, Senators. We're going to move to the MPI. I just ask that you quietly leave the chamber if you're not participating in this debate. A proposal from Senator McGrath has been received under Standing Order 75 as follows. Dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. Australia needed a budget to re that reduces inflation and reins in spending to bring costs of living down for all Australians, but instead Labor delivered a high-taxing, high-spending budget that leaves an Australian family worse off by $25,000. Is the proposal supported? Indeed it is. With the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with formal arrangements made by the whips. I call Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I, I want to read out the words again of, of this MPI so those listening at home know how important this is. Australia needed a budget that reduces inflation and reins in spending to bring cost of living down for all Australians. But instead, Labor delivered a high-taxing, high-spending budget that leaves an Australian family worse off by $25,000. Well, last night was the great disappointment, wasn't it? A, a, budget, a budget that is going to hurt Australians. And it's interesting. Um, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, quite a famous economist, uh, wrote a few books. Um, he said, he's a Nobel Prize winner, thank you, Senator Scar. He said that inflation is taxation without legislation. So what we've seen with the budget last night is a, a big government budget that is not the solution to our cost of living crisis. It is the cause of our cost of living crisis. So last night, 
hundreds of thousands of Australians uh, turned on their TV uh, because you know, there's probably nothing on Netflix, and they, uh, they wanted to see Treasurer Jim Chalmers, that disciple of Paul Keating, deliver the cost of living relief that they so desperately needed. But much to their disappointment, all Australia saw was a typical inflationary Labor budget with more taxes and more reckless spending and more inflation to come. So it's not surprising that they flick back to Netflix or Stan um, or, or Paramount Plus because they knew, they knew how the budget is going to end. Just like they know how the movie is going to end, they know how this budget is going to end. It's going to hurt their purses, their wallets and their bank accounts. Now, compared to the, the coalition's last budget, this budget had $185 billion of extra spending. So, so for those who are hard of hearing, that's billion, not, not million, not thousand, not a hundred, not cents. That is $185 billion worth of extra spending. That is $7,400 per person. And that $7,400 has got to come from somewhere. And guess where it's going to come from? It's going to come from taxes. Taxes that are going to be put on you, on your income, taxes that will be put on you and your business, taxes that are going to be put on basically if it moves, Labor are going to tax it. If it doesn't move, they're going to tax it. And if, quite frankly, it's having a nap, they'll tax it. This is the problem with this Labor government. We know how this movie is going to end. It is going to hurt the Australian people because their record on economic management is so dismal, so poor, that the Australian people are going to be hurt. But with all this extra spending, what has Labor done to support the backbone of our economy? You know, the mining and agriculture region, and the agriculture sectors of our economy, especially so important to Senator Scar and, Senator, and, and myself in terms of our state of Queensland. What do they do? What do they say about, about the $185 billion? Well, guess what? The Treasurer didn't even talk, mention the word rail, didn't even mention the word dam, didn't even mention the word road, didn't, didn't mention the word farmer or agriculture. So he's not going to spend his $185 billion. Oh, his $185 billion. I'll correct myself and correct the Hansard. It is $185 billion of Australians' money. It's not the Labor Party's money. They're not going to spend the money on supporting rural, regional and remote Queensland. But more importantly, this money actually isn't going to help Australian families. It's not going to support Australian families. So Treasurer, Treasurer Chalmers, in his 30-minute eulogy last night for the Australian economy, just was a constant disappointment. And what is interesting, that for every dollar of revenue that is imposed in this budget, the government has decided to spend two. So in this budget, it is spending twice as fast as raising revenue. Now, try, try and raise Try and run your family um, home on that. Try and run a business like that. But, of course, Labor haven't run businesses. And, quite frankly, they're not very good at looking their own, after their own money because they're all a bunch of, of union hacks who depend on the income from, from compulsory acquiring union fees off the workers of Australia. So what we're going to see with this budget is that Australian families are going to get smashed. And they might think there's a little bit of a sugar hit, but what we do know is that... If you have reckless economic management, which is what we saw last night, that means it's going to impact upon inflation. That means the cost of living is going to go up. And then this budget is, is to be renowned as a budget that hurt Australia in the years and decades to come. Senator Polly. Mr Acting Deputy President, what a lot of nonsense. It's the same speech that Senator McGrath comes in here and gives every time we're in this chamber. And his former government have no credibility at all. For over nine years, not one surplus did you deliver. Not one surplus at all. We've delivered that. What we've done is we have started to clean up the mess that you left behind, the trillion dollar debt that the Liberal and Nationals left this country in. That's the reality. That's what the Australian people understand. That's what they made their decision at the last election on. Who was going to be able to get us out of the mess that we were in? And they said very clearly, no to the no-alition. Now, since I've 
re-emerged in opposition and they come in and they talk about the cost of living, which we are addressing. The Albanese government's budget eases the cost of living pressure on households. Our budget plan will directly reduce inflation in 2023-24. And we know that Australians are struggling, something that you failed to acknowledge in nine years when you continued to run down Australians' workers' uh, wages when we saw the debt that you kept piling on and piling on. So with this budget, instead of being a reasonable opposition that has accepted the election results and acknowledged that you failed in energy policy, what do we see from you? Voting against things that are going to really ease the pressure on the cost of living of Australians. We hear the opposition come into this place talking about housing, and we all know mortgage interest rates have gone up, which they were doing under your government. What we have done is we have invested $14.6 billion of cost of living package. These measures are expected to directly reduce inflation by three quarters of a percentage point in 2023-24. Australians, we acknowledge are under the pump, so we're carefully recalibrating and redesigning the budget to take the pressure off Australians. We are doing this in a responsible, adult way. Now, the budget priorities are responsible. They're targeted for the cost of living uh, relief while also investing in the future, securing services Australians rely on and strengthening their nation's finances. Our cost of living plan will directly lower price pressures and the CPI in 2023-24 and will not add to the broader inflationary pressure in the economy. Now, we've delivered a responsible budget while still spending so that the government isn't adding to that inflation to our economy. This includes 87 per cent of revenue upgrades in October and May to the budget compared to those, when they were in government, an average of only 40 per cent. There's a big difference between 40 per cent and 87 per cent. Now, I don't know, they put their heads down, they don't want to hear these things. But Treasury's advice is that fiscal policy is working with monetary policy to tackle inflation in the near term. Australians are paying the price for the coalition's decade of failures. The coalition oversaw a decade of wasted opportunities. They had warped priorities and they left Australians with falling real wages. They had broken supply change, which makes inflation worse. They left a trillion dollars, not a billion, a trillion dollar of debt without an economic dividend to show for it. Not one dividend, not one. And they espouse themselves to be the great economic managers between the two major parties, where you have been seen for your failings. You have failed. You can't even, what, you had 22 energy policies and couldn't land on one policy that was going to address the energy needs of this country. So what you do now in the opposition is you want to oppose everything. You won't support anything when it comes that we are doing in trying to restructure the National Reconstruction Fund, the Housing Australia Future Fund, cleaner and cheaper energy, the coalition are just voting to increase inflation. That's what you're doing. We want inflation to be lower. You guys, you want it to be higher because otherwise you would get on board and you would support the very good policies that is going to assist the housing crisis in this country. We are going to do something about energy. We're delivering real benefits to Australians. My home state of Tasmania will get a $500 energy pack. Senator Polly, your time has expired. Thank you. Oh, thank you Senator Bush Th oh. uh, Wilson. Acting Deputy President, millions of Australians will be, who voted for change at the last federal election will be disappointed to learn that one of the biggest losers from this federal budget was the environment and our oceans. We know we're in an extinction crisis. And this government, with great fanfare, has signed up for big global 
pushes, like the Aichi zero extinction target. They've signed up for the UN's pledge to protect 30 per cent of our land and sea by 2030. But where's the funding for our threatened species framework in this budget? We know that to properly protect our environment, to stop the loss of threatened species, to restore our environment, we need at least $2 billion a year in funding based on the US model. And what do we get in this budget? Depending on how you dice it, maybe $50 million a year, a few per cent of what is required. I'd like to read uh, the words of Professor Ewan Ritchie, one of the many scientists who's been ringing the bell on the need for real government funding to protect our environment. And he was surprised when he said words that can't be found in the Treasurer's budget 2023 speech include climate change, wildlife, threatened species, ecosystems, extinction, biodiversity, nature. And the only mention of environment was actually in relation to the environment of inflation. So much for actions to back up the words from this government in a time of real crisis. Budgets are the most important time for governments especially new governments, to show the nation what their priorities are. And it's clear as daylight that the environment is not a priority for this government. But it is a priority for the Australian Greens. And we will continue to fight for our environment. And we know uh, the government is going to be bringing forward legislation in the next six to nine months. And this is an issue we will continually raise so that in the next budget, in May 2024, we see the environment properly funded. Thank you, Senator Wilson. Uh, Senator Brack. Acting Deputy President, uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking about this uh, matter of public importance. And uh, I made a statement in an earlier debate that unfortunately uh, the government, uh, whilst deciding to run an inflationary fiscal position um, has not been prepared to be honest about that uh, for reasons which are only known to the government, maybe some internal reasons or trying to manage some stakeholders, perhaps some noisy stakeholders. But the, uh, the test that they have set for themselves, I think, is a test that we will remind them of on a regular basis, and that's not to be overly partisan, but it's just to be honest and say, well, uh, if you're saying that inflation is going to halve over the next 12 months and you've written that into the budget papers, then uh, we hope that you're right, but it's, uh, I'd say it's going to be a challenge to halve inflation when you are running uh, a massively expansionary fiscal policy. And that, that I think, is the government's own issue to, to resolve. Uh, certainly, we will be watching very closely what the Reserve Bank does and what the minutes say when they meet uh, every month. And the reality is that fiscal and monetary policy should be working in unison. And the fact that there was a surprise interest rate rise just only 10 days ago or so, I think is a, is a, is a real warning that the Reserve Bank um, has been prepared to do what is necessary to try and rein in inflation. Uh, the Reserve Bank governor has been uh, unfairly pursued by the Labor Party's backbenchers just for doing his job. And his job's been made much harder. I mean, Philip Lowe's job has been made so much harder by the Labor Party over these past 10 months. And the job of Philip Lowe as the Reserve Bank Governor was made so much harder on Tuesday night with the announcement of more spending. Um, at sure, I mean, not all the revenue upgrades uh, were spent, but a large proportion was spent. And it is true that in the past that too much of the revenue upgrades have been spent. So a key test for a government is, is can it bank all of it? Now, um, I would argue that that was the most appropriate policy position to take in this inflationary environment. 
So, th I mean, that is the bottom line on inflation. We will watch closely uh, as to whether the government is able to achieve its goal, which is written into the budget. The more immediate point, though, is that more taxation has been proposed in this budget and in the lead-up to the budget, uh, a couple of billion dollars on the super funds, uh, the end in some way of uh, dividend imputation, uh, more, more taxes on the gaspers and a range of other things. Now, um, it, you know, eventually some of these taxes are going to cause major problems and distortions, particularly this tax change on imputation. And the reason for that is that the, the government is proposing a new test in the law which says you can only pay a franc dividend if you have a period where you haven't been raising capital. Now, most normal companies, guess what, have to kind of you know, raise capital. It's called equity and you need money to run a business. So I would have thought that uh, if, if the law says that... Um, you, if you raise capital and you can't pay a frank dividend, then uh, people will be either less likely to raise the capital or less likely to uh, pay tax in Australia. Now, um, that, I think, is going to be a major change to our capital markets if that particular proposal is adopted. And the reason that this proposal is on the table is because the government is needing to raise taxes which of course is a breach of a commitment that the government gave before the last election, which was not to raise any new taxes. So uh, we've seen a few new taxes in the last budget in October. We've seen a few more taxes in the lead up to this budget, which were leaked out but put into the budget paper two last night. And uh, I would guess that there will be more taxes over the next uh, year and a half or two years of this term. And so in summary, the position we have is the government have said that they are wanting to fight inflation, but they're not quite telling the truth about that because they're running an expansionary budget. They've said that they'll get inflation down uh, to 3 per cent or a bit above 3 per cent. Uh, that is a test we will hold them to very closely, and we will look at any other taxes that they propose to try and fill their holes. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Acting President. Well, the MPI before us today is a very uh, a uh, flimsy fig leaf for the opposition in terms of their own record in government. It's all very well for those opposite to start talking about cost of living and inflationary pressures that all started under their government and seek to pin that all home to the Labor Party. The simple fact is that you missed the opportunity to ease cost of living pressures for Australians. You had a direct impact on inflationary uh, pressures inside the Australian economy. But let's not forget your so-called fiscal restraint that you claimed to have to try and demonstrate that you weren't um, having uh, inflationary pressure on the economy and not spending as much as you were. For example, let's not forget the so-called zombie measures that Senator Gallagher has so eloquently uh, outlined so often in this chamber as unfunded measures uh, in our federal budget that when we talk about these issues in this place, those opposite look at us incredulously as if to say, well, of course we weren't going to defund that. Of course we weren't. Well, the simple fact is either you were or you weren't. And the budget papers say you were because they weren't there in your bottom line. If you were intending to keep such measures funded, well, then you can't take credit for the downward uh, pressure on inflation for not funding them. It is simply um, you can't have your cake and eat it too for those opposite. So here we have had an excellent finance minister, an excellent treasurer, 
go through the very hard slog of assessing measures in the budget, leaving no stone unturned to ensure that we can maximise relief for families while putting downward pressure uh, on inflation. The cost of living uh, in Australia is, as we know, hitting many Australians extremely hard. Inflation, of course, remains our defining economic challenge this year, as indeed it was last year. We know uh, we are riding the waves of global consequences around the war in Ukraine, but also the decade of waste uh, from the previous government. Wasted opportunities that have put enormous pressure on supply chains here in Australia and indeed uh, in terms of our global networks. Happily, Australians understand that our government has inherited these challenges, not created them. Australians also understand that they look to the Labor government with purpose to address these difficult challenges and to take responsibility for them, unlike those opposite. I have to say it is indeed um, a struggle for Australians facing rising interest rates and rising costs of living. But the only way to bring this under control is through deliberate budget measures. The RBA has one set of levers and our government has another. We have uh, the opportunity to relieve cost of living uh, pressures through the measures in this budget, and we are glad to do so. This means it's important to prioritise relief where Australians need it most. It means we need to prioritise services uh, and uh, utilities, etc., that Australians really rely on and need. Bulk billing, energy price uh, relief, rent assistance, um, the expansion of the eligibility for single parents and carers uh, for oh, sorry. Time has expired, parenting Senator payments. Pratt, and I call Senator Babette. Thank you. Everyone's a winner in Treasurer Chalmers budget. Unless you understand that inflation is a tax and a tax doesn't require legislation. A tax that hurts our most vulnerable. We've got a surplus for now. Now, there are no tough decisions in this budget. Courage is not the Treasurer's strong point. The unions are happy, the globalists are happy, the big corporates, they're related. Productivity boosting measures are non-existent in this budget. It's all about big government and short-term fixes to large problems. Large problems often created by the very government that chooses to ignore them. If we want our country to head in a better direction, if we want to increase our standard of living and help the disadvantaged, the solution is not more spending or big government. The solution is cutting red tape, green tape, removing barriers for business, promoting entrepreneurial attitudes. The solution is growing the pie so that everyone can eat. Thank you, Senator Babette. Senator Roberts. Thank you. What are the two words too scary for the Treasurer to mention even once in his budget? Mining and agriculture. Ladies and gentlemen of Australia, booming mining and agriculture have yet again saved Australia's economy. The budget surplus is due to mining and agricultural exports, exports not Treasurer Jim Chalmers. Is he keeping it secret because Labor wants to continue destroying these vital industries? We should be opening more coal mines, not blocking them, building more coal-fired power stations, not just blowing them up, and setting our farmers free to feed and clothe the world. Labor's energy relief plan is an admission that net zero policies cannot lower power prices. Today we have the highest ever amount of wind and solar, yet the Treasurer needs to step in and use taxpayer money to cover up how high they're driving power bills on inflation. How inflationary will 400,000 new migrants be? Very. 
400,000 people are arriving this year and every single one needs a roof over the head, a home. Thank you, Senator, That's inflation. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I uh, call Senator O'Sullivan. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to support this matter of public importance uh, brought forward by your good self, uh, Acting Deputy President, Senator McGrath. Uh, this is a very important motion. It addresses a, uh, an issue that Australians, of course, are facing right now. They're feeling the pain of the rise of cost of living across this country right now. It doesn't matter where you are in this country uh, or in what sector or in, or in any section of the Australian economy. Businesses, individuals, families are feeling the rise of cost of living. And what we saw last night from the Treasurer, who was in fine form, glowing from the self-congratulation from his own side, channelling high-taxing Labor Treasurers of years gone by, is, is a budget that doesn't address the needs, addressing the needs and addressing the issues of addressing cost of living. What we saw was the Labor, uh, the, in the budget last night was Labor's true colours. Labor's true colours came through indeed. This budget did nothing to address cost of living pressures for Australian families. It did nothing to address the cost of living burdens being carried by Australians on a daily basis. It's, it's a cost of living con job, frankly. That's what we saw. The only person with less sleep this week when the treasurer, uh, was, than the treasurer was the governor of the Reserve Bank. That's because he knows that if the government continues to overspend, as it has done in its second year, that the only way that inflation can be brought under control is the levers of the Reserve Bank Governor, and that is to raise interest rates. There is enormous pressure on the Reserve Bank now because they're the ones left to carry the can. But guess what? It's Australians paying, struggling to pay their mortgages that are going to be left to do the heavy lifting. There was nothing in the budget last night that actually addressed the structural difficulties and the structural challenges that it will drive down the cost of living, that will put a, a decreased uh, measure on inflation. There's nothing in that budget. We saw some temporary measures that might help people to, uh, you know, there's a, some energy relief, but the increase is still going to go up by $500, but there's going to be some relief there, but that's for this year alone. What is the government doing to put downward pressure on cost of living? Sadly, nothing. We know, we know that this government does not actually have a plan. Because if they did, we would have seen it last night. I mean, we've been saying this for a long time, hoping that would come to Tuesday night, the first Tuesday of May, when the budget's delivered, and see that there's actually a plan to address this significant issue that Australians are facing. But sadly, we were all left wanting. Now, the cost of this spend that we saw, because what we saw was increase. Increase, uh, in, you know, increase spending to, to the dollar in, coming in in re revenue is going out in an expenditure. And what we're seeing is that, uh, that the Reserve Bank is the ones that are going to have to uh, deal with this, and the Labor Party have no plan to deal with inflation. Labor cannot spend its way out of this cost of living, uh, cost of living crisis. It was the great British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, who said, the problem with socialism is that you eventually run out of other people's money. Well, that's what this government's doing. They're spending your money. You're spending your money, Australian taxpayers, and you cannot outspend your way out of this situation. The budget makes life harder for Australians. The budget confirms that your cost of living goes up. The, the budget confirms that the gas and electricity prices continue to skyrocket, that real wages have not grown, inflation remains stubbornly high, unemployment will rise and Australians can expect to pay higher taxes. Now, a typical Australian family are expected to be $25,000 a year worse off under this Albanese Labor government. Under Anthony Albanese, under the Prime Minister, every dollar is worth less. Every dollar is worth less. That dollar that you've got in your bank account or in your pocket is worth less today because of this government than what it was a year ago. The Treasurer is running around pointing his wafer-thin budget surplus, pointing to it. But let's face the reality. It's because of 
the, the, the resources sector, particularly in my home state of Western Australia, the, the iron ore sector, who's, who's obviously getting uh, record prices or continuing to get record prices, that is delivering the surplus. Thank you. And the Treasurer Thank can't you. take I, credit I for that. O'Sullivan, the time for discussion has expired. The President has also received the following letter from Senator McKim. Dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today the Australian Greens propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. Labor's second budget is a betrayal of the people promised that no one will be left behind. Yours sincerely, Nick McKim. Uh, is the proposal supported? Excellent. Uh, with the concurrence of the Senate, the clerk will set the clock in line with the formal arrangements made by the whips. And I call Senator Barbara Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the fact that Labor's budget is a betrayal of too many people who were promised that no one would be left behind. This budget is the first since the tabling of the report of the Select Committee on Work and Care, which I chaired. The government's first chance to address its 33 recommendations, a report that's a majority report, where senators from Labor worked really hard alongside me. Uh, to bring those recommendations to this parliament for action. Labor supported them in full, and the committee took evidence from people all around the country. We recommended a comprehensive and integrated approach to addressing the challenges of work and care in this country, uh, action that would address the broken parts of our care economy and properly support the workers who make up so many of them women now our work, in our workforce responsible for others while they're holding down a job most days of the week. These challenges have only got worse in the months since our report was tabled. The housing crisis has become much worse. worse. The cost of living crisis is runaway in our cities and our towns. So this budget was a chance to squarely address the challenges that our committee work revealed. This was their chance to make sure working carers weren't left behind. So how do we evaluate the budget in terms of uh, that issue, who's been left behind. Let's start with a couple of bright spots. Firstly, the change to single parents' payments, which reverses the Gillard government's act of cruelty 10 years ago, forcing so many single parents, mostly mothers, onto job seeker uh, when their child turned not 16 but just eight. That's a, a bright spot for sure. But incredibly, they were unable, they couldn't bring themselves to actually fully fix their mistake of 10 years ago. They've left 15,000 families, parents of 14 and 15-year-olds on JobSeeker, living in poverty, um, and just 80 million of that 2.4 billion surplus would have addressed that question and fully fixed their mistake under the Gillard government 10 years ago. Shame. That is a really serious uh, error to have left those families behind. A second bright spot, though, that I want to mention is the allocation of $11 billion to a 15 per cent pay rise for aged care workers, which our committee recommended and support. Also very good. But it's worth reminding ourselves that Labor had to be pushed to meet its obligation on this front. It tried to stretch the 15 per cent pay rise to be paid over two years, but unions were outraged about this attempt to stall the full wage increase. They had to fight to make sure that aged care workers, overworked, underpaid, no career structure, leaving in the droves from the industry, weren't left behind by this budget. So against those bright spots, where are we on the broader set of recommendations that our committee made? Firstly, our report recommended a pay rise for all care workers, for childcare workers and disability workers. They are left waiting and they are facing a crisis in their workforce. Beyond pay, we re recommended a significant investment in 100 new childcare care centres, desperately needed in childcare deserts across our country, still waiting. We recommended the government find a pathway towards 52 weeks paid parental leave, the international standard on paid parental leave, which Australian women living in one of the wealthiest countries on the planet have a right to expect, still missing, left behind. There's much more that our inquiry re recommended that's missing from this budget. Free childcare, an increase in benefits that take people out of poverty, not a $2.85 increase in job seeker, less than a loaf of bread. There's so much more to be done in work and care. Much of it was affordable in a budget, held back by a fetish about the surplus and choices made by Labor, Labor's choices to put 
going easy on the tax industry and taxing them properly over the welfare of working carers. Choices, choices that put submarines before our kids' welfare. Choices that put the stage three tax cuts in front of making childcare free, paying carers what they deserve and lifting our paid parental leave to the international standard. There's so much to be done in reform of our workplace relations system. We're going to be working on that from the Greens' perspective to push further and faster for job security for so many of our workers. So this budget has left too many things undone. At a time when we could have gone much further, especially for the most vulnerable, we have to stop running our economy on the underpaid work of carers and the overwork of those who hold down jobs while they juggle their kids and all kinds of care. We must do better. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak on this urgency motion, and uh, it's rare that I, I stand here uh, speaking on a Greens urgency motion, and I do agree with the words of the urgency motion that the government has betrayed Australians. They have betrayed Australians, perhaps not in the same way as the Greens would characterise that betrayal, but the betrayal that I see most starkly is the betrayal of refusing to confront in this budget and in last year's budget the scourge of inflation. The scourge of inflation. Inflation is a secret hidden tax on every Australian. Whether you've got $10 in the bank or $1,000 in the bank or $100,000 in the bank, inflation makes you poorer. It reduces the spending power of the money you have. And if you are one of those people who needs to spend everything that they earn or that they receive in benefits, then inflation is a curse. Make no mistake. Inflation is a betrayal. And any government that fails to tackle inflation seriously and leaves all the heavy lifting in the inflation space up to the Reserve Bank is betraying Australians, every Australian, from the, uh, the, the poorest Australians to the wealthiest Australian. It is a betrayal of our nation. It is a betrayal of every business in this country. It erodes the buying power of every Australian. It means when they go to the shops, the, what their purchasing power is reduced. The basket of goods they can buy is smaller. It means when they go to fill up their car at the petrol station in the face of very high petrol costs, they also face inflationary costs. That means the value of the dollar in their pocket is less, which means instead of putting in a full tank of fuel, people are having to make the decision to put in half a tank of fuel. It leads to massive declines in real wages. And this is something I will dwell on, because those opposite those opposite keep insisting they are the champions of the workers, when in actual fact the record is very clear and the record is very stark that they are betraying, they are betraying every worker in this country through not tackling the curse of inflation. Throughout the period of the last coalition government, uh, contrary to the myths spread by those opposite, real wages actually grew. Real wages grew until we were hit by a once-in-the-century pandemic. Real wages grew under the coalition government. And what did we see with a government that uh, the Labor government came in, failed to tackle the curse of inflation, and we see real wages plummeting. The decline in the December quarter was four and a half per cent. A four and a half per cent decline in real wages in this country. A decline not seen in decades. And that is what inflation does. And that, why, that is why the failure of this government to tackle inflation in this budget, to tackle the scourge of inflation in this budget, is the ultimate betrayal of every Australian family, of every Australian business, of every Australian voter. And let's hear what some, some serious economists said about this Labor budget, because it's not just me saying this, it's not just those of us on this side of the chamber saying this. 
Stephen Anthony, Managing Director at Macroeconomic Advisory. This was Jim Chalmers' chance to really cut. In fact, he's a net spender. Over his two documents so far, his two budgets over the last 12 months, he's making life harder for the RBA and for working Australians because he's not getting to the meat of the problem. Chris Richardson from Rich Insights. If you wanted to do all the fairness stuff and at the same time keep the Reserve Bank on the bench, I'd say you need to take some tough decisions. And by and large, we haven't seen those tough decisions. I'd have thought after the surprise rate rise from the Reserve Bank last month that they were done and dusted. I'm less clear now that that's the case. And I have four or five other quotes from economists demonstrating that this government has failed completely to tackle inflation, and that is the ultimate betrayal. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Sheldon. Well, I was going to give a different speech, but I actually might give another one in light of the fact of just uh, that speech we just heard, because in light of um, the, the Greens uh, MPI, um, but the comments made before are just quite alarming. Like to think that, of course, there is nobody in this room that does not, in this Senate, that does not see that inflation is an important thing for us all to tackle. But to suggest that there is no policy initiative other than saying it's important to tackle is the only thing we should be doing. Because what they've actually done across the way and what they've been saying for a very long time when they were in government, because during the federal election, when you start talking about cost of living, what they don't understand, the cost of living is turning around and making sure that you have the capacity to pay for the costs that you're bearing. And that's why the important changes that were made by Labor during, uh, in the industrial relations field and the workplace relations field have been so critically important. But before the election, they wouldn't even support a dollar increase an hour to the least lowest paid workers in this economy when they refused to turn around and support it. And they still won't break ranks. You know, the Prime Minister has gone. He's about to go, go, go out of the seat of Cook. And still, they won't break ranks. He made the right decision. They still hold it to their heart. Cost of living is about a precept. It's about an actual idea about the fact how much money some people are making and how much little money others are forced to make. Now, you look at the situation with the campaign during the 2022 federal election, the Liberal and National Party refused to commit to funding the aged care pay order made by the Fair Work Commission. We just did. We just did in this election. So when they start talking about what needs to change, what they're really saying is they still stick with their old policies. Because if someone's going to pay for it, the ones that are going to pay for it are the ones that can at least afford to pay for it. Largely feminised industries like the care industry. Well, we've paid and we've budgeted that and we've turned around and made sure that we've put the money towards that 15 per cent wage increase, which is critical. Critical to the Australian economy, to the, to the public, and also to give value back into the aged care sector. Now, I always think about you know, when they start talking about inflation and what that means, what they're really saying is that you don't matter, because inflation we know, and everybody in here knows inflation is important. But what they're really saying, for example, the former Assistant Minister for Industrial Relations, Senator Stoker, said that the Senate estimates in 2021 that if gig workers are earning less than the minimum wage, then that's their choice because they entered into the contract. That's what they think. You can never get paid too less. How do you deal with the cost of living? You can never get paid too little, as far as they're concerned, on the opposite side. And of course, at the Senate Cost of Living Committee hearing on the 1st of March of this year, Senator Hume claimed that wages and working conditions are irrelevant to the cost of living. Now, that's what you've got to say when people get up here and start saying what the importance are to in, in tackling inflation, because actually they're not about tackling inflation at all. They're not about tackling cost of living. They're about turning around and making sure that they look after some certain particular interests. Now, the tripling the bulk billing incentives for GPs has been critical. Increasing job seeker for $40 per fortnight is a step in the right direction. Providing $500 to help with power bills for more than 5 million households is a step in the right direction. The Commonwealth rental assistance increase by 15 per cent is a step in the right direction. Delivering on the surplus for the first time in 15 years and reducing the deficit is important because it talks about our capacity for programs in the future. 
the things that many of us, not all of us, but many of us actually hold dear in this place. You know, delivering an extra $2 billion for social and affordable housing is critical. They are critical steps. Building a national emergency management stockpile, making multinational companies pay more in fair share of tax, supporting small business with cash flow support and extending the instant asset write-off. And there's a lot more. There's more and more and more. I've only got 37 seconds left. But what I'll tell you what we should say is that part of this important program forward is making sure that we've got money for affordable housing. It's a step forward. That is really critical. Building more homes by enabling an additional $2 billion in investment for more social and affordable housing is critical. And the power housing described it as a transformative reform that will enable the housing needs of more Australians to be met. The Housing Industry Association said we have to put something in place right now. The National Shelter described it as the most critical housing legislation to be brought forward for the past, forward for the past 10 years. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Grogan. Thank you. This really is quite the fascinating debate. I think if you'd sat in this place over the course of the last decade under the coalition government, particularly in those dying years, it would have been pretty easy to forget what good government actually looks like. So we do understand how confused you are when you look at the budget that was delivered yesterday and you see a balanced and sensible budget. We get that. But hang around long enough and maybe you'll learn something. Good government is all about pulling the right levers at the right time, making sure we balance all of the various areas of the budget. And as the Treasurer said last night, we've sought in all decisions to strike a considered and methodical balance. We need to exercise restraint and to keep the pressure off inflation. But we also need to help those people out there who are struggling, ensuring that vital services like Medicare and NDIS are delivered to those Australians who need them. Labor has delivered a, a budget that, that relieves that pressure. We've delivered a budget that is meaningful and that has significant cost of living relief for Australian households. Now, Senator Sheldon has given a good list of the kind of things we have uh, in that budget to assist Australians, including their power bills, health costs, supporting vulnerable Australians, creating more affordable housing and boosting wages. And regardless of the stunts and the grandstanding that we've seen today uh, in this place, ordinary Australians are relieved to have seen a balanced budget that will genuinely make a difference to their lives. We don't pretend that everything has been fixed here at all. Not in any of the commentary yesterday are we claiming that we've reached some sort of utopia. But on the back of the chaos that we have seen and on the back of the challenges within the budget, when we came to government, the things that we have had to fix, we have taken that first significant step that will fix the challenges that we see in this country over some time. Now, I have been on the um, select committee into the cost of living over the last number of months. And what became very clear to me in the first raft of, sitting, of, of hearings for that committee was that the Labor government inherited climbing energy prices due in large part to the energy policy chaos from those opposite. And so we confirmed that with the expert witnesses and the witnesses with lived experience. We also saw quite clearly from the housing experts and the housing peaks that the Labor government inherited a dramatic housing supply shortage, in part due to the inaction of those opposite. On every level, in every function of that committee, we have seen that this crisis claimed by those around me that was popped up miraculously on the 21st of May last year, that no, this was about long-term structural problems that had been baked into the budget by chaos and inattention and ideological beliefs. 
One of the things that is really critical and topical today, obviously, as we desperately try and debate the Housing Affordability Future Fund, is where we're going on housing. It's such a critical issue. We need to do more on housing, and Labor government is aiming to do more on housing, but we are getting blocked by our colleagues in this place. And who's standing in the way? The Liberal Party, the National Party, the Greens Party. One lot thinks that $10 billion investment is too small to be worth the effort, and so they'd rather have nothing. And the others think it's too easy to mismanage a $10 billion housing fund. Well, newsflash, you may be the rotting pinnacle of Australian politics, but we are Labor and we are in government and there would be no mismanagement of that fund. <laughs> housing Australia <laughs> Future Fund is a critical nation-building fund and that will deliver critical housing that we need, <laughs> that we desperately need in this country. And right now we are standing in this chamber with each of the other political parties, the Liberal Party, the National Party, the Greens Party, intending to block $10 billion in Thank housing. Thank you, Senator Grogan. Uh, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Well, in a cost of living crisis, the women in this country demanded and deserved bold action from this new government. And instead, we got more of the same half measures and more of the spin that we saw in the October budget. One of the most heartbreaking things in the budget last night, for me as the Green spokesperson on women, was that the government continues to ignore the calls from frontline domestic and family violence response services for enough funding so that they don't have to turn people away who seek their help. The government is continuing to ignore those calls, and those, the sector has been making those calls for nigh a year. They've been calling for a billion dollars every year so that they don't have to turn away people who seek their help. Now, the funding shortfall that was delivered last night will see uh, one in three women not able to get the help that they need. Women, children, people fleeing from violence, one in three of them will not be funded to get the help that they need. Those services will be underfunded. And while Labor continues to underfund those domestic and family violence support services, and while victim survivors are continue to be turned away from crisis accommodation or told by the legal helpline, I'm sorry, we just don't have enough staff to help to advise you, one woman is murdered every 10 days in this country. Now, the government's spoken about difficult choices in the lead-up to the budget, but many women are now facing an impossible choice. Stay in an unsafe home or leave and put themselves and their kids at risk of homelessness. Women are choosing between violence or homelessness, and this government had the opportunity last night to fix that. And instead, they kept uh, three, $254 billion in tax cuts to wealthy white blokes, while women and children fleeing violence are not going to get the help they need to keep them safe. That is an active choice by this government, and I was absolutely gutted to see that they refused to give those frontline prevention and response services the funding they need to save women's lives. What can be more important than that? Now, it's not just the Greens that are saying this. A number of media commentators um, and all of the fabulous feminist advocates and women's safety advocates, including Renee Carr um, from Fair Agenda, who says, um, we welcome the $723 million, but it still falls short of the billion that we need. Many women will be left without the support that they need to be safe and recover from violence. She says, we know that specialist services can make a life-saving and life-changing difference to women trying to escape violence or recover from sexual assault, but they need to be resourced. Well, you had your chance. How dare you condemn women into poverty and into violence and homelessness while dishing out money for submarines, fossil fuels, wealthy white guys and property investors? Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. The Prime Minister promised his government would leave no one behind. Yesterday's budget showed the opposite. It left behind refugees and asylum seekers. Those on welfare payments as a small increase is welcome but insufficient. People with disabilities, First Nations people seeking justice, homeless people, people on the public housing waiting lists, people on low incomes, renters without rent assistance and students. 
We're in a cost of living crisis which affects struggling families and communities who are battling. Yet this government, a Labor government supposedly representing the working class, is more concerned with providing tax cuts to the rich than housing, food and support for those who need it. Senator Shoebridge. I wanted to put the words of a young person on the record in this parliament because they're the ones with most to lose from a budget that doesn't invest in the future or indeed in the present. Everyone's talking about who wins and loses out of the budget. So let's have a look at and thank let's, so let's have a look at that and thank you to Taylor Tran uh, for, the, for these words. Young people, you win because hex loans will rise 7.1 per cent in June. You also get $2.85 extra in your pocket in job seeker and youth allowance to tackle the cost of living crisis and an extra $24 to pay your rent. You're welcome. The government promised they wouldn't leave you behind. Women, you win most of all. There's no new funding for access to contraception and abortion, which are two key benchmarks of the national women's health strategy. You didn't need it anyway. People in the arts, you win. A few million will be funnelled into our institutions of art, like the National Gallery, and a few more will go into attracting big budget screen productions into our backyards so you can be employed. Never mind the fact that it still costs an arm and a leg to study art at tertiary level under the Job Ready Graduates package. The government hasn't left you behind, so if you can afford to graduate, you win. The environment you won last night as well, never mind the fact that we should be aiming for net zero emissions by 2030. This budget delivers $11 billion for fossil fuel subsidies and just breadcrumbs for national parks. Apparently, we can have a just transition away from fossil fuels without spending any money. Just don't ask how. Don't forget stage three tax cuts are still on the table and the research shows that the economy is far from flourishing at the moment. So really, the Labor government's budget hasn't left anybody behind, not at all. Not unless you're talking about young people, students, women's health, the environment or the arts. Thank you, Taylor, for speaking truth to power in this debate. Senator Roberts. Thank you. I thank Senator McKim for this motion, which I support. The Albanese Chalmers government is indeed leaving people behind. This budget leaves behind everyday Australians struggling to make their mortgage or rental payment, struggling with rising electricity bills and rising grocery bills. This budget leaves agricultural and rural communities behind. This budget leaves small business behind. This budget leaves heavy industry and manufacturing behind. And this budget leaves the mining industry, mining communities and mining workers behind. Last night, the Treasurer repeatedly acknowledged the surplus came from increased revenue for the things we export, without once mentioning what those things are. Treasurer, say the name, mining, agriculture. These are paying for increased assistance to Australians in the budget. If the pool is not large enough to help everyone, One Nation has a simple solution, proven. Invest in productive infrastructure, drive, in, drive business growth and expand the pie so all Australians can save and have more. Thank you. Senator Steele, John. Last night's budget did not meet the needs of the disability community. Through a combination of their 8 per cent cap on the NDIS and so-called effectiveness measures, the Labor Party is moving over $74 billion, ripping it out of our NDIS over the decade. Disabled people see this as a stab in the back. It is a broken promise from a government and a minister who promised that they would uh, work in co-design on the big decisions. And it is a massive diversion from the road of reform and review that we were travelling down together in relation to the NDIS. The Greens are incredibly concerned that there was not a single dollar put towards implementing the recommendations of the Disability Royal Commission that will be handed to the government in September. Shame! And we are incredibly concerned and join with the community in fury and frustration that DSP was not raised across the board, that those on the disability support pension, most of them have been left behind in the budget. Well, the Greens are committed to working with the disability community to push back, to get this cap scrapped, 
to block any and all cuts. Together, we established our NDIS. Together, we defeated the Morrison government in relation to independent assessments. And together, together we will defeat this Labour government if they attempt to cap or to cut our NDIS. Senator Ormond Payne. Billions to the rich, subsidies to coal and gas, and rhetoric for the rest. The PM said that this would be a Labor budget. Well, I guess we now know what that really means. It seems that Labor has abandoned the economic base of their party just so they can win a petty argument with radio shock jocks over delivering a surplus. Rest easy, debt hawks. Your nest is safe with the Labor Party. I hope the victory lap for a Tory campaign slogan was worth it, because there are thousands of people in this country who were starving last night, and after the budget, they still will be. Thank you. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim be agreed to. That of the, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the uh, ayes have it, the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
be good. Right. Lock the doors. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Pocock on behalf of Senator McKim be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Cadell as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Mine has <coughs> order. There being 37 ayes and 17 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. There you go. I just ask senators if they're not participating in the next few items. Just leave the chamber quietly. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents listed on page four of today's order of business. Uh, Senator Shoebridge. Thank you, Acting Deputy. I, 
I think now is the appropriate time to debate on item 16, the Auditor General's report performance audit. It is. Okay, thank you. Um, it was it. Sometimes when you're looking at the way in which the Defence Department and Defence Procurement is oversighted in this place, there are moments when when powerful and loud truths are told. Sometimes you you. There's a document or there's a moment where you suddenly look under the bonnet and you see the way in which this institution, the parliament, fails to oversee what is now a $50 billion a year national expenditure on defence. And with the tabling of the performance audit on the Department of Defence's procurement of Hunter-class frigates by the, by the audit office today, we suddenly lifted up the bonnet and we had a look at how it all worked, and it was a sorry, sorry tale. Because in a project for the Hunter class frigates, which has a current price tag of more than $45 billion, $45 billion it turns out that when the Department of Defence entered the contract for a $45 billion project, project they got a number of tenders, and there were three, three quite competitive tenders that they got, one from BAE and a couple of others, three of them. And they said to the government, they said to the government, oh, we're going to do a tender process, don't you worry about it, and they set out the documentations. And obviously a core part of a public tender process is you check for value for money. Will this deliver what we want for value? In fact, it's hard to think of a more comp a more important element in a public tender process. So they said, does it deliver value for money? That's, that's what they said they test for. And they handed the document to the minister and they handed the document to the secret oversight committee and they said, that's what we're going to do. And then they went away and they signed Australian taxpayers up to a $45 billion project without, without ever checking value for money. They never did it. They never assessed the three competitive tenders against each other for value for money. They just signed off on the current project without ever checking. And then they, they, they forgot or they failed to tell the government that they'd never checked for value for money. They never told the government. But what I find even more astounding is that nobody in the minister's office checked. Nobody in the coalition government checked and nobody in the Labor opposition checked. They have access to secret documents in their secret committee, and they all come together in their secret committee and they think they're very important, and they see people with brass pips on their shoulders and they all feel they're in some secret club, and none of them, not one of them, ever asked, did they assess a $45 billion project for value for money? And has it delivered value for money? Well, absolutely not. It's already 18 months delay. It's already half a billion dollars over, bud over budget. And that doesn't include the 95 contract variations they've had to enter into to try and make the thing bloody well float. And they, they, they eventually, the original contract provided for a frigate that it turns out is inadequately armed, inadequately defended. So they keep tacking things onto it. More missiles, more, more ammunition, more anti-submarine um, anti warfare pro project uh, material. They keep tacking new things onto it. And so now it's so top heavy you can't take it out in the sea. You pop it out in the heavy sea, it'll tip over and capsize. We're going to have six hunter-class frigates that will only be able to be put out on the lake out the front of the parliament house here. And did I mention it's a $45 billion project? What is clear from the audit office is we've got a bunch of amateurs in there, or a bunch of noddies, or a mixture of the two, signing the Australian public up to billions and billions of dollars of expenditure without even doing the most basic due diligence. And if you want a shiver to go down your spine as a young person in this country or as a, ta or as a taxpayer in this country, this is the same bunch of noddies who have just been given a blank cheque for half a trillion dollars or more where they say they'll be able to deliver some submarines by 2060. Well, heaven help the Australian public.
Thank you. Uh, moving to the tabling of documents <laughs> and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Uh, Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Um, oh, I've got a Senator Dean Smith one here that I don't know if I should have that. So I, I do. Oh, sorry. Okay, I will. I'll do it. It's fine. Um, I present Scrutiny Digest uh, 5 of 2023 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills, together with Ministerial Responses to Committee Correspondence, and move that the Senate take note of the report. Thank you. And on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, I present Human Rights Scrutiny Report 5 of 2023. And on behalf of the Chair of the Education and Employment Legislation Committee, Senator Sheldon, I present additional information received by the committee as listed at item 17 on today's order of business. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Uh, moving through to are there any ministerial statements? Sorry, Senator White. Uh, I present Delegated Legislation Monitor number 5 of 2023 of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation and move that the Senate take note of the report. Thank you. No one else? Uh, we're moving to ministerial statements. Minister. On behalf of the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport, Regional Development and Local Government, I table a ministerial statement concerning the regional budget statement. Thank you. Uh, Senator Ormond Payne. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to Sorry. take note. Sorry, Minister. Uh, thank you. I table a document relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the Great Barrier Reef. Thank you. Is that it? No. Oh. So I think Senator Ormond Payne is seeking the call uh, to the speak to the previous document. Is that correct? Is that what you're speaking to, Bridget? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Senator McKenzie. I rise to take note of the regional ministerial budget statement for the 2023. 24 budget released last night and fully commend the response by the National Party leader David Littleproud and Australia's uh, Agricultural Shadow Minister in fully attacking and under disclosing the real truth about Labor's budget deficit for the regions. If you thought the Labor Party had it in for the regions after the October budget when they slashed over $22 billion of projects, programs and funding. Well, then they left it in absolutely no doubt last night. No new rail programs, no new road funding, no new regional uh, grant funding applications. The type of programs that have underpinned small communities and regional capitals need for community and social infrastructure. There was no vision in last night's budget for the nine million of us who do not live in capital cities, who actually underpin the wealth of this nation. The nine million of us that grow clean, green product that feeds and sustains us here domestically, but also we export to markets around the globe. To the resource sector, which I know my colleague Senator Macdonald uh, will go into in more detail shortly, that without the resource sector uh, from the regions, Jim Chalmers would absolutely have no surplus in last night's budget. So it is very much the wealth producing areas of our nation that have copped it in the neck from a Labor Party that only has its eye and concern on those in capital cities and suburbs. So there were new suburban programs, no worries, tick, 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 uh, but nothing for rural and regional Australia. 30 per cent of the population, 40 per cent of our economic output 
zero focus and concern of the Labor Party. Was there a plan to deal with rural doctor shortage? No. Was there a plan to more broadly deal with the lack of primary health care in regional capitals, uh, rural country towns and, appallingly, in remote Indigenous communities? No. No, there wasn't. Was there one additional childcare place for people in country towns and rural capitals? No. No. Talking a big game about childcare affordability, but well, what if you can't even access a place? The affordability of the place means nothing. And this Prime Minister, this government won the election. We live in a democracy and we respect democratic traditions. But he promised to govern for all Australians. And for those of us that don't live in capital cities in this country, we ain't feeling it. We are feeling forgotten and neglected. We've seen in the budget an increase in taxes on our trucking industry, on our buses, on indeed heavy vehicles, large and small, from the big BWs, B-dubs that take you know, cattle uh, from, where, from Cloncurry uh, to ports for li the live export trade, uh, for small delivery vans um, in regional capitals. Every single truck driver will be seeing an increase in the fuel excise to the tune of $1.1 billion over the next three years. That's a tax on every single thing we make and every single thing we produce. And yet the Labor Party likes to claim this budget isn't inflationary, and yet every decision they seem to make is not putting a downward pressure on inflation. The highlight of hypocrisy was last night the announcement of a tax on Australian farmers. For what? For a biosecurity system? Australian farmers aren't producing the risk to our biosecurity system. They're actually the ones that were yelling the loudest when this government fumbled our response to foot and mouth disease outbreaks in Indonesia and Bali uh, when they first came to power. It's Australian farmers who've been begging for a tight, sustainable biosecurity system that makes sure those who are the risk bearers actually pay for it. And they are the passengers that are coming through our airports. They are the importers, the shipping containers, Varroa mite. Now, I'm a former agriculture minister, brown marmorated stink bug, the things I didn't know about before I got that role, came in on imported Italian plastic chairs in a shipping container. And yet we refuse to charge those that are holding the risk. Or the big commodity, uh, bulk commodity importers, but they're not paying it. But who are they slugging? Australian farmers, whose skyrocketing um, input costs mean that they are price takers, something that this government— uh, you know, I tell you, John Kerrin would be absolutely rolling in his grave given his love for rural and regional Australia, his adoration for our agriculture industry, to see a Labor Party that doesn't, in their first serious budget, does nothing for rural and regional Australia. Stronger Communities Program, gone. Resilient Regional Leaders Program, gone. Enhanced Regional Security Screening Program for regional airports. Heaven forbid we might want to go see a specialist in a capital city and not have to drive seven hours to get there. Because you know why? There's a higher death rate in rural and regional communities? Because they just choose not to go. They can't afford a week off farm or a week away from the kids, so they just don't go to that specialist checkup. So airports are not just important for the import and export of goods. It is about access to health care, access to education, and economic benefits scrapped. The National 
um, freight and supply chain priorities, inland rail interface improvement program. We've heard this government scathing about the inland rail. I've been on the ground in regional New South Wales in the last couple of weeks. This is a project that is delivering economic benefits right now. This government has nothing good to say about rural and regional Australia. We've had enough of it. Absolutely had enough. You know why they don't vote for you? Because you don't back them. You don't back our industries. You don't back our access to services that you all take for granted. You want to talk about vulnerable people and communities? We know about them because we represent them. The top eight electorates with the lowest median income level in this country are national party electorates. Highest indigenous populations, national party electorates. So we don't come here with some confected concern, some theoretical, ideological approach to how to you know, make things more sustainable. We actually know what is required. And your consistent focus on funding huge stadium projects in capital cities, on funding Daniel Andrews' pet project of the suburban rail loop, $2.2 billion in Victoria, rather than putting in to road rail projects, which will lower emissions and take freight trucks off roads, make our roads safety, safer. That's another thing you've done. You've cut the road safety funding. So the only thing in this budget for us out in the regions is the quiet but succinct and very deeply held acknowledgement that this Labor Party doesn't care about those of us that don't live in capital cities, and it's hard to not think that is a very partisan decision to make. I commend my leader's response in the other place. I condemn Catherine King and her failure to deliver for regional Australia in this budget, Jim Chalmers and Anthony Albanese, uh, and I look forward to the re-election of a coalition government that will once again reinvest in the heart of our nation in rural and regional Australia. Here, here. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Senator Orman Payne, is this on the same uh, motion of Senator McKenzie? Yes. Then you have the call. Thank you. Um, thank you, Acting Deputy President. I too rise to take note of the statement by the Minister for Infrastructure, Regional Development and Local Government, Regional Budget Statement. As a regional Queenslander, the problems faced by regional Australians is very close to my heart. Regional Australia gives a lot to this country, providing most of the food to the cities and accounting for over half of the money brought in for tourism. But supporting our regions means listening to the people who live there. It means understanding that scratching the surface of regional Australia reveals dark depths of inequality and poverty particularly in many smaller communities. Regional, people living in regional and remote communities in this country die younger and from preventable causes at rates that are much higher than their counterparts in the capital cities. Bridging this divide means acknowledging the unique workforce and inequality problems that undermine prosperity in the regions. I've been travelling around regional Queensland in recent weeks, talking to specialists who work in my community, health specialists who travel into my community, regional doctors and other regional health workers. And they tell me that part of attracting a health workforce that is well paid to regional Australia also includes making sure that there are good homes and education options for these people and their children and professional development opportunities. Health intervention is welcome, but without a house to live in or a way to get there, a lot of regions are already struggling to retain the doctors and nurses and the medical undergraduates that they need to get the care that they deserve. Right now, there is a shortfall of social and affordable housing in regional areas of 227,000. 1,300 
is not even going to slice off the top of that. Rather than genuinely engage with the scale of this housing crisis, this budget has hand-waved away the millions of people who are struggling to keep a roof over their head and especially in the regions. Handing out $1.12 a day in rent assistance while rents increase 10 times faster is a fig leaf thrown into a fire. Getting serious about regional Australia means actually providing housing in regional Australia. I was elected by the people of Queensland to represent their best interests, and that means actually standing up and fighting for them, particularly the 81,500 people without an affordable home in regional Queensland. Funnily enough, for my colleagues in the room, scrapping stage three tax cuts would absolutely be a regional budget measure. Right now, 12 out of the bottom 20 electorates that are set to receive the absolute least from stage three tax cuts are rural and regional seats. These tax cuts do nothing for regional Australia. In Queensland, this means towns like Bundaberg, Charleville, Gympie, and virtually all of southwestern Queensland, from Toowoomba to the border, will get next to nothing in the stage three tax cuts. Scrapping the stage three tax cuts would be a regional measure. $40.4 million for schools in central Australia shows us the Labor Party knows that public schools aren't properly funded in this country. Plugging the funding shortfall for some schools for only two years does not go anywhere near far enough to put our public education system back on track. Right now, public schools are underfunded across the board. This is for pa felt particularly acutely in regional Australia, where I have spent the bulk of my teaching career, where families without resources to board their kids find themselves in a public school system with dwindling resources and capacity and lack of capacity to really provide for those kids. Teachers should not be stretched to their limits to provide our young people with the basic right to a world-class public education. Right now, the government could untie its hands from the arbitrary 20 per cent cap on funding, and they could lift every public school in this country up to and above the minimum school resource standard. Every budget that we don't do this is another year that cements our education system as amongst the most privatised and underfunded public sector in the world. Although regional Australia provides for over half of our tourism dollars, this budget has also extended nothing to protecting the environment that brings that money in. Throwing a couple of million dollars towards World Heritage properties does absolutely nothing towards genuinely curbing the incoming biodiversity loss we are facing. There has been no attempt in this budget to address the genuine causes of biodiversity loss or to ban native forest logging. It is not true that the government just can't afford better environmental protection. The budget showed us what Labor prioritises and it is not the environment. We also need to see genuine spending on emergency response capacity. An investment of $200 million per year is completely dwarfed by the billions that we continue to heap onto fossil fuel corporations to allow them to accelerate climate change and the resulting environment damage. The continued acceleration of the climate crisis means the impacts will grow in their cost and the devastation of natural disasters, and this will impact people in regional communities. The Australian Prudential Regulation Authority estimated that to, cover, to recover the economic losses caused by natural disasters, 
Australia must invest $3.5 billion every year just on natural disaster mitigation and resilience. But what did we see in the budget? $200 million per year. It won't even touch the sides. To realistically prepare regional Australia for insurance costs would involve not opening any new coal or gas projects. This is in line with the scientific consensus of how we avoid climate catastrophe. Resilience and mitigation investments should be drawn from the fossil fuel projects we currently subsidise. As a regional Queenslander and as your Greens representative for regional development, I'm here to fight for what the regions need, which is health, housing, a world-class public education, a healthy environment and a sustainable economic future. Thank you, Senator Ormond Payne. Senator Macdonald. Thank you. I rise to take note of the regional ministerial budget statement uh, given by uh, the shadow minister in the other place. Look, I, I want to acknowledge um, a number of the items that Senator Mackenzie has already spoken about. And also a number of the things that Senator Ormond Payne has spoken about, which is the very uh, real and distinct challenges for regional Australia. We live in a vast continent, and it is uh, Queensland in particular is one of the most decentralised uh, states in all the world, and yet uh, we do not seem to have reflected that in any way mm. in this budget. And it is just devastating to listen to uh, interviews with peak bodies, with industry sectors, with communities right across Australia as they have reflected on exactly that. Uh, things like the lack of funding for first and last mile road spending, the removal of water projects, uh, particularly in northern Australia but right across the country, uh, the inability of this government to be able to articulate a food security and commitment to agricultural uh, production across Australia. Uh, this is something that we do incredibly well, and food security and affordable food um, with good uh, nutritional content is something that we should remain focused on, not just for people who can afford to go to lovely farmers' markets uh, in the cities, but for people who live in really remote places where their food is not fresh, where the nutritional value has fallen and the prices are eye-watering. Uh, so those were some of the things that, in government, the coalition uh, committed to expenditure for a cold store in Alice Springs to try and improve the quality of food that's distributed to different parts of the country. Uh, but I digress, because there is so much to talk about in regional, regional Australia. Uh, education uh, is something that Senator Ormond Payne touched on already. I want to go further afield again, which is the geographically isolated children of the families who work on uh, remote cattle stations, remote mining communities, who are, are travelling, have travelling work, whether it's contract work um, or in remote communities. These kids and families have really been completely forgotten. Uh, they did so much uh, work prior to this election in speaking to Labor ministers about basic support to be able to allow these families to to educate their kids. This is something that during COVID a lot of parents got a first-hand knowledge of what it was like to educate their children. Uh, it's hard work and it's incredibly important work, but these kids are, are really missing out. There was no acknowledgement of a number of the issues that were raised uh, with the government and certainly no funding in this budget for them. Uh, I think about the, the forgotten flood, which is what I've taken to calling the floods in far north Queensland uh, that ran up through the Leichhardt um, uh, River um, and, and just devastated some of those communities. Tens of thousands of head of cattle strung up in trees and, and washed out to sea. Uh, communities where the water went, went um, above head level through homes, through little classrooms, mm. uh, and yet the um, Disaster Relief Agency has not even heard of some of these places because the government, uh, in their wisdom, decided that they wouldn't mobilise the army uh, and instead these people have been left completely forgotten, unable to apply for assistance because their address doesn't, fill, doesn't fit the government's formatted um, 
you know, five Smith Street kind of address profile, uh, which is just incredibly frustrating in this day and age. Um, we've talked about uh, um, the increase of uh, the Medicare, uh, but there is still no acknowledgement or limited acknowledgement of the additional training places that we need for, for nurses in regional places, for GPs mm. into regional places. Um, and, and so, you know, I just wonder how far, how deep we're going to get. Let the the region slide. How disadvantage, how much disadvantage we're going to bake in. Uh, we had plans to be continually upgrading services, roads, um, uh, black spot programs that, again, under this government, have just been completely politicised and and ripped away. Um, I watched the biosecurity announcement discussion mm. from the agricultural minister. Uh, just really distressing to see that somehow that farmers are now responsible, not the people who bring in uh, pests and weeds into this country, but it is farmers. And, and yet again in Queensland, the state Labor government is pulling biosecurity officers out of regional communities, which means, of course, that there is no front line, as the minister keeps talking about. Uh, the childcare subsidy. Um, you know, what a terrific announcement if it was available to all Australians, <laughs> uh, which of course it's not. Mm. Regional Australia, where there are very limited childcare centres uh, and even more limited childcare workers, means that this uh, budget package will only apply to people who live uh, in inner city. And again, another tragedy for uh, women and parents who are trying to go back to work to work in, in these really important sectors, uh, whether it be tourism or agriculture or—and this is the elephant in the room—is the resources sector, mm. because this budget has been funded by the strength of the resources sector, not through any action of this Labor government at all. In fact, Labor has done everything it possibly can to attack the resources <laughs> sector and the communities that keep this country going. Labor is using this resources windfall to hide their reckless spending, which, as economists and commentators over the last 24 hours have described, will only further drive up inflation, will further drive up interest rates and will further drive up the cost of living for Australians right across the country. So I guess it is true what they say that you will always pay more under Labor. But the resources sector, uh, which the, um, the finance minister was not able to mm. say iron ore, coal, gas, wasn't able to say those words. And in fact, in the Treasurer's speech last night, he spoke about things we export <laughs> and key exports. That was as close as he could come to acknowledging the industries that have paid the bills and That's allowed right. him to, to enjoy the coalition-led su surplus that he talked about last night. So iron ore exports, $121 billion is what that uh, earned for this nation. Coal exports, $128 billion. And gas, LNG exports, $91 billion. That's $464 billion that was bought into this country's uh, uh, account, uh, accounts, I'm sorry, and yet all the, this government could not even say that word, could not acknowledge those sectors uh, and those employees. 14.5 per cent of GDP. The workforce sector the income paid to those well-paid jobs, mostly in the regions, $38.1 billion. The PAYG ta tax take from those wages has funded much of the government's largesse mm. and yet could not acknowledge those men and women who are, who are working in those industries. Oil and gas, $16.7 billion but not an acknowledgement of them, of their industry or the people. Taxes, over 40 per cent of the corporate tax take came from oil and gas and yet no acknowledgement. Could not say thank you, could not acknowledge the risk, the hard work and the investment that these businesses have made to access, yes, 
Australia's resources, but no acknowledgement of the benefit that it provides to this country. 286,000 people directly employed by the resources sector and 1.1 million people indirectly supported no acknowledgement of the resources sector. And guess what? There is no easy replacement for those jobs. Mm. The minimum salary in those industries, $150,000 a year, and you are not going to get those polishing solar panels. What is our replacement that we propose uh, to fund this country's, uh, this country's fabulous first world lifestyle, particularly if you live in a city? So the regions have definitely got it in the neck. There has been almost no acknowledgement of the important infrastructure that's mm. required, uh, the support for education, for health, uh, for other services that are so desperately needed in regional Australia, and yet this Labor government would, uh, has completely sold them out. Thank, Thank you, you. Senator MacDonald. Uh, are you seeking leave to continue your remarks, Senator MacDonald? Uh, indeed I am. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, are there any further ministerial statements? No. We will move on to committee memberships. Uh, the president has received a letter requesting changes in the membership of a committee. Minister, Senator Ayres. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of a committee. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that Senator Waters replace Senator Furuki on the Education and Employment References Committee for the committee's inquiry into the impact of the paid parental leave scheme on small business uh, and that Senator Faruqi be appointed as a participating member. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Ayres be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, was that the extent of committee memberships? Yes. Uh, we move to messages from the House of Representatives. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives forwarding the following bills for concurrence. Inspector General of Aged Care Bill 2023 and Inspector General of Aged Care Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2023. I call the Minister. Uh, I move that these bills may proceed without formalities, may be taken together and be now read a first time. The question is that the motion moved by the Minister be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Inspector General of Aged Care Bill 2023 and Inspector General of Aged Care Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2023. Minister. I move that these bills be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speeches incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the debate be now adjourned. Be now adjourned. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The president has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Social Services Legislation Amendment Child Support Measures Bill 2023 for concurrence. I call the minister. Uh, I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that the motion moved by the minister be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to child support and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Minister. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that the debate be now adjourned. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the Safeguard Mechanism Crediting Amendment Bill 2023 and of the appointment of members to the Joint Select Committee on the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice Referendum. The President has received messages from His Excellency the Governor-General, notifying assent to eight laws, details of which will be incorporated in the Hansard. I call the clerk to call on business. Business of the Senate, notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senator Rice for the disallowance of a Social Security Administration declinable transactions and basics card bank account determination 2023. 
Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I move business of the Senate um, notice motion number one to disallow the Social Security Administration declinable transactions and basics card bank account determination 2023. Ah, Labor. Labor government. Labor government promises. We had some last night in the budget where the government promised that no one was going to be left behind. And yet we have got so many people that have been left trapped in poverty. On compulsory income management, we've got another huge broken promise from the Labor Party. The Labor Party has made so many promises when it comes to compulsory income management. When they were in opposition, they promised to repeal the cashless debit card. They ran an aggressive scare campaign against compulsory income management. They went out to pensioners telling them they might be subject to it in future. They had petitions. They had sign-ups. They were using compulsory income management to try and win votes. But despite this unfounded scare campaign, Sorry. those of us who knew the damage that compulsory income management was doing welcomed that finally, finally Labor was actually taking a stand. And in their scare campaign, they were actually acknowledging that compulsory income management was a bad thing and it didn't work. So it was so good to finally hear them come out like that. When we had comments by um, Labor, the Labor's social services spokesperson, Linda Burney, um, April last year. And when she was asked what Labor would do about the basics card, the party's social services spokesperson, Linda Burney, confirmed it would be voluntary. Our fundamental principle on the basics card and the cashless debit card, it should be on a voluntary basis, she said. If people want to be on those sorts of income management, then that's their decision. It's not up to Labor or anyone else to tell them what to do. At the moment, it's compulsion, and that's not Labor's position. Hear, hear, Linda Burney from April last year. Same day, we had reported on the ABC that federal Labor will make the controversial basics card optional within the first term of government if it wins the election next month, making a commitment that any broad-based income management should be voluntary. We never imagined how short-term and how cynical the Labor government's approach to compulsory income management would prove to be. Rather than ending compulsory manage income management, what we've seen is a rebranding. After a long campaign led by community groups to get rid of the cashless debit card, we've had a change of government. And what have we had? We've had a change of colour, a change of brand on the compulsory income management card. We've gone from the cashless debit card to the smart card. It's a different name, different colours on the card, but what hasn't changed in the policy? What this regulation that we are seeking to disallow does. It's part of setting up the framework for not just the ongoing cashless debit card. It's setting up a framework for legislation that is currently before the, the Senate committees, com Community Affairs Committee, to actually allow the expansion of the cashless debit card with no sunset clause that would allow the cashless debit card to be expanded into more geographic areas than it has been without having to come back to parliament. And compared with the old cashless debit card legislation where there was a sunset clause, no sunset clause. This regulation is part of setting up that framework to allow that to occur. So what does this regulation do? This is a disallowable. Um, in, this regulation is a disallowable instrument that would establish the framework for the smart card by specifying the bank account terms and conditions and blocked entities under the smart card. This instrument includes provisions that will enable the new enhanced income management regime to operate. So basically, this regulation, as I said, is part of setting up this framework for an expanded cashless debit card, an expanded framework. Labor have betrayed their pledge to voters at the last election. Under the Labor government, there are more than 20,000 people are still trapped under compulsory income management. We need a voluntary system 
that it genuinely supports people, rather than setting up a framework that continues compulsory income management, that allows compulsory income management to be expanded, that allows compulsory income management to go on indeterminately into the future. Why does this matter? Because we know from direct accounts, from academic experts, from community groups and from countless reports that compulsory income management is harmful. One person who has submitted to the inquiries, there have been many inquiries about compulsory income management over the years. One person submitted explaining, it was a struggle before to make it through fortnight to fortnight, but it's been even harder since I've been on the card because it's so much harder to budget not physically having the money in your hand, like being able to see I've got this much left. You've got to add bloody credit on your phone. You've got to have a phone that you can get on the internet and check the bank account each time. That's more money you've got to bloody spend just to check to see how much money I'm spending each time. Another person said, I've got difficulty with my eyes. I've been getting the start of cataracts and I find it hard to even see things. And you've got to check your balance all the time on my phone with this stupid in due thing and half the time I can't see it. But I'm of the old school where I can manage my money better without going through this in due crap. I've had so many hassles with it. A First Nations woman reported, electricity and certain basics, you can't pay your bills with it. I feel like a kid not being able to pay my power bill with my basics card and need to call Centrelink to ask them to transfer my money to me. A single mother forced to survive under compulsory income management outlined how compulsory income management made her life worse. I survive on cash. Everything I own is from garage sales or op shops. Most of my food comes from the farmer's market or roadside stalls. I cannot afford to buy new things from shops, nor can I afford to buy a lot of store-bought items. I'm not alone. It's the only way single mothers can afford to live and feed their children on what is the lowest paid yet most important job. So we have at this point a decade and a half of evidence that compulsory income management doesn't work. I mean, since the Howard government first launched the Northern Territory intervention in 2007, we've had community members, academics and parliamentary inquiries repeatedly telling us over and over and over again that the government should stop imposing compulsory income management. As Associate Professor Elise Klein, OAM, said recently, the government and its agencies have never been able to show a credible evidence base to support compulsory income management. Indeed, the peer-reviewed evidence base has continually shown that compulsory income management causes more harm than good. Regardless of peer-reviewed research showing the harms associated with CIM, the government continues to implement CIM regimes, the current bill included, based on ideology. This body of peer-reviewed research demonstrates numerous and inbuilt issues with CIM, including the exacerbation of financial hardship, experience of stigma and discrimination, and evidence of disproportionate targeting of Indigenous communities. One example of research published includes research from the ARC Centre of Excellence, the Life Course Centre, which examined compulsory income management in the Northern Territory. This research showed a correlation with negative impacts on children, including a reduction in birth weight and school attendance. The research implications are significant and draw attention to several possible explanations for, for the reduction of birth weight, including how income management increased stress on mothers, disrupted existing financial arrangements within the household and created confusion as to how to access funds. There have been independent studies, inquiries into bills, inquiries by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, academic reports, and still the government isn't listening. We had hoped that this Labor government would listen, and yet they are not listening. This regulation that we are seeking to disallow, I remind you, is setting up a framework to allow the expansion and the extension of compulsory income management. This is an evidence-based policy. It's ideology. And it's not even Labor ideology. It's ideology Labor is implementing because they're too scared of what the right-wing shock jocks will attack them if they deviate from Liberal policies. Of course, at the same time that we've got the, La the Labor government implementing these Liberal policies, they've been failing to act on what would genuinely make a difference. Why do people why is it perceived that people have a problem with managing their income? It's because they haven't got enough. 
we need to be increasing income support. The people forced to endure compulsory income management are the people relying on income support payments that are way below the poverty line. So the harm of compulsory income management is compounding the government's failure to lift in payment rates. Witness what happened last night. We've got a government that is not just expanding compulsory income management, but rather than lifting income management rates above the poverty line, we had the paltry increase of $2.85 per day. They managed billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars in tax cuts for the ultra wealthy, but they only managed to find $2.85 a day for people living below the poverty line. Here's a list of what $2.85 won't buy you. Won't buy your carton of eggs at $4.60. Won't buy you a two litre bottle of milk, $3.10. Won't buy you a five pack of instant noodles, that's $3.95. Won't buy you a kilo of onions, that costs $3.50. And it won't buy you a kilo of potatoes because that would cost you $3.80. The increase in the budget, it's an order of magnitude short of what's needed. But the government's got the audacity to say that people need harsh, punitive le measures controlling their lives rather than a guaranteed livable income that ensures people aren't living in poverty. So as we debate this disallowance and the impact of compulsory income management on people, and relying on income support. It's a stark reminder that poverty is a political choice. And of course, the Labor Party is desperate to talk about anything about other than how they are leaving people behind in poverty. When I asked the question of the, um, the finance minister today, I got no answers to my questions as to why we couldn't lift income support to above the poverty line. Lots of words about balance and targeted measures and compassion, but the reality is this government is leaving people in poverty and is expanding punitive measures that will only help to trap them in that poverty. So that's why they're arguing that somehow that they need to stick with the stage three tax cuts that are going to give $9,000 a year to every one of us in this place. That's $25 a day compared with the $2.85 a day that's been given to people on income support. I mean, the Labor Party are arguing, I understand, that this disallowance shouldn't proceed because it's got unintended consequences. They say that it's going to harm people who have voluntarily gone on to income management and so that, therefore, we should withdraw it. Well, I asked the Labor Party to look at the figures. This, as of December 2022, there were more than 20,000 people in the Northern Territory who were on income management. Of those, just under 2,000 were on voluntary income management. The vast majority of people who are going to be impacted by expanding this regime of compulsory income management are, are those 18,000 people on, in the Northern Territory. The remainder, there are 20,000 people, 10 times as many, they are on compulsory income management in one form or another. So let me say very clearly to the Labor Party, if you came to this parliament with a good bill and with appropriate regulations, one that genuinely fulfilled your promise to the people at the last election, that genuinely was actually implementing voluntary income management, then you would find a very different reception from us. But at this stage, all we have are promises. And the Labor Party have shown that their promises aren't really worth the airtime or the paper that they're written on. You need more than promises that things are going to get better. I mean, what we're told with the bill for which is going to solidify and, can, and put in place um, and expand compulsory income management is that the minister's got no intention of doing that. But that's what that bill allows. So I asked the Labor Party government to listen to those impacted by your policies. If you pay attention to what people with direct experience are saying, you'll make better legislation. But if you keep bowling up with centre-right proposals that are clearly designed to garner Liberal Party support, we will not allow you to maintain the pretense that this is progressive legislation. It's harmful, it's damaging and it's against the principles that you set out in opposition. The choice to bind up voluntary income management with a program that harms 10 times as many people through compulsory income management, despite all of the evidence, 
is a deliberate and cynical choice by the Labor Party, and voters across the country deserve better. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just want to put on the record the coalition senators will not be supporting the disallowance motion as moved by um, Senator Rice. Uh, we actually do support the government's transition in the respect of having people go off the basics card. Uh, we've long been saying, uh, even when we're in government, that the basic card is an old and clunky technology that it's very limiting for cardholders. Uh, it actually impacts upon their ability to, uh, to commerce and to engage with merchants. It's very limited in terms of the number of merchants that uh, accept the basics card compared to the cash -to debit card, which was based on the, uh, the Visa card platform, essentially meaning it's ubiquitous. It can be used at merchants all across Australia. There's over a million merchants that accept uh, Visa in Australia, whereas the basics card was something like about 16,000 uh, merchants and much, much limited and indeed you know, very limiting for individuals that were on it. So in that sense, we, we, we support uh, the, the individuals that are on income management that are on basics card to move on to the Im an improved technology. So I'll just make that point first. Um, we are, of course, disappointed with the abolition, though, of the cashless debit card because we know that it was having a profound impact upon the communities where it was in operation. Uh, for those who are in the Northern Territory that had already transitioned off the basics card uh, voluntarily onto the cashless debit card, they were already experiencing the benefits. But for those in uh, the other communities that had the cashless debit card and now no longer have that uh, in place, it's a, the, those communities are different. Uh, we heard from the communities across uh, the goldfields, the northern goldfields, in my home state of Western Australia, uh, who have been calling for it to be returned because they know what the community was like before the cashless debit card came in. A spate of suicide, a spate of, uh, uh, of, of dysfunction within the community. Then the difference when the cashless debit card was, was put in and, and its operation for a number of years, how it was having a, a really solid impact within the community, by no means a silver bullet. No one says that it, it was, no one said that it would be, but it was having a, a, an impact. Uh, places like uh, Wyndham in, in the East Kimberley, uh, the, the school there used to have to, on a Monday morning, provide uh, additional food for children uh, for their breakfast program because kids were going hungry and so they come Monday morning having not had much to eat over the weekend and, the, and really their, their square meals are in these, some of these communities is provided by the school and so they would come on a Monday morning and the school had to provide extra food on a Monday compared to the Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday and, uh, and Friday. And but because of the cashless debit card, they found that they were not having to provide as much food uh, on a Monday. So those sort of impact. So these communities saw what difference it made in their community, uh, and then now they're seeing a bit of a return, and, and they're hoping that it doesn't go all the way back to where what it used to be like. But the signs are that that it will, and there is. I was just in Kununurra myself only only a week ago, and you could see already the dysfunction, and you could hear and hearing from community disappointed at its, at its abolition. But uh, we, we do support the fact that um, people are able to move off the basics card and onto an improved technology. I just want to point out, though, that um, the government likes to talk about this new smart card, this new, new technology, this new enhanced card, as if it is something new. But the reality is we know that it's not. It actually is just the cashless debit card, as Senator Rice actually correctly pointed out. It's just uh, rebadged. It's just a, a, a card with a just a, a cashless debit card with just a different colour, and uh, maybe it's a prettier plastic. That's right, Senator Cadell. Uh, it, it's, it's no different. In fact, uh, if you go onto the department's website, and I'm happy to table this if it's required. You go onto the, the Department of Social Services website. It, it, it has got a comparison between the basics card and it's got uh, a list of uh, the, the differences between the basics card and the new uh, smart card, but it also says it lists with it the enhanced income management and cashless debit card and smart card, lump them all together because they are exactly the same card. They are exactly the same feature. The government, in its uh, description of 
as it's providing it to individuals in communities that are making this transition off the basics card are are provided with information about the benefits of the new card, such as uh, um, product level blocking. Well, that was an enhancement of the cashless debit card that we put in place when we were in government. So uh, while we're, we're supporting, uh, we're not supporting the disallowance, and we're uh, supportive of the government's transition in this regard, uh, we we do call on the government to put back in place uh, and respond to the needs of communities that are calling for the cashless debit card to be reinstated do that because it's, it's, it's a matter of life, uh, it's a matter of urgency in, in these communities and I encourage the government to, you know, if, if there's a backflip you can make in relation to an election commitment, granted it was an election commitment to abolish it, uh, if there's a backflip you can make it's one that we will support you making because it is absolutely necessary. In fact, you should make it available to other communities that would like to see it as well. Thank you. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Well, um, thank you for uh, that uh, contribution, Senator uh, O'Sullivan. Um, and I think, um, and, and for outlining the opposition's position in relation to this, um, it is correct to say that the uh, regulation that's the subject of this uh, proposed disallowance uh, is part of the government implementing its election commitment uh, to uh, abolish the cashless debit card. It is a necessary step uh, in that process and it is utterly consistent uh, with what, uh, what the government's approach on this has been. And at the end of her contribution, Senator Rice finally made it clear what this is actually really about. It's Greens party partisanship. The government won't be supporting uh, this motion. The determination that's the subject of the disallowance allows for the establishment and maintenance of existing basics cards, bank accounts, which are central to the operation of enhanced income management. It allows bank accounts to be created for enhanced IM participants, restrictions to be put in place on the purchase of excluded goods and services. It allows merchants who sell excluded goods or services to be blocked and it sets out how money can be transferred between enhanced IM accounts and when those accounts can be closed. The determination names in due and the traditional credit union as the entities that can provide accounts for enhanced income management and the terms and conditions for using those accounts. The determination by enabling enhanced income management ensure participants who are previously on the cashless debit card and people who wish to volunteer in previous trial sites and new referrals from the Family Responsibilities Commission in the Cape York region are not issued a basics card. The determination is made by the Secretary of the Department of Social Services under section 123SU and subsection 123SV2 of the Social Security Administration Act 1999. The Act provides that the qualified portion of payments must be paid into a basics card account. What would disallowance mean? If the Senate voted for this stunt, what would ensue? If the instrument is disallowed, basics card bank accounts would cease to exist and there would be no legislative authority for the Commonwealth Government to pay the qualified portion of payments to individuals subject to enhanced income management. This means payment recipients on both the existing basics card and those who volunteered and transitioned onto the smart card would not be able to have payments received into those accounts, some of the most vulnerable people in Australia. The result would be that people would be unable to receive between 50 to 90 per cent of their social security payments, as depending on their specific eligibility for enhanced income management, between 50 to 90 per cent of a person's payment is restricted for spending on excluded goods and excluded services that can cause harm. So it has an impact on real people, real people. Now, the truth is, if this, if, this was, if this was endorsed by the Senate, where would real people be left? Because, because people can't eat Greens Party memes. Social media posts don't put shoes on kids' feet. Right? Uh, irresponsible posturing can't help families either. It is utterly astounding. Utterly astounding. Probably not surprising. 
because ordinary people are just a backdrop for Greens party stunts these days. It's been put to me that the Greens party might not understand what it is. I think they do understand. I think they do understand. People are just a backdrop for social media posts. People are just a backdrop for stunts and slogans, an utterly callous disregard for the interests of the people that they claim to be concerned about. Real people with real problems who need the government's support. Now, I'm happy to engage. I have engaged from time to time uh, with Senator Rice and Senate Estimates about the real challenges that exist in this policy area. Very happy to continue to do that. There are serious questions there that will continue to be examined year after year, and I suspect that there is a lot more work uh, that all of us have to do. But spare us the stunts. Spare us the stunts, particularly when they are so harmful. Now, the approach on this issue matches completely the approach that the Greens Party have taken thus far this week on housing, making false claims. False claims like the one that was just repeated over there that the outcome of, in, of uh, the Senate passing the HAF bill, the housing bill, would be 1,200 homes in every state. They know that's dishonest. They know it's dishonest. But they continue to say it. Why? Because it looks good on the social media post. Because their job, the Greens political party's job, is not to deal with the substance. It's to try and denigrate the government whatever it costs, whatever it takes, no matter how dishonest the proposition. There is an enormous gap between what they say and what they do. You only have to look at what they say nationally in here about housing and how much they care about it and what they do when they go back home. It is a complete yawning gulf because when they go back home, they are opposed to housing development. When they go back home, there isn't a social housing development that these characters haven't opposed. Whether it's transition housing, you will find Greens Party councillors and Mr Chandler Mather, or whatever his name is, out there opposing those developments every single time. Show me one that's been supported. What is the government's plan here? The housing bill will support 30,000 homes. The government's Build to Rent initiative tax and depreciation uh, enhanced for build-to-rent projects, the industry says we'll build 150,000 homes, uh, expanding uh, eligibility uh, for construction schemes, uh, the National High Housing Finance Corporation, an extended guarantee of $2 billion, which means more community housing providers building more homes, and a 15 per cent increase the biggest increase in our history to Commonwealth rent assistance. That's what the government's bringing to the table in terms of housing. Cooperation with the states, trying to drive more homes at an unprecedented level. Right when what's really going on out there, enormous capacity constraints, enormous challenges for the government. And what is the choice in front of the Greens political party this week? But it's not about making it better. It's will there be 30,000 additional homes or will there not? Are we 30,000 more homes or 30,000 less homes? And if you are queuing for rental, as you see so many young people have to do, if you are homeless, if you're in the queue for public housing, if you're finding rent unaffordable, if the Greens political party vote against this proposition this week, then you know that the outcome of what they will do this week will mean 30,000 less homes for ordinary Australians. And the truth is, ordinary people, it will never trouble you. It will never trouble you. 
Ordinary people can't shelter under slogans. You can't house your kids in a Greens Party meme. This is utter hypocrisy. They think all of this this week is clever politics. Right? That, that it's a sort of student politician, Trotskyite, clever politics. This is a manoeuvre where they feel they have to draw at least some line where they pick a fight with the government. You can imagine the discussion in their party room about how clever this is. But on this disallowance and on the housing bill, there are real people involved, real people, and there are real consequences. There are real consequences of what it is that you're proposing to do. If the Senate turned around, if if the coalition didn't do what uh, Senator O'Sullivan has said that they will do, if if the Senate endorsed the proposition on the disallowance that Senator Rice has moved, there would be profound negative consequences tomorrow for ordinary people who need the government's support. And if this week the Greens political party doesn't do the right thing on the housing bill, more people will be homeless. Mm -hmm. If the Greens party doesn't do the right thing on the housing bill, there will be less housing stock, which will have an impact on prices in terms of rent and prices in terms of housing cost, and it will be directly your responsibility uh, for getting in the way of 30,000 homes. Now, you might not like the government's approach. You might want to argue for more and, you know, honestly go your hardest. That's a good thing. I don't mind there being some tension around the place about policy propositions and arguments for more ambition. There's plenty of that within the Labor movement and the community more broadly. But what I do think is utterly reprehensible is when there is a chance to do something for ordinary people, you knock it over and ordinary people suffer, young people suffer, all for the sake of a social media post, a bit of sponsored digital advertising and a warm inner glow for people who are always going to live in comfortable homes. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise to speak in very strong support of my colleague's disallowance motion this evening. Now, I think we all have spent, or at least most of us, spent some time in this chamber. We'll remember that under the previous government, where Labor campaigned to abolish the cashless debit card and last year, in this very place, we passed a bill to do exactly that. Now, what the Labor government did not make such a fuss over was that the cashless debit card would remain in the Northern Territory. And it was simply going to be rebranded, reintroduced, of what essentially is the cashless debit card known by another name. And that new name is the smart card. The smart card will be reintroduced under the same guise of what the cashless debit card did. It's just a different name, just a different colour. It's like getting a Christmas present at Christmas time and just re-gifting it, you know, wrapping it up in something different and giving the same gift to people, because that's exactly what this Labor government are doing to black people in the Northern Territory, as Senator Rice has already stated. Now, this government want you to believe, they absolutely want you to believe that they're simply just improving the technology, but this is far from the case. It's sneaky, it is downright dangerous that this framework will actually expand the minister's power to roll out yet again into our First Nations communities in the Territory it's compulsory income management in new areas. But not just in the Northern Territory, also into other areas right across this country. It is operation by stealth. It is dishonesty by this Labor government who made promises, 
pledge to voters during the election period, campaign to abolish the cashless debit card. Shame that you would do that and mislead our people to believe. Now, it doesn't, obviously doesn't count as a fulfilling election promise when you're just reintroducing it under another name. So it's actually what you call different and upgrading of technology. Now, this regulation that we are moving to disallow today seeks to establish an actual framework for the smart card. And it includes a bank account, terms and conditions, and blocked entities. So this regulation feeds into the Social Security Administration amendment of the Income Management Reform Bill of 2023, which we're expecting to come to this place in due course. And rest assured, people like Senator Rice, the Community Affairs Committee Chair, and myself and the other Greens that sit here in this block will be fighting this bill to make sure people understand that the opposition, the coalition, dug the graves and these fellows are just loading the bodies up, lowering them. Because that's what's happening in this country right now to people in the Northern Territory, and it's a disaster. Last night we saw a budget handed down that left most, some of the most vulnerable people behind. You know, and Senator Ayres wants to talk about housing in uh, the Northern Territory and other places and people being left behind. I don't know if he's visited any of the tin shacks in the Northern Territory and other places in Northern Australia. My home state of Western Australia, remote housing is not even up to scratch, so maybe they could start there. The failure to end compulsory income management is another disappointing move by a so-called progressive government. We'd hoped for much more when this government came into power, but we were deeply disappointed. Now, under Labor, 20,000 people are going to be still trapped under income, compulsory income management. We need a voluntary system that genuinely supports people. How hard is that for people to understand that this is the support people need? Not restriction, not compulsory management. They're all your words. Principle of self-determination is what is important here. The current Minister for Indigenous Affairs stated, as Senator Rice already said, our fundamental principle on the basics card and the cashless debit card is to be on a voluntary basis. What happened to that? Disappeared into thin air all of a sudden because we got a bit of pressure. We copped a bit of media flack from the right wing, from those sitting opposite. And if people want to be on those sorts of income management, this is what the minister said, then it's their decision. It's not up to Labor or anyone else to tell them what to do. And at the moment, it's compulsion. That's not Labor's position. Pretty big swing, pretty big shift, Labor, that you would now change your minds and put this back in train. Put it back in a regulation in a, in, in a way that is going to harm people. So the opposition, the government team up and pull a swifty. But while they're in opposition, this government also said the voluntary basis, and it's something that we over here on the Greens, as Senator Ayres has already pointed out, absolutely support. We welcome a bill that will actually make it voluntary, provide that right across this country to make it voluntary. We would gladly pass a bill that makes income management uh, voluntary, and it's consistent with both the rights and the needs of people on this card, especially First Nations people. Understand how disproportionately this affects First Nations people in this country. People like uh, Senator O'Sullivan want to talk about being in the gold fields and you know, what's happening there. People will disproportionately be affected because we are the welfare recipients. It is the gift that keeps giving in this country to my people. It's the legacy of colonialism in this country that keeps giving, keeps restricting, keeps stripping away rights 
of First Nations people in this country. Now, advocacy groups have been crying out for years. My predecessor, Rachel Seaworth, former senator for Western Australia, worked on this for many, many years here in this chamber, particularly around the Northern Territory intervention. And we've heard all of the stories swirling around about compulsory income management comes in and it'll solve the crime rate. It'll solve all the issues. It'll solve the black problem of this nation. It will not. And I can honestly tell you there are many reports, many inquiries that have been and talked about the impacts of compulsory income management, both in this place, other parliaments across this country, the advocacy groups and charities and policy think tanks that we've all sat around, the talk fest that people love to have about this. But when First Nations groups tell governments, allow them to come and sit in the dirt, and tell governments that income management will be harmful, will disproportionately affect our people, they all of a sudden become deaf. So I'll remind the government of the 2018 report from the National Audit Office that found that a five-year trial on the cashless debit card actually cost the government $170 million. And there was absolutely no evidence provided in that report that the cashless debit card worked. In short, compulsory income management is a bad policy. It is one of the worst. It is unnecessarily restrictive. It prevents people from buying things they need. The amount of cash that can be withdrawn is still limited. People don't get enough money to get these payments in the first place. We've already heard about the dismal amount that people are getting and got out of this budget last night. But on top of that, they can't buy items at garage sales, they can't go to op shops, they can't go on Facebook's marketplace, they can't go to food markets, which all generally sell cheaper products and produce yep. that actually help people to manage their finances. And it's what these programs are supposed to be doing. They're supposed to be helping people. We don't build a system that impacts on people's quality of life and say, uh-oh, well, we're done, and walk away. But this is what's happening when we continue to pursue this pipeline dream of income, compulsory income management in First Nations communities in particular. I'm going to read some quotes. The bill from the APO NT, and they said that the bill continues to make a trend of making income management, and in particular compulsory income management, the permanent feature of social services in Australia, without adequate consultation. The legislation effect of this bill is the opposite of the Albanese government's pre-election statements that the income management should only occur on a voluntary basis. So this is advocacy groups. Central Land Council came into has come into opposition. How many times do we have to say until the government listens to our voices? Since income management was introduced in 2007 as part of the Commonwealth's intervention in the Northern Territory, we have said no, 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 repeatedly. A different card, a different colour, and it's all for the same purpose. It's to control our lives. Guess what? We are not guinea pigs. CLC calls on the government to end all forms of compulsory income management now. Now I could stand here all day and read the endless quotes that I have printed out in front of me from individuals, from organisations that clearly state why income management is a bad policy. But for the sake of the chamber, I'm going to leave it there and urge the members of this place, as I believe both sides of the chambers who support Income, uh, compulsory income management, to go and read the submissions, the submissions that have been provided as part of this inquiry that clearly outline and articulate very well the specific harm that will come from compulsory income management that have already occurred in some of these communities. 
Now, this it really puzzles me as I stand here tonight in this chamber and begs the question that in the year of the voice, why this Labor government is not only walking back their election promises and have done a complete backflip on their position uh, from opposition, but they are also ignoring the clear voices of First Nations people, strong First Nations people who don't want compulsory income management in their communities. It's shameful. You cannot say you're giving the right self-determination, a voice to parliament, to people, and in the other hand, take it away from them, because that's exactly what's happening. Compulsory income management doesn't help people manage their finances better, and in fact just punishes them for being on welfare payments. It pushes them further away from financial freedom. We know that compulsory income management becomes this glossy document, things that get wheeled out, you know, wonderful, what do they say, social media clips about the racist stereotypes, the dog whistling to the racists in this country who want to perpetuate and continue those stereotypes against First Nations people. When people need support, they need support to live a dignified life in this country. Now, income, compulsory income management fails to actually address the underlying issue of poverty. And it's especially true for people who are living in remote Australia. I urge this Labor government to start listening to the voices of both key First Nations organisations that have called for an end to compulsory income management and to work with those communities to provide housing. Hey, there's a start. You want to talk about housing? Start there. Education, employment and other much-needed community-based and culturally appropriate programs and services that help to actually address the issues that are happening in First Nations communities across this country. How about looking at the intergenerational poverty? Because some people are not just poor in their pockets, they're poor in their mind. The healing of trauma, the unacceptable rate of mental health and suicide in our communities. How about you start there first, instead of continuing down this line of compulsory income management? Senator Waters. Thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy President. And I rise with such pride to follow amazing contributions from my colleagues, Senator Janet Rice and Senator Dorinda Cox, following in the long years of former Senator Rachel Seward's opposition to this punitive, insulting and ineffective cashless debit card, which is what we've got before us by another name. The Greens have opposed this paternalistic, frankly racist uh, policy ever since it was first introduced in this place as part of the Northern Territory intervention in 2007. And as a Queensland senator, it first came to my particular attention when it was rolled out in Harvey Bay and Bundaberg as a so-called trial site, where it wreaked havoc on so many people's lives, people who were already on the breadline people who, frankly, because they had so little money to live on, knew exactly how to use it to get by. People who don't have a lot of money are the best money managers that you will find. They have to be because they have no other choice. And I remember meeting with community organisations, including the Say No 7, who were a really strong community-based group that had formed to support each other to uh, oppose this ridiculous and insulting uh, cashless management uh, approach um, to them in their lives, and I stand in awe of their strength and determination. And I'm sure they were celebrating when the pre-election commitment from the now government was made that they would get rid of compulsory income management, and that it could be kept as a voluntary scheme if people wanted to sign up to it. Well, that's up to individuals to choose to do that. I'm sure they were celebrating that. I'm sure so many communities that felt controlled 
inappropriately so, dictated to by their government, welcomed that announcement. And so, like them, I share the incredulity that here we are with uh, an instrument, which is exactly why we're seeking to disallow it, that doesn't dispose of compulsory income management. It doesn't do what you said you were going to do. It actually just preserves this really bad policy and calls it a different name. Please don't do that. <laughs> I'm sure you're across the evidence of how ineffective and punitive this policy was. And I've got a few really moving quotes um, from community members as well as from experts that I'll share with the chamber in the course of my contribution. So perhaps if people are new to this debate, they can realise that this is in fact really terrible policy. Um, but here we are again. I thought we'd killed this dreadful beast and it's being thrown another lifeline by this government who won't even have the courage to name it for what it is and instead are trying to say, oh, it's just a technology improvement. But actually, you can change the name and the colour of the card, but it's still the same policy. And that is absolutely heartbreaking. It's a betrayal of the pledge that you um, and your relevant minister made before the election. Now, um, just a bit of a history recap. Uh, um, cashless uh, debit card was first introduced and it only applied to First Nations communities. It was effectively a racist policy. Um, the coalition government, rather than fixing the racism that underlined this terrible policy, decided to simply apply it to some white communities as well. So it wasn't just racist policy, it was just bad policy now. And now it's those trial sites, many of them have been uh, concluded, including the ones in Queensland, and I welcome that. But we still have compulsory income management in many First Nations communities. And the bill that we passed earlier in this particular instrument doesn't stop that. So we're back to just having plain old racist policy that is still bad policy. But, and I, and I want to honour the words that Senator Cox just shared, like in, when we're talking about having a voice, how dare you continue to have these policies that apply to First Nations communities and claim that it's to try to help people? You can't dictate what people can do with their meagre money and also claim that you're trying to help them. It doesn't work. The evidence is so clear. That it doesn't, this, this, this cashless um, debit card doesn't give anyone a job, doesn't give anyone financial management skills, and moreover, it fails to recognise that they already have financial management skills, and frankly, that they already have the right to decide what they can do with their own money. Which brings me to the point about poverty, which Senator Rice spoke so eloquently about in her contribution. Rather than talking about controlling people and what they can do with the meagre amounts of money um, and where they can spend it and what this card is called and whether you've got to go to a separate um, special machine and hope that the power hasn't broken down or there hasn't been some other tech fault so that you can't actually um, pay for your meal. We should actually be talking about raising the rate of income support so that people aren't having to make these terrible decisions between paying the rent or you know, buying an extra blanket for the bed. And it's exactly why this cashless welfare card, well, uh, cashless debit card is so ineffective because the cash economy can be really helpful at making ends meet. When I spoke to the community in Harvey Bay and Bundy, they said, look, we go to the fruit and veggie markets. They only take cash. They certainly don't take what was then the Inju card because you had to have some special machine. You had to stand in a separate line to use that special machine at some of the outlets that did service it. So you already felt like a complete um, leper, for want of a better word. But often you couldn't use that card at um, secondhand clothing stores, at fruit and veggie markets, you couldn't use it at the uniform shop at the school to try and get a second-hand you know, skirt or shirt for your kid at school. It was actually inhibiting people's ability to live on the meagre amount of income support that they were getting. It was making things worse. That was the evidence that we heard from the community time and time again, and that's why this was such a bad policy and that's why everyone was so pleased when in opposition the Labor Party said they would get rid of this compulsory income management. And yet what we have before us is an instrument 
that actually will give the minister the power to roll out compulsory income management in new areas. It effectively allows the cashless debit card to apply nationally in a compulsory sense, despite the promises that were made before the election that that was the end of compulsory income management. Now, if that's not your intent, well, good, but change the law so that future governments can't use these same instruments and that same bill that was passed um, to roll it out in a compulsory sense. We've got no confidence when these instruments are giving you the ability to continue and expand compulsory income management when you said you were going to get rid of it. It is a betrayal of the pledge that you made to people before the last election. And I understand that there's more than 20,000 people that are still on compulsory income management. Um, many of those are First Nations communities. Most of them are in the Northern Territory. Um, and, you know, and I know there are people in this place that are really passionate about justice for First Nations communities um, in the territories. And that's what's particularly heartbreaking about this policy, that it really, it's, it's, um, thumbing, um, it's thumbing the Labor Party's nose at those within their own ranks that care deeply about this issue. So I've talked about how this is institutionalised paternalism. I've talked about how it doesn't work, it doesn't create jobs, it doesn't give people skills to manage money or recognise that actually they already have those skills. Um, I've talked about how this um, is really, it's incredibly discriminatory, but I mean, they're just the views that, that our party holds and that the community has shared with us. But I wanna share with you some um, views of uh, First Nations organisations and other academics who are also um, saying what we're saying. Firstly, APONT, the Aboriginal Peacogs in the Northern Territory, have said, and I quote, APONT reminds the government of our support for the repeal of the cashless debit card. We note that while this has allowed some participants to exit income management or voluntarily opt into income management, this is not the case for the majority of NT participants who remain on compulsory income management. Therefore, Aboriginal people in the NT have suffered the longest under this regime. And this um, bill and instrument does nothing to change this. Um, I continue, despite the Albanese government's stated intentions of consultation or stated long-term aim that income management is on a voluntary basis, it's important to view the practical and legislative effect. Um, the bill, and of course we're talking about the bill of which this instrument is associated, continues the trend of making income management, and in particular compulsory income management, a permanent feature of social services in Australia without adequate consultation. The legislative effect of the bill is the opposite of the Albanese government's pre-election statements that income management should only occur on a voluntary basis." End quote. That was from um, APONT, the Aboriginal Peacogs in the Northern Territory. Um, in a similar vein, the Central Land, Land Council said, our full council recently met at Spotted Tiger at this meeting, our council reiterated that they do not support compulsory income management, and they made this statement. How many times do we have to say it until the government listens to our voices? Since income management was introduced in 2007 as part of the Commonwealth government's intervention in the Northern Territory, we have said no. A different card, a different colour. It's all for the same purpose, to control our lives. We're not guinea pigs. The CLC calls on the government to end all forms of compulsory income management now. Pretty powerful stuff. Unfortunately, it seems to be falling on deaf ears. Um, the Arnhem Land Progress Association made some similar um, remarks, and they say compulsory income management was imposed on Arnhem Land Progress Association's member communities in 2007 as part of the Northern Territory Emergency Response, better known as the intervention. When it was forced upon our members, they were subject to discriminatory and false assumptions that they were all alcoholics, family violence offenders and problem gamblers. As ALPA's chairman has stated, the well-being of Indigenous Australians depends on them having self-agency, choice and control over their lives. Hence, the ALPA board believes that regardless of what design a future income management program takes, participation in the program must always be voluntary. Sensing a bit of a common theme here, and um, 
we thought the government had listened, but sadly the bill and the instrument before us indicates otherwise. Um, there were some really uh, learned academics that um, contributed uh, to this policy space. Professor Matthew Gray um, and Dr J. Rob Bray um, shared this. The evaluation data does not provide evidence of income management having improved the outcomes that it was intending to have an impact upon. Indeed, rather than promoting independence and building the skills and capabilities, new income management in the Northern Territory appears to have encouraged increasing dependence upon the welfare system, and the tools which were envisaged as providing them with skills to manage have rather become instruments which relieve them of the burden of management. Um, Professor Elise Klein, which I know Senator Rice already uh, has quoted from, she's a, a well-known expert in this field, said the government and its agencies have never been able to show a credible evidence base to support compulsory income management. Indeed, the peer-reviewed evidence base has continually shown that compulsory income management causes more harm than good. Regardless of peer-reviewed research showing the harms associated with, continue, uh, with compulsory income management, the government continues to implement compulsory income management regimes based on ideology. Economic Justice Australia said the government has made commitments to ending compulsory income management in recognition that it is not effective. The government's intentions are irrelevant if the legislation it proposes permanently entrenches compulsory income management by another name. The absence of a sunset clause enables compulsory income management to continue indefinitely without any time frame for transitioning to alternatives. Um, now, I don't have much time left, but I do want to share what the Northern Territory Council of Social Service um, says. Um, NTCOS main uh, quote, maintains its position supported by an evaluation into income management that compulsory income management is a failed policy that unfairly targets and negatively impacts Aboriginal people, and it has not delivered the intended outcomes. NTCOS notes the intention of the Commonwealth to undertake extensive consultations uh, with communities, First Nations leaders and other stakeholders on the long-term future of the regimes, but as previously stated, NTCOS supports calls from organisations, including the Tendentia Council, that withdrawing compulsory income management must be a considered process designed and informed by consultations with ARCHOs and community leaders. However, with extensive feedback and evidence from Aboriginal communities, leaders and organisations uh, clearly and compelling art articulating that compulsory income management does not work. The need for consultation um, has to be addressed. The evidence is perfectly clear. This is precisely why this instrument must be disallowed, and I'm very proud that the Greens will continue to push for that. Senator Grogan. Um, I move that the question be put. Uh, the question is that the motion is agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. The noes have it. The question is that the question be put. Those of that opinion say aye. 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 Um, I think the ayes, those of that opinion say, those against say no. Those against say no. The ayes, the ayes have it. So the question now is that the motion moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. The question is now that the motion moved by Senator Rice be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Is the division required? Uh, it's almost 7.30. Yeah. So I'm going to hand over to the president. It wasn't required. That's what I understand from the chamber. Yeah. All right. We'll just do a shuffle in the chair. I propose that the Senate now adjourn. And Senator Grogan, were you seeking the call? Because I was going to call Senator White. Yeah, Senator White.
Uh, thank you, President. Um, <clears throat> I'm uh, going to talk about uh, the four-day week trial that I started to talk about yesterday. And I've been, I'm incredibly pleased uh, to say that uh, the speech that I'm about to um, give has been um, uh, drafted for me by Nellie Halpin, who is an intern from the Australian National University who's been working in my office as part of the program uh, with Parliament. And uh, she has been uh, helping in our office and learning in our office, but also uh, doing a fantastic project um, on and research on superannuation and the early release program under the previous government. And uh, I look forward to the results of her research, research uh, particularly on the effect of women. And, but I am grateful to her for put, putting together this speech, which is about the four-day week trial. Uh, and we talked about that uh, in the Work and Care uh, Select Committee. Um, but. I uh, have most recently understood from my former union the, co the concept um, of the four-day week has been certainly been gaining significant traction globally due to the measurable effects on productivity uh, and quality of life. Just recently, the Australian Services Union members at Oxfam Australia voted up an enterprise agreement that adopts a four-day working week trial. This six-month pilot will allow Oxfam's 90 permanent full-time employees to opt for 30 weekly hours over four days without any loss of pay. Uh, this agreement is the first of its kind in Australia, the first to be formalised within an enterprise bargaining, within an enterprise bargaining agreement, the first to be approved by the Fair Work Commission. It's a landmark achievement, and I congratulate Imogen Sterney and the team at the Victorian private sector branch of the Australian Services Union for negotiating this agreement. Having negotiated many agreements myself, I know how hard this is to get something new uh, in an agreement. The four-day week, work week seeks more than just increases in productivity. So far, trials have demonstrated that workers who participate in these schemes experience holistic benefits from higher wellbeing to less burnout. As a person with a lifelong interest in improving conditions for workers, it's important to me that the government continues to protect worker wellbeing through considering the merits of the four-day week, week, work week and closely observing the outcome of the Oxfam ASU trial and others like it. As a member of the Select Committee on Work and Care, I heard substantial evidence that supports the idea that four-day work week can make work more flexible for women and families. Industries where work is relatively inflexible, such as health and education, are ideal candidates for four-day week trials. These industries are also dominated by women. Further, we know that seven in every ten of primary carers are women. The Oxfam ASU agreement and previous four-day week trials acknowledge that caring responsibilities still mainly fall to women and that, in fact, we can provide them with more flexibility. <coughs> The widespread push for four-day week appears promising. There will be challenges in applying this change to workplace law across all sectors of the economy. However, the Oxfam ASU trial is paving a way forward and is demonstrating again the potential benefits that can be yielded from a four-day work week. I look forward to seeing the results of the Oxfam ASU four-day work week pilot and commend them in their efforts to embrace 21st century workforce changes. If we're going to ever address the challenges that people face balancing work and care, we need innovative solutions. We cannot be stuck in the past because work is not stuck in the past and families are not stuck in the past. And talking of not being stuck in the past, can I also take this opportunity to acknowledge the election of a progressive Victorian Labor woman, Mary Doyle, to the seat of Aston on the 1st of April in a once in a 100 year election victory. Mary Doyle, the new member for Aston, has a long history of fighting for workplace change and will, will no doubt be the advocate for the working people of Aston that they deserve and have gone without for so long. I congratulate Mary and the team that run, ran the stunning campaign to elect a genuine local with an unwavering commitment to this area. I look forward to working with her for many years to come. Thank you, Senator White. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you, President. I was interested to read uh, Robert Gottlieson's article in The Australian. Uh, in his time as a journalist, he's seen nearly half a century of budgets handed down by treasurers from both sides of politics. First in 1974, he's a wealth of wisdom 
when it comes to politics and certainly when it comes to issues of the economy and the budget. And in his article title, which is uh, titled, I've seen 49 budgets and Chalmers is uh, Chalmers one is quite unique. And he writes that given the big spending of the government, I believe the balance of probabilities that inflation will not fall as expected in the budget, and there is the risk that a shocked Reserve Bank will not cut rates and may even be forced to raise them. The blame will sit squarely on government spending, he said. If interest rates don't fall as anticipated or even rise, consumer spending will be restrained and some of the government projections will be disrupted. It may be forced to raise, uh, raise taxes. Higher income and asset-rich people watch out, he said. And this is the High Wire Act, Senators, that the Treasurer is performing with the economy and therefore with Australian families. After less than a year of Labor in office, government spending will increase by $185 billion. Now, what this budget needed was a budget that reduces inflation and reined in spending to combat the cost of living crisis facing all Australians. Instead, Labor is trying to spend its way out of the cost of living crisis. Instead of making life easier for families, this budget only makes life harder for Australian families, to the tune of $25,000 per year. That's what Australians' families are going to be facing. This is for small businesses as well, for self-funded retirees and mortgage holders. Their costs of running their businesses and running their families and managing their budgets is going up. The other coming challenge to the budget, and therefore for the government, is the Commonwealth's payments to the states and territories. The GST distribution. Right now, on this issue, the Treasurer is being all things to all people. But soon the bell will toll. The new New South Wales government is at, a, is at the starting gate waiting to get its hands on WA's GST distribution. A hard-fought gain by many on this side of politics, and I pay particular credit to my WA colleagues who, at the time, I wasn't here, so it was pre-my time, fought extremely hard for that outcome. Now, if New South Wales are at the starting gate, you can bet your bottom dollar that Victoria and South Australia won't be far behind, putting their hands out for more. Now, the Treasurer must commit to protecting the existing GST arrangements for Western Australians, for Western Australia. We haven't heard that as yet. Western Australia will not countenance our state being worse off like it was before the GST distribution was fixed. It should be remembered that without the changes made by the previous coalition government, we would have had a ludicrous situation where Western Australia's GST revenue share would have fallen to 16 cents in the dollar in 2022-23 and 10 cents, that's right, 10 cents in this next year. And the small budget surpluses announced, budget surplus announced yesterday comes on the back of hard-working resources industry in this country, from states like Western Australia. It's an industry that allowed Australia to sail through the global financial crisis. And it was the same industry that made sure Australia's economy didn't suffer comparable to other Western countries during the COVID pandemic. And it's a credit to those industries that saw their, their workplaces continue right throughout the COVID pandemic. There were still flights going up. There were firefighting people in and out of those mine sites delivering for Australians. Now, the government likes to talk about being responsible. Senator Ayres was... Uh, was speaking about this this morning. However, when it comes to my state of Western Australia, they are anything but responsible. And all those new MPs elected on the other side are silently standing by. We haven't heard one Western Australian, one Western Australian on that side of the chamber, both here and in the other place, call for this to be locked in, call for this to be enshrined, the, 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 uh, and, and asking on the, the government to make sure that there is no change to Western Australia's GST. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. Your time has expired. Senator Shewbridge. Thank you, President. Empowering young people to build a future they believe in is incredibly important, especially in the face of a government increasingly committed to producing a surplus overtaking action to help poverty 
and, and help struggling communities escape from poverty. This past weekend, I was made aware of a wonderful example of this in Lismore in New South Wales, up in the Northern Rivers. The Living School is an independent school in Lismore. Last year, Lismore and the Northern Rivers were hit by the biggest floods in modern Australian history. And the school was flooded not once, but twice. True to their ethos of creating a sustainable and socially just future, the school has bounced back, though, with pontoon classrooms and old train carriages for learning rooms. In May, head middle school teacher Emma Wilson piloted a sustainability symposium with her kids and kids from other grades. In this symposium, students were taught design thinking strategies to solve practical real world problems, empowering them to increase sustainability on their school campus and in the broader community. One of the student proposals was a project called Lost Stuffing. This idea proposes lost and found clothing to be co collected and repurposed into soft toys. A portion of the toys will be donated to children's charities and the other portion will be sold to the general public to make it a self-funding project. It's a lovely, practical and imaginative idea that has come from the students. Thinking critically and living sustainably is more important now than ever. And I commend the work and creativity of the students and teachers at the Living School in Lismore for their efforts to make this, real this a reality and for their efforts to come out of the floods stronger, more together with brighter ideas. President, 12 months ago, this country voted for change. Instead, the Albanese government's first big budget has just left millions behind. Funding for the NDIS has been cut and the government will earn more from indebted students than coal and gas royalties. The Australia Institute has recently released data showing that the much hyped petroleum resource rent tax, which is supposed to provide fair returns to the Australian people for the exploitation of our, the public's, natural resources, turns out it will only raise $2.7 billion next year. Labor is actually going to take more money from people paying off their student debts than it's taking from some of the largest multinational fossil fuel companies on the world for, for their resource rent tax. And under Labor's budget, taxes on tobacco will be a whopping five times more than the PRRT. How is it fair? We are taking so little in tax from global multinationals who are trashing our environment, and so much more from mainly poorer people who are addicted to tobacco. The $2.85 a day increase in job seeker, which was trumpeted by the government, and the $8 to $16 a week increase in rental assistance goes nowhere near breaking people out of poverty. It doesn't touch the sides on increasing rent and food prices. It's literally a fraction of what's needed. We're told now isn't the time for bold spending and programs that really address poverty and the cost of living and climate crisis. We're told there's a surplus this year, but there are defi defi deficits forecast for coming years, so now's not the time. Well, when will be the time? When deficits increase, closer to the election, when we know governments get even more frightened and less ambitious? How badly do people have to be suffering for Labor, will, for Labor to make the structural decisions that will help them and their kids instead of helping the big end of town? We have had a decade of brutal right-wing governments who shamelessly delivered for their billionaire mates. And what we need now is a bloody lot more than a marginally progressive Labor Party that embarrassingly hands out crumbs. The fact is the right in politics acts with purpose. And if this budget is anything to go by, Labor doesn't have a separate agenda. Unless we change this pattern, our country, our country will keep ratcheting more and more to the right. So, um, meanwhile, the political lockstop on funding war and weapons is fully intact between Labor and the Coalition. Remember when the Coalition suggested we fund nuclear subs by cutting the NDIS? People were horrified. But that's literally what Labor has done in this budget. For the first time, defence spending will exceed $50 billion, uh, and, uh, $50 billion next year. And this ongoing increase, largely for subs, is being funded by $74.5 billion in cuts to the NDIS over the next decade. Labor is literally delivering the coalition's plan to cut the NDIS to fund the nuclear submarine program. Choices. This budget was about choices. Thank you, and Senator. There you the your time made. has expired, Senator Polly. President, I rise to speak about asthma and the 2.7 million Australian sufferers. 
World Asthma Day was on May the 2nd, and it's an annual Global Awareness Day for Asthma led by the Global Initiative for Asthma. One in nine people in Australia suffer from asthma. This is amongst the highest rates of the condition in the world. Asthma affects people of all ages, from adolescence to adulthood, and it can appear at all ages and stages of life. The most common type of allergy that overlaps with asthma is allergic rhinitis, and also known as hay fever. So spring is a trigger for asthma, and we all know uh, that Canberra is almost the capital uh, of hay fever in the country, so it's only relevant for me to be talking about it here today in the Senate. The cooler months also trigger with more wood smoke and pollutants in the air. About 80 per cent of people with asthma also have uh, hay fever. Both create sensitivities in your airways. Asthma creates sensitive lungs, while hay fever is in the nose. For most sufferers, the symptoms of asthma include wheezing, shortness of breath, coughing and tightness of the chest. This is because the airways are narrowed temporarily. Your nose interconnected, so hay fever can trigger asthma. Treating hay fever well is one of the best ways to improve your asthma condition. People with asthma often experience their symptoms at night, early in the morning or after activities. It can be a vicious cycle and can have long, lifelong complications. Not being able to engage in high intensity exercise can have life altering consequences as most people with asthma can live a normal life with correct diagnosis and treatment and monitoring of the condition. And that's the key to have a proper and accurate diagnosis. An asthma plan can uh, be set out in a document that will take uh, advantage of medication that is available and also treating uh, other symptoms and ensuring that you can live the fullest life that you can. And that's why your GP and other medical professions are so important to ensure that you have a good action plan. There's no um, definite reason as to why people suffer from asthma. But we do know research is so important for this condition and we know that there is a genetic factor in play and most often people with asthma have a family his history of either asthma, um, eczema or hay fever. Australia's world leading researchers are continuing to investigate the causes and treatments for the prevention of asthma. It's believed that the environmental factors also play a key role. Exposure to tobacco, to tobacco smoke, especially as a young child or as a baby, obesity are all the triggers for developing asthma. The rest of the world also suffer from this condition. In fact, the majority of the burden of asthma, morbidity and mortality occurs in low and middle income countries. The world suffers from poor health care access which is also um, leading to higher um, conditions uh, and people suffering with asthma. But I recently met with um, Asthma Australia and the branch in Tasmania, and the Tasmanian Asthma uh, are undertaking a uh, project to discover how Tasmanians are actually living with asthma. So through the Asthma Discovery Survey, Asthma Australia is seeking to know what life is like for Tasmanians experiencing breathing problems and asthma across the state. This will build a more detailed and consumer-based picture of local community responses to asthma care, and that will help my fellow Tasmanians. The aim of the project is to have a better understanding uh, within uh, the experience of people living with asthma in Tasmania to determine the current gaps and identify problems, challenges and potential solutions, gathering insights into what is needed and how best we can resolve and help people living with this condition. Uh, the better health outcomes that we have for more Tasmanians is a better outcome for Australians generally and it is better for our economy. But what we need to do is to learn to ensure that people are diagnosed and that they are able to understand and fully implement their action plan to address their asthma condition. Expired. 
Uh, the Senate stands adjourned and will meet again tomorrow at 9am.